Good morning, we are live from River Valley. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Committee and Public Service Committee meeting, March 20th. I will start with um, call to order and land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marched this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. And I will do a roll call with committee members first. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good Coun morning. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor Sohi, he's joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Councillor Cartmel. And we're also joined by Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning. I would, uh, could I ask someone to move the adoption of the agenda, please? Councillor Rice? Yes. Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the March 20, 2023 <clears throat> Community and Public Services Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following change. Addition 7.5, item on the Arts Council grants and investment for organizations 2023. Thank you. Any questions? I will call the vote. Vote, please. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Councillor Knack, could you please do move the approval of the minutes? Absolutely, thank you. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the February 27th, 2023 Community and Public Services Committee. Thank you, any questions? I see none, please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. And I would just like to acknowledge that Councillor Salvador has joined us. Thank you. Next, I would like us uh, protocol items. I would like to take us, uh, take a moment before we begin the agenda to acknowledge the tragedy that happened in Edmonton last week. We are also devastated by the news that Edmonton Police Service Constable Travis Jordan and Constable Brett Ryan were lost in the line of duty on Thursday. In the coming days, I know there will be opportunities for us to honour them as a community and share tributes, such as the condolence books that have been set up at City Hall and EPS headquarters. On behalf of the City Manager and the City Auditor, Community and Public Services Committee, I would like to extend our deepest condolences to the families of the fallen officers, Constable Travis Jordan and Constable Brett Ryan, along with the entire Edmonton Police Service. I would also like to extend our condolences to all first responders and to all Edmontonians as we grieve together. Every single day, police officers put their, risk, their lives at risk to help protect the public. Every day, the families of police officers see their loved ones off to work and hope they return home safely. And that, unfortunately, did not happen for the Ryan and Jordan families. 
so with the rest of Edmonton, we hold them in our hearts and we mourn this profound loss. I would like to ask that we now stand, if you're able to, to observe two minutes of silence for our two fallen heroes. Thank you very much. Next, we will select items for debate. Please sign up. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Prince. I'll select items uh, 7.1, uh, 7.2, 7.3, on behalf of Councillor Jan, 7.4. Thank you. Mayor Sohi? 7.5. Thank you. So all items have been selected. Um, yes, all items have been selected, so we do not need to vote on just or on do the we five. For the, the, uh, oh, report. sorry, so I'll, the move, I'll move those uh, remaining items. Oh, okay, lovely, thank you. So, uh, please vote. We have five votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Request to speak. I, um, I'm, I'll just read back what we've done so far. But Thank you very much, uh, Clerk Youssef. Please. Thank you, Chair Principe. This morning, Community and Public Services has passed the recommendations of the following reports without debate. Item 5.1 multidisciplinary and outreach ecosystems, revised due date of June 19th, 2023. Item 5.2, bylaw amendments to vehicle for hire bylaw 174000 with a revised due date of May 1st, 2023. And item 5.3, vehicle for hire programs 2022 and 2023 work plan overview with a revised due date of May 1st, 2023. Thank you. 
Next, we will move um, request to speak. I'll, uh, I can move that. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor uh, Sohi. Chair Principal, I'll move that we hear from uh, Jill Tucker, uh, EPSB School Playground Ad Advocacy Coalition, joining us remotely, and, um, and also hear from Monica Marchand, joining us remotely on the uh, item 7.2, joint use agreement, land review. Thank you. Yep. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Okay. Uh, Chair Prince, just quickly on uh, I exempted 7.5, right? Uh, I have few questions, but it's such a good investment and good news story. And I hope that uh, there will be presentation on this so Edmontonians know the investment we're making. Just to give you a heads up, that I'll be asking for brief remarks on this report to give us the information. Yep. Yep. Thank you for flagging that. Um, Clerk Youssef, do we um, call on the members who are here to speak to make sure they're with us today? They're both remote, but we can definitely check on that. Thank you. They're online. Yeah, I don't see them online, but we'll give them a heads up that their item was selected so they can, they can be present for that item. So okay, we'll that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, request for time specific on agenda, none. Councillor inquiries. Councillor Paquette. Please go yes. ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, here's my inquiry. Um, can administration provide a summary of information on the current status of city enabled and city provided indigenous business supports to the community and public services committee? Uh, I don't have a time frame or due date though, because I hadn't heard back, but um, there it is. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Um, Clerk Youssef, uh, for a due date, we'll just wait to hear back then on that. I will, yeah, w Clerk's office will connect with the department to get a due date on that. Great, thank you very much. And I would like to acknowledge that Councillor Stevenson was here. She'll be right back. Next, reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Request to reschedule reports completed. Unfinished business, none. We will go on to public reports now. 7.1, Community Outreach Transit Team. Do we have a presentation? No, we just have some speaking notes. Some speaking notes. Okay, so uh, so just a few remarks to start us off. That would be great. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Flamen. I'm the Deputy City Manager of Community Services. Here with me today to answer any questions you might have are uh, Chelsea Harlock, Director, Safe and Healthy Communities, Jenna Pilot, Supervisor of Community Safety Team, and Cheryl Whiskeyjack, Executive Director of Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. We're here with you today to seek approval to enter into a three-year amending agreement with Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society for their continued partnership on the Community Outreach Transit Team, or COT. As per City Administration Bylaw 16620, procurement agreements over one million that do not arise from a competitive procurement process require approval from the appropriate council committee. Bent Arrow was initially selected through a single source procurement. The Community Outreach Transit Team first launched in September 2021 and pairs a transit peace officer with an outreach worker from Bent Arrow who proactively patrol the transit system with the aim of connecting individuals in need of specialized support with community resources. In the first year of operation, COT's two operational teams supported over 150 unique individuals to achieve over 250 short-term goals ranging from identification acquisition to housing and health-related support. Bent Arrow is a well-established nonprofit with experience in supporting individuals and families across the lifespan with diverse needs. Bent Arrow has played an instrumental role in the design and delivery of Edmonton's COT program 
and extending the existing agreement will allow for continu continuity and the ongoing growth of the program. An overview of COT, its partnership with Ventero, and the proposed key terms of the amending agreement are before you. Funding to support this agreement is currently secured through the Transit Safety Plan and Budget 2023-2026. We would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Councillor Principe. Um, thank you for that. So a few questions. We had got, uh, we received an email uh, from uh, ATU President Steve Bradshaw a couple days ago, and he had just flagged, and I realized I should be closer to the mic. Um, uh, he had flagged in the email uh, that there were times where there was, weren't, um, always social workers available, and I'm guessing likely because that was because the team was starting up, you had to hire people, but I just wanted to double check and because the question had been in the email that we received is um, by sort of uh, not allowing it to be open to a wider range of groups, does that potentially create a situation where we run short on social workers again, or more likely I'm guessing is that if we're signing a three-year contract that provides more stability, more certainty, and that would give you an easier time of, of having consistent folks in those positions. That's the case, but I will let uh, Cheryl answer any of the questions regarding just what the social sector is looking like in terms of employment. Yeah, yeah so uh, thanks for the question, uh, Councillor Nack. Across the sector, uh, it has been very uh, difficult to recruit uh, people in, in the sector uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so this has been no different. Um, and of course, it's such a specialized position and partnership as well that we really want to um, exercise some due diligence in making sure that whoever we do hire, um, and, and uh, our supervisor actually made the comment that she did so good hiring the first two that hiring the next five, uh, the bar was very, very high. Okay. Um, so uh, we've been really sort of taking our time to make sure we get the right people in the right place. Excellent, and yeah, so going, for, oh, go ahead, please. It looks like you were reaching to the mic, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah, and I just wanted to add as well that um, sometimes when the teams might not be seen on the transit, I'm just gonna lift this up, might not be seen on the transit system is actually because they're working with some of our uh, vulnerable individuals on the transit system, so that isn't necessarily um, a 10 minute interaction sometimes, that could be yeah. hours at a time. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that as Makes well. And sense. also yeah. the, the need of more services to be able to do the warm handoffs, right? Because COT only does the intervention. So um, the ability to, to take the vulnerable community member to a support is also something that needs to be considered. Absolutely, that's helpful, thank you. Um, the only, because uh, I know we have a bigger transit safety conversation coming through at SAP tomorrow, uh, but I wanted to just ask um, broadly, uh, and COT seems to be one of the few, the, one of the best examples of being fairly proactive in our communication. I've seen a lot of information, I've seen news stories, I've seen social media posts. Um, but I guess I just wanted to get a sense of, of how you uh, want to continue to keep people informed because I think there is right now a perception uh, and, and in certain cases a reality concern related to safety on transit. And um, you know, it's one thing to be able to provide stats that show where we're actually at. It's another thing to actually, for people to see what's happening. And so how do we plan to regularly stay communicating the work that this team's doing? And then I'll focus broadly tomorrow at a separate transit safety conversation around how we're doing that outside of the COD team. Yeah, you've, you've uh, nailed it. That conversation is happening tomorrow. And uh, Dwayne Hunter, who is the director of transit safety, has a whole comms plan of which this will be a part. Okay. Okay, then I'll, I'll wait until that conversation then. Appreciate it, thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, just to follow up on the, uh, the uh, sustainability of the program. First of all, I wanna thank you, uh, Cheryl and everyone else involved. Thank you so much for your good work. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. And we, uh, those, uh, some of the stories that you share with us are really uh, important uh, and they give us a sense, uh, the difference that caught is, uh, is making. Uh, questions related to sustainability. I know it's a three-year funding arrangement, but you know, hiring good quality social workers, all social workers are absolutely phenomenal, right? But you wanna hire the best, right? Uh, uh, even three-year time frame might be short, right? 
just want to get a sense from you. Like, if you want to have good people, you want to give them certainty and predictability for long-term employment, right? So uh, now this funding is permanent. The funding we approved in, uh, in budget is ongoing funding, right, for COT. Or is it a four-year funding? So how, why don't we leverage that to hire people more permanently? Yeah, I'm uncertain about the ongoing um, of the budget, but I can say this is still a pilot program, and so there's evaluation happening um, to ensure that we put together a program that um, makes the most sense uh, in terms of sustainability. Yeah, just because I, I, I would not, when I looked at it, yes, it's from one year to three years, absolutely important, but if you, if people are going to working with uh, Cheryl Yu, right, and uh, why would, why would we not hire people on a permanent basis? Or why would not we support uh, through this contract that's more system predictability? Sorry, just to add, it is ongoing funding. It is ongoing. That's yes. what my, uh, my thought was, that, that when we approved it, right? So something to think about. I know three years is good, but uh, uh, if, uh, if you're going to have cards going for long term, right, we need to think about uh, uh, giving that permanency to social workers if uh, I may add to, just, yeah. just to clarify, yeah. um, the three years is just for the specific contract. The funding is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's okay. what I'm trying to get yeah. at. Like if funding is ongoing, why only three-year contract? Why not have a five-year or ten-year contract that uh, Cheryl can go hire people and then uh, her people have that predictability over time, that they have, the, they have a job? I would prefer someone in contracts to answer that, but from my understanding is that that's not an option. And I guess I would offer that we don't uh, write contracts that have no end dates. We had to pick an end date, so that's why we picked three years, okay. but certainly can uh, be open to a conversation um, in the coming months or years yeah, to see we, what that looks like. Yeah, maybe have this off, uh, maybe offside conversation about these kind of programs, right? I know it's a, it's a contract. Maybe we need to figure out a different way of uh, supporting the long-term sustainability of these programs. Okay. Uh, can you give me some, um, uh, how, how do we measure success? Give me some metrics. Well, as I've mentioned, this is a, uh, a pilot program. So some of the outcomes that have been established uh, for this in terms of short-term outcomes with the number of total engagements where people are made aware of or physically connected to agencies, services, or resources by type, the number of engagements where people report their needs have been met, number of engagements where people are physically connected to an agency, service, or resource, percentage of TPOs or ETS staff reporting improved awareness of citizen needs. Um, I, can, I can keep reading them. I, I just don't want to take all your time off. Uh, one of the reasons we ask these questions is that public needs uh, to know all these good stories too, right? Public okay. needs to know all the good work being done Absolutely. other than the perception which is out there that somehow transit system, the city is not doing anything, that transit system mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, is uh, this, there are challenges, absolutely. That's why I just want to ask these questions. Maybe uh, we'll do some write-up on this. Uh, uh, the, yeah, that's, that's about it. I, I am really, again, want to stress the sustainability part. Because these social issues are not going to go away uh, in a short amount of time, right? So we need to have these kind of social interventions in the system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I would like to acknowledge that we have some visitors with us here today. We have the grade four class from Constable Daniel Woodall School with their teacher, Dara Craig, from the ward, Vihesuin. Hello. It's so nice to see you here, and it's my understanding that you, the school has started a memorial for the fallen uh, officers, so we appreciate that. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And welcome here today. Um, next, Councillor Rice. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair Her Principal. So, uh, I just want to say thank, thank you for the, this important work, and be, because public transit, specific transit safety and then security, and it is a big and important topic, and then our Edmontonians care about. Um, I do have a few questions to administration first. Um, specifically, uh, city started transit safety and the security, and from 
we had a motion passed back to last year, 2022, and the February 22 and the 24th council meeting. Um, the invest is a budget, and for 2022, by 3.9 million dollars. That is a on one-time basis. Uh, so that money already allocated and to this pilot, prog pilot program. Um, my question is, um, from a financial model perspective, the agreement between city of Edmonton and the Bentorero Aero, an agreement, the cost for that agreement is a part of this $3.9 million or not part of? We have Stacy Padbury online if she'd like to take that question for us, please. Yeah, so Councillor Rice, the, um, there is ongoing operational funding for community outreach and transit, and that is maintained at $700,000 a year, and that is what would be used for this agreement. So not part of that 3.9 one time. Okay, so that $3.9 million is just for the city administration site for our work uh, to do to hire um, peace officers and for other type of operating cost. Uh, but yeah, for the I would just, I would just have to go back and remind myself what that's for, but it isn't what the money that's being used here is the ongoing money in the budget at 700,000. Uh, so this $700,000 per year start in 2021 or in 2020? In the past, because the information mentioned in the report specifically referred to the past three, three years contract. Yeah, so um, the 2023 to 2026 maintained this funding, but it was started earlier. I would just have to double check the year, but it was likely the first year this contract was signed. Yes, yeah, so there's some, <clears throat> some confusion in the report and it's <clears throat> not fully reflect the financial support <clears throat> city provided to this uh, Bento Aero organization regarding the agreement. I would like to have some clarification. <clears throat> That's the first question. The second question and to the executive director of Bento Aero and from operating progress and for this pilot program, and this $700,000 per year is only for hire the social work for the staff cost, so it's not including the operational cost, so other administration operational cost. Well, there is administrative costs on Bento Arrow's side, yeah. uh, and there's a certain percentage allocated to that, but the bulk of it is to the outreach social workers that we hired. So it's most cast on the social works. <clears throat> yeah. And then for the, I'm um, <clears throat> going for the other three years, and is, that, is there any plan to hire more uh, social works, use this money, or is just to use this money to keep what we have right now? So we originally uh, were contracted for two outreach workers. We're growing the team to seven. Okay, so that will support uh, yeah. to maximum the seven social works uh, will no additional request to come uh, to city to request additional money besides this $700,000? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, <clears throat> so that's one, qu I have 10 seconds, I may come back the second round. I still have a few questions, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you so much. Um, just want to echo, you know, how how great I think the COP program is is working. I think it's incredibly ex exciting and amazing what you've achieved with just two teams. So really excited to see that expand further. Um, maybe just to Ms. Blaman. Um, well, actually, no. Sorry. Maybe I'll start with Ms. Whiskey Jack. So when would we anticipate the the full complement of of workers being hired? So we're growing to seven. We're up to five right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're getting very close. Great. Yeah. 
Oh, great. Well, and I was going to ask, are there any are there any barriers in the contract? Um, like, I'm just thinking, I don't know if we're requiring like a full master's degree in social work or just no, so, so there aren't any barriers that are being imposed. Perfect. Although we have our own accreditation standards, sure. um, so we yeah. do have educational requirements we're required to meet, but not by this contract. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, and just to just to the mayor's uh, discussion point earlier, does having longer term certainty help with with attraction of of people to fill the roles? Yeah. So that's kind of a uh, funny question. I mean, I was hired uh, 28 years ago on a one-year contract. <laughs> so welcome to nonprofit. That's kind of how it goes. Um, we're used to, you know, uh, multi-year contracts are great, um, but sometimes we're year-to-year -year on some of the things that we do. Um, but when the work's good, it, it usually continues, typically. Um, so... Uh, you know, the three years gives us a chance to uh, show the good work that we're doing um, and provide that data and reports uh, back to you guys so that you can see what we've accomplished. Um, and so we can keep doing it. Pivot as necessary as, as well. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. So then just to Ms. Wellman, I know today we're just talking about the contract itself. Um, just wondering when, so you referenced that this is still sort of considered a, a pilot project, so when are we going to have that sort of full, full assessment, cost-benefit analysis complete? Is that something that's coming back to, to Council? As this wasn't a Council-driven action, we don't have that on our list of things that would come back to Council in a formal report, but certainly via memo, we'd be pleased to provide uh, what the learnings have been, the best practices, and, and what that evaluation will bring forward. Um, and, and just an overall um, reporting, I guess, of you know the interactions, the engagements, the agencies that we have in, uh, worked with. Okay, um, so then maybe I'll just use this opportunity. I guess there were a few questions I had around, you know, I really appreciated the point or, you know, in the report it referenced that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of follow-up work happening and we know that follow-up is really critical to, to success. So just wondering again how we're balancing that follow-up capacity with the sort of being, being out in the system capacity. Um, is that something that will be evaluated in terms of maybe identifying additional resources that may be needed in the future? Yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, I, currently we are going through a whole evaluation right now um, in the fact that we want to go from a pilot to an actual program. So mm -hmm. um, things like our warm handoffs, uh, you know, the case management, all of those things are currently being um, reviewed along with all of our outputs and our outcomes within the program. So um, we'll have it in a couple months and be more clear on everything, yeah. Yeah, well, I just, you know, again, I, I would defer to my committee colleagues, but I feel like there could be value in having a discussion point with council on that. Just, again, if there are additional resources, I think I think we're seeing really positive results, and if there are other pieces that are needed. Um, so I'll just, I'll put that out there. Um, just wondering if we are looking at expanding geography, just in terms of, my understanding is this is still fairly exclusive to the LRT system. Are we also going to be looking at transit centers eventually? What's sort of that? approach. Yes, we are in transit centers as you well. You are currently. Yep. Oh, yep. okay, yep. great. Um, and then are we doing, uh, I think some of the, the really powerful data that the city's been collecting is just in terms of, you know, the number of people that are, are seeking shelter in LRT. Are the COT teams part of that data, like data collection piece? I know they're collecting how many people they interact with. Um, is that being fed into the, the broader TPO data collection piece as well? Yeah, I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, yeah, so that's also something that we are currently working on right now as well. We're using our own um, data collection. Bentero has their own data collection. But in the review and in the process, we're trying to really align all of the data better so that it can um, share the story better. And that's with the data uh, that they're collecting on the transit uh, safety plan as well. So um, right now we're currently kind of separate, but we are trying to bring everything together as we speak. Yeah. Okay, Thank great. you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you very much. I do have actually quite a few questions as well. Um, I guess I'm going to start with uh, some specifics. 
Can you uh, highlight to me, Ms. Padbury, or somebody from procurement, what are the exemptions in the uh, trade agreements that allow us to do this sole source? Because it said it said that there are exemptions, but it didn't say that are applicable, but it didn't say what they were. So I would probably need to have a lawyer to help me out with that. So if I can just defer, if you can go to your next question and sure, I can- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And then I guess um, I, to Ms. Flamin, when we had the transit safety report come to council in February of 2022, it discussed uh, a model where bent arrow EPS and transit uh, safety peace officers worked. There was gonna be a governance model. Can you speak to and update us on that? And then my question to Ms. Whiskey, Whiskey Jack is, of that governance model, do you feel like you're an equal partner? Uh, we absolutely feel like we're an equal partner. Um, I don't know how else to expand on that. We're involved in uh, key decision-making points, like basically everything. Um, so what, I guess, what is the governance model so that was we, determined? So we have several, um, um, communities of practice leadership tables that meet on a regular basis. Um, so higher levels of leadership meet regularly, um, operational uh, leadership meets regularly, um, and we're able to communicate that to our respective staff on, on how it's gonna impact the work that they're doing daily. Okay, and again, to Ms. Flamin, is there a formalized governance model that is formalized through like an terms of reference or MOU? So I don't have line of sight on that. Uh, Dwayne Hunter, who's the Director of Transit Safety, I think we'd be better positioned uh, to speak to that. I don't believe he's here today, but I think that uh, in the future discussions around the larger piece around public transit safety, uh, that might be better answered there. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's important because even when you describe to, you answer your answers to Mr. To Mayor Sohi, for me, those are great data points. They're mostly outputs rather than outcomes. Um, so I guess my question is how are we, you know, and I, I agree with Councillor Stevenson. I think transit safety is by far one of the things that for my residents is top of mind and I'm hearing about a lot. And so I do feel like that should come back for discussion with council, with the council when the pilot transitions because I'm not getting the sense of and again, this is not to, I absolutely appreciate the COT team, and this is more the broader overarching thing that I hear about, you know, Ms. Whiskey Jack saying that there's no services for the warm handoff. And I get that. So it's a systemic thing. We can put all of these resources in place in the transit system if there's no services to, to report people to. I guess I have a question, I guess to put it into a question, what are the recidivism, recidivism rates how many times are we seeing the same people again and again and again in these numbers? Yeah, so if I can just address your first comment around a lot of the outputs uh, being um, reflected in the performance indicators and measures I was reading out earlier. I was just in the short term bits, but yeah, we do have medium term and, and longer term that try to speak to the number of people who have maintained connections to agency services or resources after the engagement to your point about recidivism. Um, yeah. And so, so yeah. I guess my question is how much recidivism is in the first year, how much are we seeing? Like how much are the same team seeing the same folks? I'm not sure if we've got that data in front of us right now, um, but this is something that we'll be coming back to uh, in, the, in the coming months as our evaluation uh, gets completed. Okay, and so you know, to again defer to committee, but some, some, some other check-in I think is important. Um, 115 incidences where community outreach teams were unable to respond. I guess my follow-up question is, is this contract enough? Do we need to think about, um, about that on a go forward basis? I would hazard a guess that that was when we were at two teams or like, we're not at the full capacity yet. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So wait till we're at the full capacity and yeah. see kind of what responses. Okay. No, that answers all my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, Councillor Principe. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in reference to, to Councillor Rutherford's questioning, um, what are the bottlenecks that are, are being faced by the, by the COT teams? 
like referral to other agencies uh, for housing or anything like that? What are, what are you finding? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think that there's a lot of social challenges um, in our communities right now, and I think that there's, um, that ultimately affects uh, what the COT team can do and can't do on the transit system. So the biggest thing would be being able to access other supports, um, whether that be housing, whether that be finance, um, mental health, wellness, um, everything is, is weightless right now and very backed up. So I would say that's a huge, huge uh, barrier to a lot of the work that we do. Um, I think the teams, you know, we are, we started with two and we are consistently scaling up to ultimately get to seven. Um, but obviously we can only do so much with only having the two to five teams on there. So we're gonna have a big, bigger impact with more teams. Um, I don't know, Cheryl, did you wanna add anything? No, that, those are the bottlenecks for sure. Um, you know, and again, we're working to get up to capacity, but even once we're up to capacity, um, we are circling back to folks that we're engaged with um, to make sure that we don't lose them, right? Oh, so while okay. they're waiting for housing or other kinds of supports, um, we keep continually circle back to make sure that we stay in contact um, because when things are available, we wanna make sure that we get them in those spots. Yeah. Okay, so you do have a tracking system in place then to, to follow up. That's that's great to hear. Um, and then I know that in our um, in the budget we we did approve additional funding for TPO. So that's um, that's not a, a challenge or anything right now. You do have the TPOs um, to line up with these teams with the social workers. Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. Um, and then I'm also wondering about connection with other other agency and and and. Um, agencies and services, um, like how do you coordinate with their outreach teams? Like, are, is there any duplication? Do they go into the transit system? Okay, um, so uh, we're uh, a referring agency as well. So we are the gateway to many other support mm -hmm. services that are out there. As for um, sharing space in the transit centers, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, yeah? Just help, yeah. Just help. yeah. yeah. So with the help teams as well, we're, but we're also involved in that initiative. Okay, and that's, that was, I was wondering what the coordination and connection with, with the help teams were. Yeah, our COT teams work very closely with the help teams on the transit system. And, and as uh, Cheryl had stated, we work with all agencies um, as a big focus is that warm handoff. So we want to establish strong relationships with all of our agency um, intervention outreach teams that are working in the space. Okay, and what hours do you work? Or do, do the teams work? Like, is there evening as well? So currently, the caught hour of operations are seven days a week from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. Okay. Because when I did my um, walk along with the with the transit op, uh, transit peace officer, um, I, I didn't notice any other. It was a Friday night, and I'm just, you know, was just wondering about. Um, I guess uh, attending to to those people in the in the transit centers in the evening hours that are looking for overnight shelter, I guess, rather than just being um, asked to leave. Yeah, but you do operate. They are, yeah, seven days a week from six a.m. until two a.m. And, it, and it's possible if you didn't see them, it's because they were actively working with with uh, someone who was needing their their assistance. Okay, um, that's all the questions I have now. The one thing now. I would just add to that as well when we're speaking about challenges that the COT team faces is that COT is a voluntary program. Um, so COT can have many interactions with people, but they may not for a variety of reasons choose to accept support at that point in time. Um, it's still important though that they know when they are ready that folks are available to support them through that. Okay, and, and the records are kept then and tracking to Circle yes. back with them? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to, to our speakers for being here this morning. And uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, so, just, yeah, I'll start by saying thank you for your excellent work in this space. Um, you know, I'm very pleased to hear about the expansion of, of the teams. And something I've been reflecting on is whenever I talk to community about COT, uh, the model really resonates with people. It makes a lot of sense. And... I know today's conversation is very much focused on the contract, um, but one question that I get on a fairly regular basis is, uh, are there opportunities, and 
yes, it's a larger question. Are there opportunities to have a similar model to COT uh, in, I guess, beyond the transit system? Um, and just as an example, you know, I regularly hear from some of the, the BIAs that it would be amazing to have COT-like teams um, on our main streets connecting with community businesses. Uh, I see smiling and nodding. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you've heard this as well. Can you comment on that piece? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, ultimately, um, it would be great to have, you know, as many outreach teams as, as we would desire, but the biggest thing is the coordination of them, obviously, and making sure that everybody's working together in the space. But we do have teams that work specifically with uh, businesses. So there is YAG ambassadors. They look a little different, mm -hmm. um, but we also have, uh, I'm gonna say my work, the Neighborhood Empowerment Team, uh, which is also a partnership with enforcement that works in other, other spaces as well. So, you know, this model does exist. Uh, it looks different because it has to look different. It depends on the need of, of the community and what the social concern is. Right, well, thank you for that. And, and I've heard excellent things about the net teams as well. Um, so yeah, great to see we're taking this inter interdisciplinary approach um, across, across many aspects of the organization and, and community. So maybe one one question, um, you know, wondering if if you can reflect a little bit on some of the learnings uh, from the first cohort, I guess, the first two teams, um, and anything that you're able to share from their perspectives, um, sort of going forward, what we've what we've learned so far. I'll start. Um, so the hours got adjusted. <laughs> um, so uh, that was one of the one of the things that we learned is that we need to be out there and present. Uh, you know, in, in some of those really vulnerable times for folks that are in those, in those situations, in those locations. Um, and then another one is the communications plan, which has uh, been fairly, uh, something fairly recent. It was referenced earlier that uh, Dwayne Hunter is working on one right now. And I think it's really um, um, to our benefit to be able to tell as many good stories that are coming out of COT as we can. Um, and uh, needing to navigate um, city communications structures has been not real fun um, and time consuming. So we're trying to find a way to get those stories out there quicker um, and more frequently. So I'll, I'll let uh, my colleagues uh, jump in as well. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think that we've learned a lot, uh, to be honest. I think um, the pilot showed us you know, where we need to be, when we need to be, how much more we're needed. Um, it showed us uh, more of the significant gaps in our social system. Um, it showed us, you know, just the wide range of perceptions of safety on the transit system. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, ultimately it's just showed um, the need. Um, and, you know, the question that we consistently are asking ourselves on COD is, uh, you know, the, the case management or the, the warm handoff question, to be honest. So uh, it's just, it's something else we're evaluating now. So, and then all, obviously our outputs and our outcomes, just really re-looking at them and, and, you know, are these still aligned or do we need to um, create um, bigger outcomes or more impactful outcomes? Mm -hmm. And if I might just add one of those good news stories since I have the floor. Um, Cot originally met Gail, not her real name, back on November 20th, 2022 following a peace officer referral. She had over 50 recorded interactions with our peace officers over the past two years. Her immediate short-term goal was shelter and addictions treatment. Accordingly, Cot attempted to connect her with the local shelter, but learned she had a ban. So we could have stopped there, but they didn't. Cot was able to work with the shelter provider to temporarily lift the ban, and with respect to her treatment goal, Cot helped Gail connect with some treatment options and supported her in submitting the required paperwork. While waiting for a treatment bed to become available, she shared her concerns about her own mental health, and in response, Cot uh, arranged for her to connect with a psychiatrist through Alberta Health Services. So again, speaking to the multidisciplinary approach. She was initially reluctant at first, but eventually did uh, take Cot's support. Uh, it was insightful about her mental health struggles, and she also agreed to take medication that was recommended by the psychiatrist. This was the first time she had taken such meds, she has since spent five weeks in treatment. Following her treatment, Cot again stayed involved, assisted her in securing Alberta Works and Bridge Housing. While her journey is not linear and there have been lapses, she is now searching for her next best step forward. 
And uh, since that initial meeting with Gail, she's had no other peace officer contacts of conflict. Well, I'm out of time, but thank you so much for sharing that. That's fantastic. Wow, yes, I will echo that. Thank you for sharing that with us. We need to hear those stories, so thank you for sharing that. Councillor Tang? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, everybody on the team for, for delivering this report, for doing the good work on the ground. Um, you know, I think just to follow up on that question in terms of learning, um, uh, I think about, you know, the burnout that you've already mentioned kind of across sector and the challenge with hiring. Um, how are the, I guess, the existing um, staff members feel? Do they have good mental and emotional health support? Um, yeah, maybe I'll start there. I'll jump in, uh, Councillor Tang. Um, I, I think that's one of the benefits of this partnership is that our organization literally has healing in the name. Uh, so very focused on wellness, not just of the community that we serve, but uh, also of the people doing the work. And when we're in partnership, that also encapsulates our partners. Well, that's great. Um, and I, I imagine kind of stable multi-year uh, agreements like this kind of help with perhaps even some of the, the staff longevity would would you say? Sorry, repeat the question. Uh, just, you know, multi-year kind of stable agreement and funding would maybe perhaps also yes. alleviate kind of the sector, um, uh, you know, if there if there is any concern about like longevity with staff members. Uh, I don't think that's a concern. Like I said, in nonprofit, that's kind of often the way that we're working. Um, mm -hmm. and, and leadership certainly knows how long our contracts go, but our staff, we hire them to do a job and, um, you know, when we have multi-year contracts, we definitely share that so that they know that's a part of, you know, the security. And security also feels good, you know. So uh, I guess the short answer is yes. Thank you. Um, I, I think on this point uh, that Councillor Nat had referenced uh, the ATU letter, um, yeah, I, you know, in my mind, I think, you know, Bandero has really developed a specialized role for transit outreach uh, support in terms of hiring, recruiting, training, et cetera. Um, you know, in my mind, uh, kind of the suggestion of like, what about opening up the, the sourcing of re recruitment? You know, would that actually help alleviate some of the challenges? Because I, I mean, this is a sectoral issue when it comes to staff burnout and, and hiring constraint, is it not? Sourcing of recruitment? I'm not sure yeah. what. Yeah, so the so I think the suggestion was like, you know, would it help to 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 increase the outreach support if we have multiple sources beyond Bent Arrow? And um, I think I would challenge that by saying, you know, would that actually improve? Um, and I would imagine open source rather than sole sourcing, uh, like it is with this agreement, would take a lot longer, would it not? And maybe this is a question for um, Ms. Foreman. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, it would, um, you know, we're hearing that hiring is a, is a concern for a lot of our social sector right now. So although I can't give that in yes or no, um, that is the perception. Um, and it is what we're hearing from a lot of the agency partners that we work with. Um, and yes, bringing or opening contract, um, would require a lot more work uh, and a lot more time as well. Yeah, and, I, and I'm hearing from a lot of my colleagues that there's an urgency to, you know, get the teams ready to go and I, and I will hate for that kind of process to be bottlenecked up. Um, and, and I guess just uh, on this piece, on this concern about visibility, you know, I do hear from a lot of my residents around, well, where are these social workers? Where are these outreach folks? You know, um, is the goal here visible presence? Is visibility the goal, or is it really about referral and 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 targeted support? I'm just wondering if you can maybe just emphasize uh, or you know some of the points here, or even dispel kind of like what you know is the caught here really to for visibility? No, it is right. not only for visibility. It is about meeting the needs of vulnerable Edmontonians. Yeah, and you know, in my mind, unless we have just as many writers as uh, you know, outreach and TPOs, I think that visibility would be very, very difficult to achieve anyhow. Um, and I guess just uh, you know, lastly, 
I'm glad to hear about the connection with the other agencies, particularly HELP. Uh, I really appreciate the, the ride along a year ago where I don't think that was quite in place yet. Um, but I was wondering about any connections in with mutual aid organizations at all, because they're also boots on the ground, right? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, the member, my staff member administration who oversees uh, COT also works very closely with all of our mutual aid groups and our outreach groups. Um, and we hold uh, quarterly meetings with them. We just actually had one uh, last week. So uh, we yeah. definitely make all of the connections that we can in all of the spaces um, that whether mutual aids or outreaches are working in. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. I, I heard lots of very good questions from my colleagues. I, I want to go back to focus on today's uh, request amending contract uh, agreements for approval. Um, so just a few things to confirm. So this amendment is only change the term, right? So it's only term change and from first year uh, to right now extended to another three years. That's correct. Okay, so that's his term change. And the second is about the operating scope. Is there any operating scope re in terms of responsibilities, deliverables, and for this contract change? No, I don't believe so. So deliverables are still keep the same. And then, but we do have the staff, the team staff change by increase to up to the say, seven, seven social workers. That, yeah, and that was our, in the original request. They're just, the two teams just haven't been filled yet. Um, so in terms of this operating school, the uh, de deliverables, because re really related to the results for the first year, and for the pilot program. I do have a few questions to confirm with the results. So in the past year, and in the past year for the first year of uh, CAR team, um, 2,700 general interactions uh, CAR team and reached out. I, I just want to get a sense among those 2,700 interactions and how many and do you have the data, like how many actually they really want to get help, to receive help? So out of that amount, we've had uh, 700 engagements, which involve more interactions that result in a referral or other support based on identified needs, including transportation support or uh, support to a community organization. And uh, more than 250 unique individuals were provided with ongoing follow-up support. Uh, so based on the, the data provided in the report here, and it, it appears only 18% of 2,700 uh, actually received spe specific referrals, specific referrals. So that is the data showing here. So a lot of data showing here very clear, even not close to 1%, is only 0.09% uh, of individuals during this 27, uh, 2,700 general interactions and has ongoing following support. And then 0.06% of all interactions achieved the 277 short-term goals. So I don't know what those short-term goals for the 200. Seven, seven. So we do see some progress. We do see some progress. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to get my point across here before you answer my question. Um, is there any plan and from the ongoing in for this we extend the contract for additional three years and so all those data will have the change or will stay as the same and from impact perspective? of the program. Thank you for the question. Um, I first want to say that any type of service is a voluntary service. So um, we can have as many COT teams as we would like out there, or outreach teams as we want. If the individual does not want to receive the support or the service, 
they are not obligated to. So I think that that always needs to be kept in mind uh, when it comes to looking at data, um, as not everyone is looking to be referred to housing or, or receive any type of support. Um, again, I also want to say that currently we are in a uh, partnership evaluation for this program so that we are looking at some of these outcomes and these outputs and reassessing and reevaluating to ensure um, that they are the right ones and um, that we are creating an impact. Uh, okay, so I just want to mindful to my time. Um, I, I do understand the importance of the program also to understand that then, uh, our city is putting lots of er effort to try to try address the root cause for the transit safety and the security issues. So I do understand that it's important. I want to be very clear. Uh, I just look at the efficiency of the program or the effectiveness of the program. Um, my, la my last question, so I don't have enough time to continue that conversation, but the last question, is there any specific reason why this is a sole source contract? I think it's when we do a sole source, it's recognition that the skills that are being requested are specialized so much so that there isn't um, a number of folks in the market that can that can um, meet the need as articulated by administration. Okay, thank you. My time is out. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you, Chair Principal. I will uh, move the recommendation uh, that an amendment to the service agreement between the City of Edmonton and Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society to provide outreach support as part of community outreach transit team as outlined in attachment one of the March 20th, 2023 Community Service Report CS01556 be approved, that the agreement reflecting those amendments be in the form and content accept acceptable to the city manager. Yeah, but I do have a couple of questions. Thank and you. I'll start with bottlenecks, right? And uh, uh, so those bottlenecks are lack of support for mental health, lack of support for treatment, lack of support for housing, lack of support for shelter to take people to, can, instead of shaking hands, I mean, you're nodding, right? Can you, re, uh, can you agree? I mean, because public hearing probably need, can't see you nodding heads, but they probably want to know your answer. Yeah. Yeah, so there are all those things. And I, I think, uh, like to earlier points in the conversation, uh, the struggles we're experiencing as an organization are probably being experienced by our partners and community. Yeah. Um, so just the sheer volume of people who are requiring supports and the ability to sort of fill positions and, and be able to meet the supports that are coming in the door. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a variety of factors. Um, yeah. yeah. So you know, it, it, is it fair that the card teams are great uh, and other interventions are great, but we're still dealing with symptoms of a bigger issues around people not having, having access to housing, not having access to treatment and healing? Yes, that's absolutely fair. Um, and also many of the folks that we are uh, coming across are very much at risk um, for um, negative interactions, violent interactions, safety interactions themselves yeah. mm -hmm. in those transit centers. And uh, while I sympathize 100% with transit users, um, they have a stop to get off and a home to go to, and many of the folks we're seeing simply don't have that even. Good idea. Yeah, I yeah, know. I, I think that's very important that we want to make sure that transit, or the city is safe for everyone, including our public transit for users but there's a lot of vulnerability out there for people who, are you, who we are trying to help, right, through God. Yeah. And if I may, the, the longer term outcomes of this program are three, that marginalized people are connected to long-term sustainable supports, that there's improved safety and well-being of city uh, staff working on and around the transit system, and an increased sense of rider safety yeah. and enhanced ridership experience. So it's yeah. all of those things. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And those are very important outcomes, right, as we look for long-term sustainable solutions. On communications, uh, I think, yes, visibility is not the... Uh, the primary goal may be here, right? But visibility is important for people to know this access. This program is available for vulnerable populations, for them to know. But also 
for transit users to know that there's uh, efforts being made by the city, right? So uh, uh, I don't think many people know that CART program exists. Uh, so how do we ramp up their communication as we go from two to five to seven, maybe when you're fully staffed, maybe having a media availability uh, or uh, sharing some of the information? Because when province announced the sheriff program, it's a four month pilot, great program, we need it, right? But there was every media outlet reporting on it, right? Which is good, but we need to look for opportunities the same way to talk about these long-term plans that we are, interventions that we are having. Yeah, that's excellent advice, and we'll certainly make sure that we amplify that. Okay. All right. Uh, so do we know if this contract is, or uh, this amendment is approved, uh, when we'll have all the seven teams in operation? Five are in operation now, right? Yeah, so five so are fully operational now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, two are um, offers have been made, we're onboarding, okay. so, and then it's training, all, yes. all those things, yeah. Okay. But soon, right? So Very soon, okay, yeah. Good, all right, good. All right, thanks. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Councillor Prince I just wanted to, uh, I know Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Rutherford had some questions around uh, effectiveness of COTS versus, say, just transit peace officers and how do we get that information. Um, so debating whether we needed a subsequent motion or, or I think there is a report coming on May 1st, which is a uh, report to community and public services around advancing Edmonton safety and security, which I think the report's going to talk about downtown Chinatown and transit. Um, is that... Uh, an opportunity where that information can be can be ready for discussion uh, versus making a separate motion and having a separate report. I'm just wondering if that's a possible. possibility. Yeah. So um, with the May first, we have to back it up by at least a month and a half for approvals and whatnot. So I'm not sure if our evaluation pieces will be str will be ready. Uh, we certainly will provide whatever we can uh, for that transit yeah. piece on COT. Uh, but I if we don't have that information ready, we'll, we'll have to bring it back at a later date. Uh, which can be done via memo or whatever uh, committee deems. Yeah, I guess, and, and I'm recognizing the, the sort of timeline on reports, even if it's something that can be included in, say, a presentation versus the, the written report, at least give us a place to start from, and then if we feel we need more information, uh, maybe that's the place we would, we would make a motion. I just don't, I'm just trying to avoid making motion after motion after motion so that you're constantly in sort of reporting mode, but if there's a way to get something there uh, that, that can start us down that path, we can then. Yeah, whatever we have available uh, at the time of that May 1st um, discussion, we will provide uh, with a caveat of, these are the other things we're working on and we'll get it to you and we'll be able to provide a time frame at that point. Okay, all right. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, so that's, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, those are all my questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, I'll just go next. I haven't had an opportunity yet. I do want to thank you for your work. I know what good work you do. Um, I, I do want to uh, pick up on what Councillor Rice was saying about the deliverables and about the, the ratio, the percentage of people that accept help. Because you, as you said, not everyone's ready at that time to accept help. Do we ask why or, or what we can do to see what they what their wants and needs are from their perspective? Um, n no, uh, but we uh, keep circling back. Um, so one of the things I hear from our teams is that uh, we say hi to you every single day and uh, you know offer those supports. Are you, you know, not may maybe are you ready for them today, but how are you doing today? Is there anything we can help you with today? Um, and, uh, you know, 20th interaction, 30th interaction, maybe that's when that, uh, that person will say that they will accept some help from us. But it's really just about being visible, being present, um, and when, even when we're dispatched, um, being able to offer those supports, and hopefully the next time is when they're able to um, accept those supports. Yeah, and I would just add, like, we're really using a human-centered kind of trauma-formed approach. Um, that's not really a question we would want to ask because we really want to focus on where meeting that individual exactly where they are at. And as Cheryl stated, sometimes it's 
dirty interactions because they need to trust and you need a relationship. Um, so that does take time, you know, and, and um, then sometimes you could just take them for a coffee and then the next time you'll be able to go maybe to a, an addiction center. You know, it's, it's just little kind of baby steps, but really just respecting that trauma-informed approach and that human-centered approach. Um, I also just wanna make a comment on the lower data is that uh, we also have to keep in mind that a lot of that data is only based on say two teams or three teams or four teams because we're only, we just got up to our five team and we're not at our seven yet. So having two teams on there, we're not gonna be able to show um, as much of an impact, we're not gonna be able to work as, um, with as many uh, Edmontonians as we would when we have five teams out there. So I just wanted to add that as well. Yeah, no, great for saying that. And I just wanted to clarify, I didn't mean why won't you accept it? I mean, what is it that we can do to help you is I guess the, what I was meaning to say. So thank you for uh, those answers. I'll just, I'll just add one more thing is that um, um, there, there's so much system navigation that has to happen. And um, you know, folks who are marginalized really don't expect to hear yes um, at those windows. And so to avoid hearing a no, they sometimes just won't even enter into that possibility. Um, so that, that's a real thing in our community. And so having our folks be with them um, along the journey, I think softens the blow if it's a no today, or, or maybe they hear it's a no, a no today, but not maybe in a week. And, and that's why that relationship building is so important. Just to add to a little bit of what Cheryl said as well, some of these folks aren't used to a friendly face in spaces either. So even if they're not ready to accept any, any help, having someone actually willing to show up and say hello and smile and check in how they're doing, that's a difference too. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Stevenson? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, I think that in Edmonton we have a bad habit of developing great pilots and small scale programs that work really successfully and then we don't scale them up. So, so back to the questions that Councillor Nack was asking. Um, so appreciate that some, some preliminary information will be coming forward um, uh, May 1st, but when do we have that big conversation about, again, does it become the, the standard model that actually every one of our TPOs is, is partnered with a social worker? Like when do we have that, that conversation? And I know that probably it won't ever be every single one, but when do we talk about um, taking the learnings, taking the success from this and, and building it up? It's still a pilot program. Let us get our evaluation in order. I, I love the enthusiasm. I'm with you. I'm with you. I would like to just, let's go. But we have to do our due diligence. Let's do the evaluation. Let's make sure that what we, that we're, that our efforts are best aligned, getting the, the greatest amount of uh, impact that we want um, or, and, and can have. So I'll just refer to the team about just what the timelines are for the getting, completing the evaluation and when we can come forward with the bigger ask. I, I just want to uh, tack on to those comments too that um, by being in partnership, we are building capacity in our TPOs to be able to understand um, how the system works, what, you know, what are the entry points, what are the entry requirements, um, how to talk to, to some of these folks that we're encountering in these, in these transit centers. So um, capacity is being built um, and, uh, and we're hearing, what I'm hearing from, from our leadership teams is that uh, there's other TPOs who wanna be relief because they're seeing the impact in, in some of those TPOs Absolutely. that are involved, yeah. And, and that they are being trained to be ready to offer that relief. So I, again, it's like those ripple effects are there. How do, we, how do we amplify and magnify that further? Kind of to go off that for a second as well, actually, when we talked chatted earlier about what learnings have come from this, it, exactly that, the, the learnings from this partnership between our two organizations. So while Cheryl mentioned learning the bureaucracy of the city, uh, the folks on the front line are learning so much from each other, that's capacity building, but every single level of governance, we're learning and taking things away from the relationship that we have with Bentero. So whether it's day-to-day uh, -day basis, practices, training, how we're hiring, there's takeaways on all sides of this, and it's been a really beautiful thing. Great, thank you. So just just in terms of that that broader conversation, so again, I know we sort of started off by saying that, that it wouldn't necessarily be a report coming back to council. So we know we have that check in May 1st, um, but, but again, do we anticipate having that moment to have that bigger discussion? Um, yes. 
okay. we will have that bigger discussion. Uh, may, I, may I offer, and I haven't, of course, uh, socialized this with the team, so they're probably going to be kicking me uh, virtually under the table, but maybe when we have all seven up, uh, seven up, all seven teams operational, give us six to nine months to see what that looks like yep. and then come back with the report that's, that shares our learnings and our best recommendations. Excellent. Yep, that sounds good to me. Thank you. Thank you, Kels. Oh, one sorry. More. And one last question: Are we doing um, race-based data collection or sort of extended demographic? No. Is that uh, is that something that's sort of been a conscious choice not to do? I know that that's just sort of um, increasingly recognized as best practice. I'm wondering if we're we're moving in that direction. Thank you for the question. Yes, I think th um, through our evaluation, we'll have a more fulsome conversation around that. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice? Uh, just want to confirm then this recommendation will be approved at committee level or not going to council level? Uh, to yeah, I can confirm that. Yeah, so this recommendation can be approved at the committee level, yes. Because it's a budget, uh, but it will not Im impact the budget even though it's uh, money related. That's correct. So if that's the case, and Chair Principal, may I ask a few questions? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. And I just uh, want to get to the final vote. Uh, so I'm sorry if I take a little bit longer time here. Um, so specific to uh, city administration, and because uh, car team, like Mayor uh, Sohi mentioned, um, I actually really appreciate um, this uh, major approach and to address uh, the transit safety and the security concern. And the work is there is really important. And just from two points, and one is about uh, from public awareness perspective. Um, like I, sometimes I take public transit as well. And then I, um, intentionally to look around and to see that any interaction there or any work or piece over there and then it seems is not obvious to the writers. So I just want to uh, give this comment and then from that public awareness perspective and so this work is in place and to support our transit safety and security. Um, so. Uh, I just want to know if there are any plan for that. I, I believe there will be plan and for the next, but how to increase that public awareness, that is one. Uh, the next point uh, is about the rider uh, satisfaction of safety in transit. Specifically for this um, key measures, right now based on the emails, phone calls and interactions I received from constituents, some Edmontonians. I think this satisfaction and is still not here, but I heard yes, if we have more team and we will see more impact, we will see the, uh, more progress. And I think Edmontonians is really uh, looking forward uh, looking forward to see this impact, specifically if we look at our ridership right now, is already back to the normal, back to the pre-COVID. And then this safety uh, and security concern is really important to adjust. Um, so that is why I ask first question is for any operating, how we uh, run this operation team and for the scope, for the deliverables, how we can refract those type of concerns. This some points, I really want to get a sense and. So I think this, this speaks to the communications plan and how can we amplify the work that is happening uh, and we take that point. Uh, we can always do better communicating. We often assume people know because we know um, and we can do better there. So I'll work with uh, Dwayne Hunter who is the Director of Transit Safety who is helping to deploy a larger comms plan of which COD can be a part and uh, we'll also work with our communications partners to see how and when we can amplify. So is there any number, and since the data uh, reporting began in, 2000, in January 2023, is there any number to demonstrate um, the, another point, operator assaults, 
per year reduced. Yeah, I and think then there is no data reflecting in the report for this piece. Yeah, the, the, the intention of this work coming to you today was really tightly scoped around the amendment request. The, the larger questions around uh, some of the data points uh, around um, perception of safety or operator assaults, that, that we don't have that information with us, but it certainly will be brought forward in the public transit conversation that is uh, scheduled. Okay, so we're looking forward to that conversation. And I you know, have 30 seconds, uh, so it, if I can just uh, do my quick sure. comment and I don't need Go to speak. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. This is important conversation, also important information for our public to be aware and then we are, we have the car team and actually work with our city and peace officers to address this issue. And then it's not about the work is not getting done, it's about the work in the progress. But how we can measure that progress and for the next next three years and based on this amendment contract and then that be uh, the results uh, Edmund Tongyans look to see and also look to positive experience as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak to it quickly? Councillor Jans, go ahead. Thank you, and again, I just want to thank administration for and our partners for all of the work that is brought into this. Um, on Saturday, we hosted an event called Transit Camp, and we had about 360 people registered to come and talk transit at uh, the University of Alberta, and um, these questions came up quite a bit. And a couple of the themes, if I may share, as it relates about uh, the problems of society being problems of the platform, that um, the closure of the safe consumption sites, the lack of housing, the lack of shelter, the um, just the, the how we have been bottlenecked, as Mayor, Mayor Sohi said, by the provincial government, um, and how that has really, in the last three years in particular, um, riders and others have expressed such an acute um, challenge there. Also this question of, and why I'm so excited to have this report today was uh, the, the compassionate and, and thoughtful approach you're taking to it. Um, many of the participants expressed the, they were concerned about safety, but also there was a reframing of safety for who? Knowing that many of us in this room are not likely to get Shigella, not likely to be um, sexually assaulted at, this, at the same rate as others, not likely to be harmed by violence at the same rate as others, not likely to have bloodborne diseases or, or other harms as others and just the, 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 when we talk about a safety crisis downtown and a safety crisis on transit, really needing to say who's safety and to unpack that a little further and um, talking about just the, the danger that some of our neighbors and, and, and family are, are in on the platforms. And, and, and these are, everyone is an Edmontonian, whether you have a fixed address, an ID or not. And um, the request that kept coming up was an idea of, um, uh, having empathy and and certainly what your report has brought forward today and the approach you're taking is is leading with that empathy and um, the urging as loud as we can and I know the mayor has been um, turning beet red in the in his face by repeating over and over and over the need for um, assistance from the province but that can't be understated enough uh, the other theme is is to sort of ask ourselves as Edmontonians the uncomfortable question about how much of the dialogue around safety is grounded in anti-Indigenous racism and having to kind of face and ask some of those questions about how that that presents and, and that came up as well as then finally, um, and it wasn't explicitly mentioned, but I think it did come up in the comments, the question about um, taking care of our youth and uh, the youth at risk and the youth houselessness strategy and the youth in government care and in foster care who are uh, um, coming out and on the platforms and many of the concerns around, again, safety. Uh, there's a fear sometimes of young people, but also what came up was very much a fear for some of the young people that they may be the victims of, of, of predation or harm or others. And, and so all this to say, all of the concerns of Saturday, I know you're working on and I know came up in your comments and I know are present in your, your, your work. So I just wanted to express gratitude and appreciation for that and know that we all will be uh, uh, just as just as animated as Mayor Sohi in advocating for the resources to ensure that when you do you your your part, someone else is there to do theirs. So thank you so much, and I appreciate it. 
Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I'll be very brief. Just wanted to again thank Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society for stepping up to this work. I know firsthand this is not easy work. You know, one of the reasons I asked the question about recidivism is because sometimes it can be hard day in and day out to see the same people and feel like you're not maybe making the difference that you had hoped to as a social worker. And so, you know, I, I really want folks that are on the front line to know that they are making a difference and they're so appreciated for the work that they're doing. I'm very much looking forward to having the full complement of us, all the staffing completely full so we can even have more success out there. And I'm really looking forward to having further conversations uh, with administration and with all of the partners working on transit safety to figure out from a systems perspective, how do we make sure, as Councillor Jans mentioned, that you are set up for success. And yes, it is um, voluntary and there's a lot of relationship building. And when they are ready, the worst thing that we can do is to not be able to support them because there's nothing on the other side. And so, you know, we're here, anything that that uh, council can do, please, please know. Um, I'm definitely keenly interested and aware of how we can support this um, going forward and also scale it up and support on the on the the entire systems approach. So thank you again for all your work for everyone that puts in tireless hours of hard work into this. Thank you. Mayor Sohi to close. <coughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Principe. <coughs> I uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, First of all, I want to start by uh, thanking our city administration, as well as Cheryl Yu and uh, your entire team at the Bentero uh, uh, Traditional Healing Society uh, for this partnership and the leadership that uh, that this partnership is providing in uh, uh, in uh, in tackling some of the challenges that we have on our public transit system. Uh, you know, uh, this program started in 2021 with uh, two teams with $200,000. Uh, is growing to uh, seven teams with uh, $700,000. Very proud to support that during the budget uh, uh, because, uh, you know, with even with two teams having 27 interactions uh, with people, with uh, uh, having those compassionate inter interactions where people felt uh, that they were, uh, they were, uh, that they were acknowledged, uh, that they were heard, and then having 510 engagements uh, are coming out of those with the specific referrals. So these are, you know, these are the people we're talking about. These are people who are struggling the most in, in, in our community and they are the victim of society. Uh, they are the most victimized people in, uh, uh, because of intergenerational trauma, because of the pain and uh, uh, lack of trust within the system, right? And uh, so it's gonna take a lot of efforts to uh, build that trust and uh, that L2700 start seeking help. It will happen, but it's gonna take a long, 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 long time. So I really wanna thank you for, for the, all the hard work you have been uh, have been doing and also identifying the bottlenecks. I think everything that we come into contact with these related social issues goes back to those uh, lack of support systems in the, uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the system that you know, there's no housing for people to go to. There's lack of dignified shelter spaces in, uh, in our city. There's lack of uh, uh, you know, treatment facilities, healing facilities, uh, recovery facilities, harm reduction, and all those things that we've been talking about and we will continue to talk about. Uh, but I do want to make a point that the, the challenges that we're facing on public transit is not that there's, there has not been lack, it's not because of the lack of effort from the city. We are making sincere efforts to improve our uh, 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 safety on public transit, and CART is one of them. We added more transit police officers, so we are funding more police officers. And, and I, but we would not be able to truly build a safe system in, until we tackle those bottlenecks, until we provide those long-term supports that society needs. But we will continue to do our part, and I hope our partners will step up uh, to. Uh, 
to provide us the necessary support. But with that, I don't want to take away the good work that you've been doing. That's saying, I really appreciate that. So uh, please keep on making the difference in people's lives, right? And uh, keep on having those compassionate conversations with them. And we are a caring city, and uh, that care and compassion, uh, what I know I've caught, what our stories I've heard, comes across so well, right? So, uh, so thank you for the work you've been doing. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you very much for being here today with us. We're on to item 7.2 now, and we do have a new uh, request for speak, to speak. So I will like to move that we hear from Jeannie Chin. And I will ask members of the committee to vote, please, on adding that uh, request to speak. I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have five votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that has carried. And Clerk Youssef, I just wanted to clarify that uh, our first speaker, Jill Tucker, has withdrawn. Okay, yes. she has withdrawn, so we only have uh, two speakers still. All right, so I see, do we have a presentation for item 7.2? Thank you, please go ahead. Good morning. We are here today to provide an update regarding a, rev a review presently underway of the joint use land agreement and how it could potentially address aging infrastructure renewal on school board owned lands. This report addresses a motion from committee that arose from a discussion of topics related to park development and redevelopment and how those projects are initiated and funded. This topic is significant because the provision and renewal of playgrounds generates interest from the public and we know it contributes to achieving our city building goals contained in the city plan. These discussions are often complicated and complex. A good illustration of this complexity is considering the responsibility of the renewal of playground infrastructure on school board owned land. Generally, the complexity arises from the diverse partners involved, the city plus three local school boards who all have their own obligations and capacities to consider. This report details how the city is working with the school boards to clarify responsibilities and plan for the renewal of playground assets and how that work is situated within the broader context of the collaborative land and asset planning, all of which has significant city building and financial implications. Joining me today is Hoeda Hassan, Director of Urban Growth and Open Space, Neil Osdick, Director of Land Development, and Corey Churchill, General Supervisor of Open Space Strategy. So I'll now ask Hoeda to present a summary of our report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we advance to slide three, please? Next slide. Thank you. Uh, the city plan provides strategic direction for the way Edmonton will grow to a future city of two million residents. The city is engaged with city building partners to advance the city plan, and school boards are key stakeholders we're working with to address both immediate and long-term challenges. It's crucial to develop an open space network that considers school sites to meet the needs of Edmontonians, and that implements the big city moves of greener as we grow and a community of communities identified in the city plan. An equitable distribution of investment in quality parks across Edmonton is essential for the successful implementation of the city plan district's approach. As well, an important component of the growth management framework is the need for thoughtful and integrated investment to increase and improve amenities as, as Edmonton's population grows and neighborhoods intensify over time. Next slide, please. Responsibilities related to playgrounds located on school board owned sites are subject to this joint use land agreement. This agreement was approved in July 2009 and is a partnership between the City of Edmonton, Edmonton Public School Board, 
Edmonton Catholic School District, and Conseil Scolaire Centre Nord. This agreement guides the planning, assembly, design, development, and maintenance of joint use sites for school and park purposes. The agreement uh, does not expire and is to be reviewed every 10 years from the effective date. The land agreement review started in September 2020 and a, and a subcommittee of city and school board staff was formed to undertake the review. The review will investigate several key themes, one of which is investment responsibilities. And one important topic within that theme is the need to better define responsibilities for the new renewal of playgrounds and other amenities located on school board land. Under the same theme, the land agreement also lacks clarity on responsibilities of the city and the school boards for preparing sites for school development, addressing servicing deficiencies on planned school sites, and supporting ongoing maintenance costs associated with vacant school sites. Next slide, please. As noted earlier, playground renewal is only one of the investment responsibilities to be clarified through the ongoing work between joint use agreement partners in response to the resp resource constraints that we're all facing. School boards carry financial pressures of maintaining non-operational schools, which often necessitates that these sites be declared surplus by the boards. The current process outlined in the land agreement results in sites that have no immediate identified need to be surplus, sold, and redeveloped. The scenario disproportionately impacts redeveloping areas, potentially causing misalignment with the city's long-term development pattern. The city plan outlines the need to develop mature areas and recognizes the importance of access to schools and neighborhoods. And in that sense, the city plan is in conflict with the financial realities faced by school boards and not strongly supported by the current process in the land agreement. A long-term real estate strategy would identify where school sites will be needed based on anticipated population growth and in alignment with the city plan. Next slide. Administration and school board partners agree that should the long-term real estate strategy proceed, it could be prioritized and completed in tandem with the land agreement review. The long-term strategy together with the JUA land review will further assess investment responsibility with respect to playgrounds and determine under what circumstances city-funded playground renewal and maintenance is appropriate. Once complete, the revised agreement will be brought forward for council, to council for consideration and approval along with identified budget and financial implications. Administration anticipates it will take up to two years to complete the balance of the work and all parties will continue to work to identify and implement efficiencies to advance work and corresponding approvals as quickly as possible. These are tangible examples of the work the city and school superintendents have prioritized to refresh the strategic alignment of the Joint Use Committee, including intentional neighborhood design that helps make Edmonton a community of communities safe, healthy, inclusive, and equitable. Thank you, and we'd be pleased to take questions at this time. Thank you very much. I would just like to call on our speakers. Uh, Monica Marchand, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Hi. And Can Jean, I start? Uh, not oh. yet. Just hold okay. on. I'll let you know when you can go. Okay. Thank you. And Jeannie Chin, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Great. So I'll just explain the process. Speakers will be heard in panels. Each speaker will have five minutes to present. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The, light, the timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there's one minute remaining, and flash red when five minutes are up. If you are participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. If you are participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the ha raise hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. So Monica Marchand, we'll start with you. You have five minutes. Okay. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'm the president of the Kensington Parent Association. Kensington School in Edmonton is over 60 years old and has never had a playground. I wanna highlight the massive inequality amongst access to play spaces for children in Edmonton. It is imperative that this is considered when looking at the city planning as a whole. 
Firstly, I think it's important for council to realize that playgrounds on school property are built off the backs of parents. Parents quietly sacrificed in countless hours of their lives to fundraise hundreds of thousands of dollars for playgrounds. Parents giving up precious time with their children. Um, parents giving up hours they could be earning money for their families. Parents do this so that the children at the school will have the same opportunities as children in other schools. In doing so, we beautify and improve the neighborhoods in Edmonton. Yet we do all this with no support from the city. Not only no support from the city, but since the community also has its own playground, we are often competing with the community league for every donated dollar, every volunteer hour, every grant. However, since the community playground is supported by the city, it's even more of an uphill battle for us. What neighborhoods do you think are the most successful in this fundraising? How many parents in lower income neighborhoods do you think are able to give up several hours a week to fundraise for a playground? Thus, the schools in lower income neighborhoods may end up with no playground at all. Also, in order to remove inequality, all playgrounds must be built fully inclusive for children with disabilities. However, with this comes even more fundraising, which means children with disabilities in some neighborhoods will not have access to play spaces. Since playgrounds have been shown to help children develop physically, socially, emotionally, and academically, this inequality must end. The city needs to include in their plan a way to ensure these playgrounds are built and not through thousands of hours of parent volunteering. The buck needs to stop being passed from government to government. Playgrounds for our children should not be political. However, the politics I've encountered with them could fill a book. Perhaps the city could fund playgrounds on school property and remove their community playgrounds when they were, are no longer functional. Or perhaps the school board would consider giving a section of land next to the school to the city. Unless something is worked out to address the playgrounds on school property, this inequality for Edmonton children will continue to exist. Please work this out for the sake of Edmonton children and their families. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jeannie Chin. Go ahead, Jeannie, you have five minutes. Oh, hello, Council. My name is Jeannie. To give some uh, background, my daughter attends Kildare Elementary in Watatsas, Winnewalk. Kildare has two playgrounds approximately 200 meters of each other, one owned and maintained by the school on school board title land, and one owned and maintained by the city on city-owned lands adjacent to, to the um, community um, league building. Both are aging infrastructure that has had equipment removed and due for replacement. The Kildare Parent Council has been fundraising since 2019 to replace the playground located on school lands. But fundraising opportunities during the pandemic has been challenging and parent volunteers have reached fundraising fatigue with how long it's been taking. I highlight this example in the context of the land agreement review because there are many schools and communities in the city that are of similar situations. I'm encouraged by the update provided by administration on the review and discussions with the joint use committee. Recognizing that this is a very complex issue, I feel the council needs to provide commitment and direction to administration in the review process on certain specific areas. In my opinion, the most important would be to acknowledge that the school boards do not have dedicated funding to replace aging playgrounds. According to the update provided, there are 177 playgrounds located on school board lands, of which only 64 are maintained by the city of Edmonton. Capital funding for replacing these playgrounds while the responsibility of the respective school boards fall largely to school parent groups. This leads to playgrounds not replacing by need, rather by fundraising ab abilities of the individual school communities. I ask the council and administration to, I, I ask council and administration to use the line review as an opportunity to build a community focused framework to determine playground requirements within the community. To refer back to the Kildare example, if the city, the community, and the Edmonton Public School Board can work collaboratively. Both playgrounds renewals should be considered in parallel instead of having two entities working in silos. Working together can potentially reduce funding requirements on both sides and to achieve a coherent vision for the community on a much needed amenity. The line review needs to incorporate flexibility to achieve that. And I feel that engagement needs to extend beyond the joint use committee. With the impl implementation of the city plan, I feel that creative and innovative solutions will be required to build the city that the plan calls for. And I look forward to the next update. So thank you for your time. Thank you both for being 
uh, here with us virtually and sharing your views. Uh, next, we will go questions. Any questions from committee members or other council colleagues? Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for both of you and then speaking to this very important topic to our kids. Um, I have a question to Jen, Jenny. Jenny, and so you mentioned something and then regarding the separate two entity and for the program instead of one, do you have specific, like for example, I, I heard some challenge and for to, we have the separate and the two entity to look at look after this program. And then if the integrated plan and together, so did you see and what specific from timeline to build the pre-grant or from funding model to support the grant will have some benefits or not? Can you do a little bit detail and provide? I can highlight, you know, this example that I speak of with the school that my daughter attends in Kildare. So you have a school built playground that's been in existence for a long time and I have no history on the community playground. They're within sights of each other. You can walk from one to the next probably in less than three minutes. The kids lovingly call it the big playground and the little playground. They're both aging and they both need to be replaced. But you have right now with the current model, the playground on the community league is maintained and operated by the city and the playground that's on the school board lands is main, owned and maintained by the school board. But when you're looking at the decision to replace them, why would you do this in silos? Like they are so close to each other. The kids are going to use them together. Maybe you just need to replace one, but not the other. So I, I think that there just needs to be existing. There just needs to be flexibility so that people aren't making decisions separately. And you have a school community that's been fundraising since for three or four years, trying to fill hundreds of dollars hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace the one on a school ground. But what if they did all that? And then three years down the line, we see the city potentially replacing the one that's 200 meters away. Would, should they have done it? Or should they have given up all this time? And But without collaboration and discussions between the city, the community, and the school at the moment, none of us have that information. So I don't feel that it's a good efficient method of addressing a community lead, a need that's used by both the school and all the children in the community. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Uh, yes, that's a very good answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's my question. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford? Sorry, trying to unmute. Uh, so my question is to Ms. Marchand. Um, for those that might not be familiar, can you elaborate a little bit on the Kensington situation in terms of the parallels and what you're experiencing with regards to fundraising and then two parks fundraising at the same time in the same kind of vicinity? Just for um, counselors that may not be aware of the situation and your experience with it. Sure. Um, yeah, Kensington School. So they they've never had a playground. There's the Kensington um, Community League playground, but it's about two blocks walking away across a field. So it's not uh, only older children can go, and parents have to sign a waiver. So it's not possible for children with disabilities and for younger children to ever use that playground during school hours. Um, so and we've encountered difficulties. Uh, so we've decided to finally try to get a playground. So we've been fund fundraising like crazy for over a year. Um, but they, the uh, community playground is also uh, near the end of its life. So the community league is also fundraising to build, to replace their playground. Um, so we have two playgrounds. Sorry, I hate people. to call, sorry, I hate to uh, do a point of order. We just, we lost quorum for a second and I think we need to. 
deputize we just, somebody. just have to, yeah, we just have to check and see if we have quorum at this time. Maybe Councilor Paquette's back now. I see his name on the list. Councilor Paquette, are you back on? Oh, the there meeting? he is. I see him. I, I was never gone. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. We do have quorum, so please go ahead. You, you will still um, have the same amount of time. Okay. Um, I kind of forgotten what I was saying. Yes, so we're both that you're both fundraising at yeah. the same time. So we're both fundraising at the same time. Possibly both. Uh, I. I don't have communication with the community league. I offered for the parent association to speak to the league um, to discuss how we could fundraise together or that the community want both playgrounds. Um, uh, I, I haven't, no, they don't answer me. The, the neighborhood resource coordinator was also on those emails and I never heard back about any kind of collaboration. Um, but the problem was, you know, we have a ball drive. They may have a ball drive at the same day. Um, they're applying for grants that we might be applying for. Um, it's also very confusing for the community because it's the community, the Kensington playground and the Kensington school playground. So um, it's, it's just feels like we're- else. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, it just feels like we're working in silos for like maybe the playground could be moved right next to the school and we could work together to do that. But I understand, you know, the property is owned by different people, but it's just, something has to be done to work together on these, mm -hmm. on these things. And you brought up something really poignant when you were speaking that I wanted to touch on as well about inequalities, like let alone the fact that there's two groups fundraising in, in this particular neighborhood. What would you say, um, do you think that, what would you say in terms of the ability for folks in the neighborhood to donate and contribute to, to these playgrounds? Uh, well, What's that's the average the, donation. Yeah, we can't, we don't get, I mean, the community is very supportive, but it's not a high income neighborhood. So we have to try to do our fundraising everything I try to do, we try to do more outside. So getting the whole city involved uh, because you're not going to build a playground with bottle drives. You, you need bigger um, going to businesses, getting out there, but also in these neighborhoods, people are working full time or they're new to Canada and people don't have time to go out in the daytime do presentations for service clubs, go knocking on businesses' doors, um, applying for grants. Like it, it's all near impossible to get volunteers in these areas to even fundraise. No, I it's appreciate definitely it. Un unequal, unequal. Yeah, no, I appreciate you uh, just shedding a little bit more light for for council colleagues that may not be familiar with the, the particular situation there. And thank you for taking the time to be here and, and speaking with us today. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Great, thank you so much to, uh, to both of you. Um, and as for uh, Jill Tucker, who cannot attend, um, I share some of her feedback in writing with the rest of my council colleagues. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, lots of insights there. Uh, Thank you for shedding the light on the Kensington situation. Um, I guess to Jeannie and Kildare. Um, so, do you know if the if the community league playground two hundred two hundred meters away is also looking to uh, is looking at you know applying for grants and that kind of stuff to renew their infrastructure? They were not in the process of it. However, with the new, um, I believe with as part of. Um, not this review, but the, I can't remember the new one. It used to be the NDPD, but now that's being revamped that right. communities are no longer having to do that where the whole cost of it is solely borne by the city. So I mm -hmm. think that that conversation will become irrelevant going forward for community competing against similar grants. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I'm the most up to date on that process, but that's my understanding of the proposal going forward in the 2023 budget year forward. So no, the short answer is no, the community is not doing that, but I don't think they would need to in the future with the new uh, process. Right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, um, you know, I, I am very, I think sympathetic to a lot of the efforts on the, on the parents council group. Many of you have been just working so hard at this for years and years. Um, you know, on the school board side, I know, 
they're all at the table, uh, but who is not at the table, I'm very conscious, is Alberta Education that does provide the capital funding. Um, I've asked Jill this in the past, but I'm curious to know from your perspective, what kind of conversation have you had with, say, a, with, with the Minister of Education to kind of highlight the urgency and, you know, the deep challenge that parents are facing? I don't think we've ever got to minister level, to be honest. I mean, we pro certain parents have reached out to their MLA's representatives, but yeah. I don't think we've ever gotten to the point to reach, for example, Mr. Lagrange or anything to that level. Uh, as I don't think traditionally capital funding for playgrounds has ever been included in the capital infrastructure. Of course, the school board can choose to take away some of their, use some of their existing capital funding to do that, but I don't think that's been historically the case. And so, no, it's a, no, we've never reached necessarily to that level at the GOA. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, and, uh, and I guess I'm also, um, I guess just wondering a little bit about kind of the outcome of, you know, this report that, that we were really looking for. You're, I heard you say a community focused playground framework as part of the agreement review that could potentially, you know, re reduce um, the competition between, say, community, the community and the school. Uh, but also wanting to see the city kind of step up in, in this role, which I don't think is possible to, to see full responsibility, but you wanted to see the city kind of step up a bit more. It's more than stepping up. I think it's having flexibility and it, with that framework, because right now it's pretty static, right? Like you, you were responsible for what's on your land and they're responsible for what they're on their land. I think it's more looking at it from a holistic community level. Like in Monica's case, Kensington says, do you really need two playgrounds within a block of each other? In Kildare's case, do you need two mm -hmm. playgrounds within 200 meters of each other? And I, I think that sometimes existing frameworks let um, what's already there be a roadblock or be, you're working with under existing frameworks and you're not reaching past it so that you're, you're stuck in a ways, right? And I think that if you're looking at it from a community level and what is the best use of your funds, if the city is already going to invest in certain playground infrastructure, should they consider collaborating with the school board? Should they, you know, just taking a holistic view is, is what I guess I'm asking for within yep. that framework. Do, do either of you have any thoughts on kind of the next steps outlined in this report, just in terms of, you know, some of those conversations are happening at a senior leadership level. Uh, and, you know, I think the intent is to kind of work more jointly together uh, as part of this review process. So any feedback on kind of those next steps and maybe the timeline too, right? Um, the only thing I would caution about is um the community league and the city like you can't have a playground far from a school so mm -hmm. the school has to have a playground right there for children with disabilities especially mm -hmm. so if decisions are being made i know that the city came back to us and said oh maybe we could move the kensington playground but that their property goes about 10 more meters closer to the school mm -hmm. um so y you know something has to be done so that um there is a playground next to the school and the city isn't saying where the playground has to go okay. without looking at the school's needs. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette? Oh, I am uh, jumped the gun. I'm for questions for administration. I forgot that you would go to me before Councillor Wright. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wright? Hi, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Chin, I, I just wanted, and maybe I'll check with administration on this, you'd reference funding from the, that was um, uh, set up from the previous government. And I, I think that was for new schools that they were providing 250,000 for new elementary schools, or was, it, was there something else that you were aware of? There was an alternative fund, I think it's called, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, Neighborhood NDPD, where, there was funding provided to communities to refurbish existing infrastructures and playgrounds are being eligible to existing playgrounds. Uh, the two, the new playgrounds and new schools is a separate funding, actually of which are existing playgrounds can't have access to. So okay, okay, so yeah, so the MPDP I think was the the yeah, the city's program that they're looking at. Okay, I just wanted to, right. to clarify that. I'm I'm just wondering with with those two playgrounds being so close together. Um, who provides like sort of the 
regular maintenance on the, the school one? The school. So they're, okay. they're entirely operated in silos. The school operates and maintains the one on their property and the city operates and maintains the one on their own property. So I'm just wondering, I mean, and again, maybe I'll, I'll ask administration as well, um, you know, while they're sort of in the location, sort of doing some regular maintenance and that on the on the city's playground that they manage. Um, yeah, would it be more cost effective maybe if they had the opportunity to just come around and, and check the school one as well. So, um, okay, I just wanted to clarify that that point with you. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Any more questions to the speakers? Okay, so I'll just ask the speakers if you're able to, to stay. We are going to be asking some questions of administration and we may be coming back to you. Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, just um, let me pull up my notes here. So we did get a, uh, a memo uh, back almost a year ago on the community parks framework and uh, community park, parks framework initiative, pardon me. And it's, you know, I understand that today we were actually talking about the joint use agreement. And uh, so, I, I can see how the conversation is getting blurred, but referenced in the report, it says the framework does not currently in, extend to school board titled land, uh, but would prior, prioritize capital development for nearby city land if school does not have an accessible adequate playground. That's just my memory. I'm not reading anything in from a piece of paper. Uh, so I am just curious uh, where we're at with that and how that squares with the conversation we're having. Uh, with the speakers right now. Sure, Councillor Paquette, uh, and perhaps somebody from our IIS uh, team can provide a little bit of um, uh, background to that. So I'll ask, I think, maybe Suzanne to talk about the community planning framework. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Uh, Councillor Paquette, we actually had sent a series of memos on the community parks framework through last year. We had sent one March 23rd, one the 19th, and September 8th. And so Ultimately, the community parks framework is aimed to give a more equitable approach to community park development, uh, exactly for the same reasons we're outlining, is that we identify the playgrounds that are on school board property, but also on school sites, but basically looking at the provision levels citywide on all sorts of community park amenities, including playgrounds. And so uh, that work was advanced through the budget cycle. We did get funding for MPDP transitions. So those uh, projects that were um, submitted prior to an October 15th deadline are advancing, which includes the Kensington one that is being referenced today on the community community site. Uh, and then we did get renewal funding for to actually advance the community parks framework uh, where appropriate and where the priorities are. Uh, but uh, due to prioritization, there was no funding available for growth of community park amenities. Okay, so. An interesting question brought up by one of the speakers, well, both actually, um, and one that I had, which actually initiated a lot of this work way back when we were talking about uh, uh, Soraya Hatha's uh, school opening and no park. And that's what sort of prompted this conversation. And that is that sort of, uh, you know, and where we are today, that cooperation and coordination with school boards about how we can do this and what the cost sharing would look like. Is there a cost sharing? Does the city take over? That sort of thing. So under the Community Parks Framework, Councilor Paquette, we are looking as part of base level development moving forward to deliver the playground at, at during base level. And so that would be a, a big change going forward is that the city would be providing the playground at the time we're doing the sports fields and everything else. And so when we engage on park sites, of course, we are engaging with the school boards and the stakeholders around on that design. So that would be some of the discussions that would happen around future planning of these sites. Right, okay. So that's not gonna be an answer that, the, that uh, the, the parents who might be watching are going to really understand. Can we just give it to them really straight? When your sports fields go in, so will your playground. Yeah, okay. So, and uh, the the intent here 
is I think is that uh, we work on what's before us today, the joint use agreement. Uh, and then uh, we layer that on with the new uh, community planning. And uh, that should lead to an easier time for communities to get parks. I mean, that's the, the essence of it, right? Yeah, I think going forward, Councillor Briquette, on new growth sites, I think that that is a simpler conversation on the renewal of existing, which is yeah. the conversation we're having today. That's a bit more nuanced and delicate, um, especially as we look at provision levels, the, the comments being made where we have two playgrounds on one site. I think we're going to want, no, we want to be thoughtful about how we deliver and the provision levels and, and level of investment we're putting in our, into our park sites. Which makes sense because eventually these new areas will become old areas and we'll need the land use agreement. Okay. Well, uh, Madam Chair, happy to put the recommendation on the floor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Okay. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principe. Uh, thanks for this report. I, I guess the, the question I was curious about, this is something we I remember talking about for years and years. Um, appreciate there's a lot of important work that's happening in Min to Admin. I'm curious if there is um, a need uh, or, a, or a potential benefit of having some council to board conversations with the admins in the room uh, in advance of coming with a draft agreement. Um, and the reason I ask is, is I think there's a lot of information we're getting and the school board trustees are getting that I, I haven't felt have necessarily all come together and I'm just wondering the best way to help make that happen. So, Councillor, um, interesting question. So, the thought right now would be that probably where we're at in the stage of the review, that administration to administration is probably um, the most efficient route, but there could be the opportunity in the future to um, have more involvement like you described, but it's not currently planned in the, the work right now, but we can take that back and look for opportunities where that might be helpful to the project um, in the review. Yeah, I, I, and, and I ask because, yeah, truly, I, I, I think about over the years, I've, I've, I remember having chats with folks on the school board and, and well, gosh, I mean, we've got a current counselor who's on the school board and I know there was a, um, and I, and I just feel like, and again, maybe it's likely due to a lack of understanding on my part, so I'll, I'll, I'll you know, put myself to blame on that because I don't understand the, all the intricacies of it, but yet I hear a lot from community about their needs and desires and things that they're looking to have addressed. That comes through to me, and I don't necessarily see that reflected in what we end up coming up with the final agreements on. And so I, and that's why I'm worried that that if if we just wait until a draft agreement comes, are we stuck again, sort of agreeing with something and then waiting another five years to to fix what I believe are are issues that have been coming up quite a bit. So that's why I'm wondering if there, even if there's an initial check in to see, you know, are are we close or are there some things that maybe for whatever reasons hasn't come to the admin to admin table, but have been coming up regularly at the elected representatives table that can help inform that next stage. Uh, just a quick response back, Councillor. So we, we don't have in the report, but um, we were anticipating that we can return to committee and provide an update at some point um, midstream so that mm -hmm. we can give an update. And perhaps that is a, a really excellent time to then review, are we achieving and, and addressing everything that needs to be addressed? And is there the opportunity then to um, have council involved more deeply? Okay. Um, so that review ideally in the project right now would be probably early Q1 or late, early Q1 next year or late Q4 this year, potentially that we could come back with an update for, count, for committee um, and that may then help with the next steps of council's involvement. Okay, that's helpful. And I mean, I, you know, I, I understand that, you know, broadly we're trying to, you know, we, we engage informally, and that's the problem, I think, it, just as, as councillors, I know I engage pretty informally with a lot of the trustees, but we haven't had a lot of sit-down time. We've done that in the past, but not with all three school boards together in the same room, and so um, maybe we can take some time to think about, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take some time to think about what that would look like um, to try to, help because it's not just the joint use there's broader issues but joint use is a big one that we come to and and again the the, the feedback I'm generally hearing from community groups is that acts and I know the playground was the heavy emphasis on this but there are other aspects of the joint use agreement that I feel haven't been addressing things like community access to gymnasium space and, and other spots like that that 
feel like they've never really been settled and, and I want to see how we can help bring everyone together for that. So, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'll stop talking for now and think about that a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Principi. So, uh, I, I do appreciate this conversation because the programs and these are many uh, residents in the community care about and the important to our kids. Um, because the review is underway, does that mean that from now to the review finish, we don't have any new money and full pre-grants program? We don't have any. So I just want to confirm that. So I'll also defer to Ms. Young, but um, as part of the last budget cycle, there was money approved for renewal, but not for growth. Um, Ms. Young, did you want to add anything more to that? Uh, yeah, Councillor Wright, uh, under CM 30, or 3636, that's the NPDP new, that there is some growth money to transition the, the neighborhood park development program out in the order of 5 million, and that was the October 15th deadline. So there's funding to, to move that forward. And then um, as Madame Ms. Hassan said, there is under 3200, uh, under a renewal composite, there is money to advance the renewal of community parks. Uh, of course, those that are prioritized with the funding available, but there is no growth funding for the actual community park amenities. Uh, and so that, that is on the growth side. So Unless the community has advanced an MPDP application, there currently is no growth funding available. So then is that fair to say, and from now and to the review finish, and we will not have the new programs will get opportunity to be built. Um, let me say this way, and in two separate lines, the one is a community league site and one on the school board line. So there, there are, as Ms. Young mentioned, um, projects in the pipe that will be built as part of the, M, the former MPDP program, but those, I, I believe those are the only new playgrounds that would be built, is that right, Ms. Young? At this time, that's correct. Um, so right now, so far, and currently, and we have 141 pre-grants located on school board line. Um, among those, 77 maintained by the respective school boards, and then for the other remaining 64 pre-grants maintained by the city. Um, so if we just received this as information, if we save it as information, does that mean nothing change at this moment? So everything um, stays the same and in terms of the collaboration or partnership between uh, city and school boards. So, so Councillor Rice, the, the work that, um, that's described in the report has started, so it is underway. So we don't, we don't need um, a motion or direction from committee at this time to continue on exploring the work. And what you've heard from speakers is, that is an accurate issue. There is frustration in the community um, that yeah. is valid. And the work that is described in the report is looking to address that. Very much what they're hoping to see is, is the intent of the goal of that report. So um, it, in terms of there could be some unique aspects um, for individual sites that we would absolutely be open to working collaboratively, uh, but the, the entirety of the work is still ongoing. And it's really important to um, go through that whole piece of work because there is a number of, of boards, three separate boards. We wanna make sure we have a consistent approach across the city and not just with one particular board. So it's really important to take the time to make sure we get an equi equitable, appro uh, equitable approach and process for um, all boards and all Edmontonians. You, yes, that, I understand that. And because the partnership not on right now and so far for this joint use agreement is between the city and the three other boards. Um, and the re, re, renewed happened every 10 years and it, was, it already expired in 2019 because the last renew and happened in July 2009. And so that means right now from 2019 to now, already almost four years. 
and we still keep the same and not the progress or change to address the concerns we just heard and from today's speakers. But that is just one example. We actually heard many, many other similar concerns from different areas, like different school parents council as well. So, Councillor Rice, the, the actual agreement doesn't expire, but it, there is direction that we review it every 10 years. So we are still under the direction of the current agreement. We have governance under that. Uh, so that hasn't expired. Uh, granted, yes, what you're saying is true, that the review has taken some time. It's reflective of the complexity of, of the four large organizations that, that need to work through these pieces together. And they have also differing, we have differing levels. I'm sorry, of, I don't want to cut sorry. you off, but we're <laughs> over time. Sorry about yeah. that. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just go next. I have a quick question. You had mentioned that uh, you would return midstream, say, Q1, either of 2024 or Q4 of 2023. Did you need direction, committee direction for that, or is that just something that will happen? Uh, that is something that we can just bring forward, um, and we'll look to bring forward when there's been a, a milestone or a decision point that we think a check-in with committee might be appropriate, but that would be the time frame window that we'd be looking to come back. Okay, so you don't need direction from that for Correct. that, but okay, yeah, Correct. we would appreciate that, thank you. Okay, next we'll go to Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to, to follow up on some of the, the comments and questions that were made by speakers, um, and I know Councillor Tang raised this, but where where is the province on this? Because um, I, I know we obviously have hundreds of playgrounds that we are, are maintaining and replacing. School boards don't have dedicated funding. Um, and it seems like that burden is being downloaded onto communities, parents, it seems to me that the province has a role to play here. Um, have they been around the table? Uh, where's Alberta education? Um, I guess not directly, and maybe I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues as well in real estate, but um, we have more conversations with administration who then have conversations with their school board trustees who then are the conduit, I suppose, to the province on that. Um, with respect to infrastructure in particular, there are conversations that happen, say, with Alberta infrastructure um, on occasion as well. Um, but yes, point taken. Is there potentially um, a joint advocacy piece that could could arise from this work? It, potentially, yes, it, it could come to that. and. Um, because the province does have a, a role to play, and this is not a unique to Edmonton situation. This is something that every community in Alberta wrestles with. Yeah, yeah, and I guess um, as we work through this process, uh, will those types of recommendations make themselves sort of apparent and clear uh, as, we, as we work through things? Um, just trying to see, you know, how, how we can support uh, that type of, of advocacy. I, I am being reminded also by Ms. Young that we do have some funding that um, comes through from the province from for new playgrounds that we try to leverage right. then. So there is there is that uh, support available. Yeah, yeah, definitely on the, the new new side of things, but um, just knowing that there's that huge gap on, on the renewal piece in, in more mature neighborhoods. Uh, I, I'll just put it out there for the committee that, you know, I'd, I'd look forward to those types of opportunities uh, in the future for joint advocacy. I think that could be a really, a really important piece of this conversation. Um, Count Councillor, could I respond really quickly? Course, just that we, we will take note of that and when we come back to committee, we'll uh, identify those opportunities if they Excellent. exist. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and then just some questions on the long-term real estate strategy. Uh, so maybe just one that I'm aware of, so I know Edmonton Public has released a real estate strategy um, that has identified a number of closed school sites that they might be looking to dispose of. Um, and I'm just wondering, what does our engagement with them look like? How are we proceeding on that front? How does that integrate with a larger real estate strategy, trying to grapple with what Put, putting all these pieces together. Can someone explain that to me? Um, so all of those sites are part of this larger conversation. Okay. Um, one of the issues that was identified in the, in the JUA land review is that we as a city are working towards city plan, yep. um, figuring out how the city redevelops and, and uh, mature neighborhoods grow in population. Um, so that conversation came up at the JUA and 
specifically related to surplus school sites and whether or not we're looking at those as part of that bigger picture. Um, so yeah, they are being, they are part of that larger conversation about whether or not we need to retain them in the future or can we get rid of them. Right, right. And how, how proactive can we be in, in, I guess, leading those conversations? Like if we're looking from a district-wide scale or city plan scale, um, and we know that we are trying to attract more people to these neighborhoods, uh, how, like, are, are we proactively identifying sites that we know we will want to either see redeveloped or retained? Yeah, so that's part of the work yeah. that we're doing. So, okay. so what we're doing is, is we're projecting out we're, we're hoping to, if, if we move ahead with this work, um, project out population growth at you know the various in, in, uh, <coughs> intervals that the city plan will see growth in. And then identify where we'll see populations of students resurging in those areas and then identifying you know at what point we would need <coughs> more schools in those areas and where we would need them and then trying to secure land for those sites. So it could be retaining some of the existing ones that we have or identifying early that we need to start looking for land to acquire new sites, um, all those kind of things. And then working with our school board partners to figure out which group needs land where. Right, okay. Um, oh, I'm out of time. I'll have to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I want to hone in on first uh, what should be a quick question around the surplus school sites discussion. Um, and I thought it was really interesting in the report how it mentions, you know, that I guess what kind of lead time are you going to be? Are you going to be re, um, negotiating the lead time you get on notices of surplus lands? Because it sounds like there was sort of a uh, in that report, it talks about. Um, that sometimes it's hard to predict the timing. And so if we're doing a four year budget, for example, but we don't know what surplus sites. Yeah, any thoughts on that from the work that will be done? Yeah, it, it is something that's been identified as a problem as part of the JV land, land review. And it's one of the reasons why we wanna work on the strategy together with the school boards. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that we would have a better understanding of where we're gonna need schools and where we aren't gonna need schools. Um, and an understanding of what the situations could arise, like if we need to, if we can truly sell a site or if we need to find some kind of interim use um, for the site, well, there's no, no need for it right now, but there might be one in the future. So we're hoping, and this is, you know, something that will come out of the work or maybe a subsequent body of work, but we're hoping that, yeah, we can get to a spot where we can predict when school sites will be um, declared surplus and we can properly plan for that. Okay, I'd, I'd like an update on that. And then just also on that same thread, when a site does become surplus, will we be talking about, like I know we, there's like the different tiers of like first right of refusal to the city of Edmonton, but I'm thinking about, for example, charter schools or, or anything like that in terms of it still being used as a school site, but maybe not by the Francophone, the Catholic or the public school division. Um, <clears throat> that is, so with our JUA partners, like when we're talking about surplus school sites, um, we don't really have, we don't really necessarily have control over who the end purchaser would be of those sites. So if, if that was the case, potentially uh, a charter site would go there. But one of the things we are looking at doing as part of this um, land review or the, the long-term strategy is if there is a, a site that's not required for for um, school purposes and is truly declared surplus, then we would look to find some kind of collaborative development approach with the boards where, you know, the, the use would be something that would be in line with both their vision and our vision of what a complete community would be. Okay, okay, okay I'll be less, I'll be less coy. <laughs> the Mac Islamic school and the whole surplus stuff, what lessons learned from that will be integrated into this next joint use agreement. Uh, <clears throat> charter, the, the charter schools aren't part of the joint use agreement. So that's a whole separate conversation that would, would need to happen that falls outside of the JUA. Okay, so there's a gap there. 
am I understanding that correctly? Like whether we address it today, right now, that's a potential gap. Yeah, it is. It is definitely an outlying variable that that's difficult to account for. I mean, even if we come to terms on what we would like to do with school sites as um, the school board partners in the city, a lot of that that charter conversation happens at the provincial level with the Minister of Education. So we don't always mm -hmm. necessarily have control over that. Okay. And then um, I thought that would be a quick answer, but I guess not. Um, I might have to do a second round. Just going on to the provincial advocacy piece, is there, I guess, to, is there anybody from InterGov that's on the line? No, there isn't. Okay, I'll, I'll take that question offline. I'm, I have another set of questions just about what this looks like in practice, but I don't think you can answer it in 44 seconds. So I will come back for another round. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wright. Hi, yes, um, I'm just wondering about, um, like looking at our city plan and, and looking at, at infill and, and we're talking about surplus school sites, are, are we in the school board looking forward to what those what those future needs might be? And, and rather than I guess declaring it surplus like right off the bat, maybe we should be looking looking ahead. Yeah, Councillor, that's that's exactly what the real estate strategy is is looking to do. So looking oh. forward at, at what we're gonna need at those population intervals and identifying where we'll need schools in the future and then and then together with the school boards figuring out the best approach to to managing that land while we wait for that that need to come in the future okay great and and then in the interim can those sites be used for sports fields like for um soccer fields cricket pitches i think that's that's one of the things we want to have a look at is what are the different scenarios we'll run into as we look forward and then planning for what those scenarios will be. So some of those will for sure be what is an interim use and and that could potentially be sports fields or something else. Okay, awesome. And then I've, I've also had some inquiries from um, local schools um, concerned about about the open space onto you know high traffic locations and that. And I'm wondering whose responsibility would it be to to fence those in, like the school yards. We're, we're actually not certain about that. We might have to take that one back, Councillor. Okay, and is that something that could maybe be included in a, a future report back to Council or? Yeah, Councillor, we could um, take that away and provide a, a memo back to Council with that answer if that's acceptable. Okay. Uh, yeah, awesome. and, and then I'm also just wondering about the, I guess, the, the taxation of these sites. Is, is there any revenue that the, the city gets from this, from the, the school site? Hold on, uh, Stacey Padbury is coming up to answer your question. I would have to double check, but if this if the site is just used um, by the school, it is not a taxable. There's no taxation um, associated with that property, or I, I would say it falls into the grants in lieu of taxes. Um, and we don't always recover 100% of it, but the school board itself doesn't get a tax bill. Okay, okay, and then does that include, okay, so the school boards don't get it, but what about those private or charter schools? That I would just have to double check on. I could probably provide that answer uh, after lunch. Oh, that'd be great, excellent. Um, and then I just had, no, I think that's all I have for now. I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, before we break for lunch, 
Uh, I had heard you mention that uh, we're managing the land until the need is determined for the use of that land. Was that my understanding? I wouldn't say we as a city necessarily. It, it's just collectively between us and the school boards trying to figure out what needs to happen with these sites. So some of them are reserved land, which would fall back to the city, but some of them are currently non-reserved land, which those school boards own. Um, and those are probably the ones where it's a little bit less sure about what should happen with those pieces of land because the school boards don't want to continue maintaining them, especially if they got a, a non-operational school site. That's that's requiring them to spend a lot of money to keep it there when there's, there's nobody using it. Um, but yeah, it would be part of that collective trying to figure out what we as a group would like to do with these sites. Yeah, and my concern, as I've expressed before, is that uh, I would like to see a master plan before we're selling off the, the sites, and I, I see that we're selling off parcels here and there without having a master plan, and I would like to see that prior to sale of those lands. But uh, we'll be breaking for lunch now. We'll be in recess, and we'll uh, see you after lunch at 1.30. Thank you.
We are live from River Valley. I don't. Thank you. Hello. Welcome back, everyone. I would like to call the meeting back to order. I will do a quick roll call of committee members first. Mayor Sohi. I'm here. Hello. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. I'm sure he'll join us shortly. We're joined by Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Tang. Hello. Hi. I see Councillor Paquette online. Hello. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hi, hello, Councillor Salvador. Hello. Hello, Councillor Cartmel. And Councillor Jans. Okay, and roll call is done. We will just going to we are going to uh, ask for an item to be brought forward before we continue discussion on the joint use agreement uh, mayor Sohi would you like to yeah I move that we bring forward Edmonton Arts Council uh, uh, for voting purposes only I, I'll follow up my with my questions offline because I have to head out to uh, uh, legislature right uh, so if you can bring forward a move on it right so if uh, if other others don't have any questions or you have questions, then uh, then probably leave it as it is, you know? <laughs> yeah, because then I'll, I, I won't even, I just won't be able to vote on it, because that's fine then. Yeah, that's, yeah. I thought they were, if nobody had questions, then I can bring it forward and vote on it and let Sanjay go. If committee members have questions, then keep it on the agenda as it is. Keep it on the agenda yeah. as it is, yeah. then? Yeah. Sorry, Sanjay. Okay, yeah. sounds good. All right, so we'll go back to uh, joint use agreement, item 7.2. And up next is Councillor Tang. Go ahead, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this report. I know this is sort of, you know, an ongoing uh, many informational reports here. Um, on the question of, of accounting for percentage of green space um, in a neighborhood, uh, can I just, can you clarify if we account for green spaces uh, on school grounds, such as fields and playground? Or is that outside of? Uh, so Councillor, I think you're referring to in new communities when we um, are, have a subdivision in front of us and we're looking Sorry, at- I'm not talking about, like, I'm, I think the contest for today is on very specifically mature neighborhoods. Um, hmm. I'm not talking about new neighborhoods. Okay, so the, 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 the joint use agreement does cover both uh, mature and greenfield new neighborhoods as well, but in terms of mature neighborhoods, that municipal reserve, uh, if that legal designation already exists on the parcel at the time that it was subdivided, depending on when it was, if it was decades ago or, or longer, um, then perhaps that may have the municipal reserve designation, but there are possibilities that it doesn't have that municipal reserve designation as well. Okay, so it is, it's, has to have that designation to be for us to, to account for that. Um, uh, and just you know, a, a different question. Uh, so a lot of the parents who, are, who spoke today are with a public school board. Um, are, is this the same, would you say this is the same dynamic with a Catholic school board? Um, is there a kind of a difference in how they approach? You know, my, my understanding is that for the Catholic school board, they, they're able to use their surplus, for example, to purchase, um, to replace playgrounds. Uh, does the public school board have that capacity? Has that come up during any of the joint use agreement conversations? Uh, thank you for the question. It's probably a similar scenario. Um, I'm not aware of any playgrounds that we're dealing with a similar situation that are titled to Edmonton Catholic, but I, I wouldn't see it as, um, as as very different to to the cases that are coming forward. Okay. Um, and then another question just around, like, what do other municipalities in, in Alberta do? Um, 
you know, my understanding is that some do provide funding for for playgrounds uh, on school properties. Um, although recognizing, you know, there's different contests in a big city, et cetera. I'm just wondering, have we ever done that kind of scan? Uh, we're actually we're looking into that as part of a, a different motion that we're responding to on uh, park development. Um, that that work is playing out now, and we are actively engaging with other jurisdictions to understand how park and playgrounds are are being funded and developed. Okay, that's good to hear. I look forward to that report. Um, I guess for me, you know. Um, you know, when I, I've been having lots of conversation with this with, with some other parents for, for quite some time. And my understanding too is that they've actually exhausted a lot of their options and they're here before us, not for the fact that they're mistaking jurisdictional responsibility, but because no one is really helping them navigate this conversation. And I find that if we're gonna talk about joint use agreement, if the province is not at the table, that does hold a lot of the funding decisions. It doesn't go anywhere. So I appreciate all the questions from my colleagues about provincial involvement. How do we get Alberta education and or infrastructure be at this joint use agreement table? Um, I mean, we can advocate, we can, you know, we can talk to administration, you know, on the side, but how, how do we get everyone to be in the same room to be talking about the same problem? So, Councillor, that's a, a really challenging question, um, <clears throat> and perhaps, um, so we don't have an immediate answer of how do we bring and engage um, <clears throat> with the province. Potentially, um, a question that was raised earlier by one of your colleagues um, before the break was around um, advocacy as well, and we committed to coming back with an update, and perhaps we can explore your question along with that as well in terms of if we do need to um, broaden the considerations and, and, and stakeholders, how do we then do that? Um, and we can work with our intergov folks on an advocacy approach as well when we come back. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm not, I, I'm not saying one, one or the other. I think we need both the advocacy piece. And I think a very specific advocacy piece is to, for them to be part of this particular table. I have a couple other questions. I'll come back for another round. Thank you. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Um, so in terms of vacant school sites, there, there are two types of vacant school sites, right? And one is just uh, uh, defined as a school site but never uh, happening for the development yet. That's one type. Another type is like the, some like mature neighborhoods. So the school is already closed and then school vacant. but they still have the pre-grant. Uh, so that's, I just want to con under, confirm my understanding correct. Can I, so is that two type of vacant school site? Yeah, you're, you would be, that's correct. Okay, so if that is the case, and for the input school site, and who will be initial to develop the pre-grant for the community in that area. So if I understand the question correctly, it's this is for a new new and new undeveloped uh, school site and who will be or should I say who uh, is responsible and to initial that pre-ground development on that vacant school site. Uh, maybe I'll start and if uh, I might uh, ask my colleague Suzanne Young to weigh in. So City administration would, would drive the initial funding request for a base level park development. Um, it's my understanding that moving forward, base level development would include consideration for a new playground as part of the initial base level park development led by the city. So from a timeline, from project timeline perspective, so it, it's possible or is already happening, we have built the playground first before the school built. Councillor Rice, we don't have any examples of that at this point in time because the community parks framework is just starting as part of this budget cycle. So historically we did base level development and then the community groups would fundraise, whether it be the community league or the parent advisory council. 
and then the playgrounds would be initiated after base level development. Uh, so for me, why I'm asking this question, and specifically, and for some newer development community, and then school development or school building will come far later than the community needs that program first. So in right now, the program is under review. I would like the consideration and to be included under this review to say and to meet community needs. And even though this site, school site plan for school development, but school development still takes time to do it. And then how we can ensure community needs will be met and then by who takes the initiative and who funded first and to develop that uh, program. So that is why I'm asking that question. That is also what I heard and from many residents in the community as well. Okay, so can uh, so how could that piece to be reflected in the in the program review and for the framework and a specific support of vacant school sites? So, Councillor Ray, am I understanding correctly? You're asking mm -hmm. uh, prior to when the school gets built yeah. in a new neighborhood, there is a need to have a playground yeah. there before maybe the school gets built, and yes. how do we advance? Yeah. That? So, and my understanding is that typically, like our current process, is that the playground would be advanced as part of base level yes. development, uh, but, but that's more proximal to when the school will be there. So I see what you're... So that is why I say, uh, is there any plan, is there any way we can refract and this request, this concerns and broad and above the residents in the community? So that is my question. I look at my time, I still have another question, very quick question for the um, after school closed, but the school building there and the playground there, and who will do take responsibility to maintain uh, those vacant school sites and for the playground? Uh, the playground maintenance, so apologies if I misunderstood the question. So this would be for, for playgrounds that are uh, on the, the list of school board? On the, on the school site, but the school already closed. Okay, so the, the maintenance, uh, in some cases it may fall to the school boards, in some cases it may fall to the city if it's one of the listed 64. Uh, defer to, to my colleague, Cheryl is, is, there, is there some specific clear line and then included or criteria included how we uh, maintain this, those type of playgrounds and in the empty and close the school site? Yeah, I think in those scenarios, it depends on how it was being maintained before. And as long as the ownership of the land doesn't become private for those sites where the city was already maintaining the playground, they continue to. So if it's a school maintained and the school will continue to? And if it was originally the school maintaining the yeah. site, they would continue to, yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. We'll move along now. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Really appreciate the question, uh, the, the report. and. Um, you know, I think the biggest question I had out of this report was again, how do we how do we come up with the joint use agreement without the province being at the table? But I think that's that's been discussed uh, pretty thoroughly. I think the other really exciting piece of this is um, you know combining the real estate real estate strategy with um, with this. I'm also wondering again if, if we are working in sort of the updated UPMP open space requirements as well as kind of that that third piece uh, to develop a real estate strategy? So the short answer is, is yes. Okay. Um, so uh, the retirement of, of UPMP and the broad implementation of Breathe, that work is happening now. We're initiating that work over the next several years. Um, so certainly the two will feed into each other, but the, the, t the sequencing and the timing, I, I suppose, is one, one question that we'll be working through in the coming year. Yeah, because I think I think having that answer on sort of what our open space standards will be has a really direct impact on what real estate decisions we might make around acquisition. So so as long I, I appreciate that that's a lot of moving pieces and those are uh, individually each very big projects. But I as I I think ensuring that the, that conversation between teams is happening will be will be really great. And then if this is a, a short answer, if it's a long answer, I can follow up offline. But If a school has been provided as MR at the subdivision stage, does the school boards can sell that at market? Am I understanding that? No. Okay. 
So we're so the the ones that we would have to acquire uh, and purchase would be non MR sites specifically. Okay, and so is our real estate an open space strategy? Then what assumptions do we make about MR schools that we will eventually have that as as or we already have that as inventory? Do we include that as our inventory? I think that's part of the strategy. So right now, generally speaking, if a reserve site becomes surplus to school needs, it comes back to the city because it's a, a dollar acquisition subject to if there's a school site that's been constructed on it, there's some adjustments made for that. But generally Sorry, speaking, could I ask you to speak into the microphone a little oh, bit? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Generally speaking, yeah, those, those come back to the city all the time. Um, but it gets a little bit more difficult to say when it's a non-reserve site because, yeah, those are owned by the school boards. Um, and they would have to be acquired at market value by the city. Okay, but we have that, we, we're we mapping that out. Like, so again, I'm just thinking, let's say in a, in a neighborhood we identify as being deficient in open space, are we counting MR sites as existing inventory? Yes, okay. uh, and for more so for the redeveloping areas, we are breaking down the distinction between MR sites and non-MR sites. Um, respecting that both are form the open space network, but both might have different and long-term uh, realities should one be, one be declared surplus. Okay, that's that's great. That, uh, that really helps me uh, uh, kind of map it out a bit m more clearly in my mind. There's reference in the report to, to a challenge with a lack of dedicated resources uh, for this work. Is that, is that on our side and or the, the partner side? Um, it's, councillors, probably both. Um, so it, it's a piece of work that is jointly being prepared by a subcommittee of the joint use. And um, as you know, like it would probably be a, a part of the work that everybody's trying to do. So one of the ideas that we have been talking about as part of the joint use steering committee is hiring consultant services to help that advance that work a little bit more quickly, uh, recognizing that it might suffer from a lack of capacity at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I think something for us to think about too, as we think about, you know, where where we shift resources, where the high needs are. Um, maybe just the last one, and again, I recognizing that it's already complex, there's lots of people at the table. Um, what, are, what are some of the conversations they're thinking around, again, private school sites that become private education facilities that may still have a playground that, that a community is accessing? Have we, have we considered, Again, I know that that's a very complex question. Just wondering where that's at in terms of thinking. If that's a, this is, we'll, we'll talk about that in five years, in ten years, or is it something that can be woven in uh, as part of this conversation? So I, <clears throat> it, it is, it is definitely would layer in more complexity um, to the discussion, and I think right now, realizing the joint use agreement and reviewing that already is, is quite a task that focusing on that component is um, important and that we'll look to look for synergies and opportunities but it's not the the top order of of work great okay that makes a lot of sense thank you so much madam chair thank you councillor wright oh i think i'm actually second round as well as councillor tang i was oh. before lunch so oh okay yeah good point thank you for uh mentioning that. Councillor Tang, go ahead. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, for for your review to come back in Q1, uh, obviously you will be connecting in with all the school partners at the at the at the joint use table. Um, are you going to find a way to connect in and to make sure that the you know, the, the parents are involved or are you kind of leaving that with the school partners? I'm just wondering, like, how can we be a bit more proactive in, in being transparent with some of these processes? Um, Councillor Tang, we imagine that the review as it progresses um, as, along with the long-term strategy would have some public engagement involved. So we're currently working on what those plans would look like. Again, I think having some of those consulting services would, would support our ability to do that more efficiently as well. Okay, no, that's good. Uh, and then the other, I guess, you know, I for this whole conversation, I'm thinking a lot about, uh, you know, outcomes that, we, that, that people have talked about that like to see achieved. Uh, for example, one of them is you know pro provincial representation at the at this joint use table, and that that takes a particular set of actions to get there. 
Um, the other one I'm thinking too is this comment around reducing competition between say community leagues and school parents council, both of which might be fundraising for playgrounds on different lands, but really ultimately it could be one joint effort. How can the city play a facilitator role in that? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, uh, I think one parent mentioned the, the, the NRC is in the conversation, uh, but it's been very difficult to, to kind of sustain that collaboration with at the community level. i wondering if you can kind of shed some light on that too. I can start, Councillor, and then perhaps somebody else from the team can, can help out. When we think about bringing the province to the table, it wouldn't be just about Edmonton. As we know, they set the rules across the entire province. So it would be quite a project and would not just be Edmonton. And so in order to actually have some um, time efficiencies and to make some progress, um, bringing them to the table at this point may, may be a very long project then because it's provincial wide, it's not just about Edmonton. Can you comment on the competition piece? Um, yes. I, yeah, I, yes. I mean, I agree with you, it's not easy. Yeah, a absolutely, competition. So we, we recognize that um, the, the concerns that the speakers brought forward this morning, um, absolutely. And a lot of times it, it may not be purposeful competition, but it might be just how we're all structured in terms of land ownership and responsibilities and accountabilities. And so that is what this work hopefully will provide the opportunity that we can collaborate and be more, um, purposeful and how we and, and non-competitive so that we can drive to what the community needs really are and deliver that um, but right now there's some structural components that this work is looking at that will hopefully um, iron out those um, barriers to 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 collaborating yeah because everybody is accessing the cfep grant for example and um and then back to that transparency piece that if people kind of know what the direction of this work will be. Uh, maybe they don't have to necessarily fundraise so hard and do all those bottle drives and bake sales uh, when they know that perhaps there will be a community playground at, at some point through maybe another process. So I think that's why you know I I do want to drive home that point about uh, looping in those parents group who are you know doing the doing a hefty work in terms of. Um, that that fundraising piece and all they want at the end of the day is is proper play space for their kids um i nothing more for me i'm just ready to speak thank you Councilor. Councilor oh sorry I, I was if i could just add in that the intent of the community parks framework is exactly that is that we anticipate moving forward that the the you know, we would be transparent about where the priorities are through the budget process and that the city would take the lead on base level, but also on renewal to identify where those priorities are across the city, creating that ex um, equity and access. And that the fundraising would maybe be more appropriately directed to community led work instead of uh, playgrounds and other base level amenities. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering if Ms. Padbury is on the line. I had a question from before lunch about the taxes on private or charter school. Actually, I believe we got Kate who can answer that oh, question. Okay, Ms. Watt. Hi, Hi. Uh, councillors. Um, when it comes to taxing of education property, essentially all education property in the province is tax exempt. Uh, we don't get any kind of grant in lieu payment because it is owned by school boards, not by the uh, government itself. Uh, when, we, when we talk about surplus sites and vacant land sites, it gets a little bit more complex as things in taxation are often want to do. Essentially, it's a question of use first and then ownership as to whether or not they're taxable. But I would be comfortable saying that by and large, the vast majority of these properties are not taxable. Okay. Okay. I thank you very much for getting that information for me. I appreciate that. Um, and then I'm just wondering, the, the report references that, you know, this review and that's going to be done over the next two years. What happens in the meantime? In the meantime, I think we'd continue to be working together between all, all our JUA partners, but also more or less moving ahead with the JUA, like operating under the, the status quo. Okay. Uh, and with better communication. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, I had asked one of the speakers um, 
about maintenance of um, the one playground on the school land, the maintenance 200 meters away or something on, on city land. Um, what would, what's the cost to maintain those? Like, I'm not talking repairs or replacement, I'm just like, would it be a little more cost effective if while the city's looking at theirs, they could go take a look at the one on school property? For the ones that the school boards inspect and maintain, we've assisted them in letting them know our approach, but we haven't directly gone to those sites. Uh, there's quite a bit, it would double our cost, well maybe more than double our cost, but on average for a playground, I think of that size that we saw, it's about three to five thousand dollars a year for inspections and maintenance okay thank you very much um and then i'm also wondering as we look to um redevelopment of mature neighborhoods i know some of the the developers in the newer areas are putting playgrounds in as part of their development is there any requirement or has that been considered at all for maybe larger infill infill developments that it, that it be a requirement that they put in playgrounds So we, we do at times, but it's not a um, tool that gets used, uh, employed a lot. Um, the community amenity uh, contribution component, where a, a large development would have uh, an amenity contribution, but those are more um, very localized to that particular development that may benefit the community, but so I, I don't know if we've got an example where we have used that tool to um, acquire a playground for, for the neighborhood from a large development. As we transition um, through city plan to more infill development over the coming decades, um, and where that becomes a very substantial amount of development, that tool might be applicable and more useful, but right now it's rather sporadic, and I don't know if there's enough redevelopment in, in terms of scale to make a meaningful contribution. But it is something that could be explored. Okay, so right now there's, there is no requirement, it's just an option that they could voluntarily? Uh, not necessarily yeah. voluntarily within redevelopment. Through the development permit process, a condition could be considered, uh, but it hasn't been considered um, very, very much um, in the past. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Race? Uh, just a quick uh, process question to City Kirk. Uh, the motion on the floor just for received information and then it's my understanding there is a subsequent motions coming do we need to vote the motion on the floor first yeah you can just so, vote on the motion on the floor and then go for, to, for any subsequent and then from that from that perspective for the implementation because this is received information that means they're continue doing what they're doing right now and then the subsequent motion will change that implementation for this receive that information receive or not. For information. So which one will be uh, the priority? Yeah, receive for information just means that you received it for information. Yeah. It doesn't give direction e to admin or anything. It's just receive for information. But the direction and the next steps already uh, included and very clearly in the report. And so that is my confusion in for the next steps and then already including in the report, so this is what we're going to continue doing this review. And then subsequent motion pass and which direction they should take. This is my confusion. I need your guidance on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, but receive for information is just a placeholder motion. It, if you give contrary direction to what's written on the report, that's fine in a motion. In the motion, then in for the uh, direction or next steps actions in the reports received as information is different from the subsequent motion and which ones are going to do. I just want that clarification. And my, because my, my understanding, under you need, if we have something come up, we are not votes for the information. That's the regular process. My, my, my understanding is the admin has laid out their steps in the report and yep. what they're doing um, and they're just letting you the committee know and they put receive for information in the report so if you receive it for information that's what they're going to proceed with if they don't get any contradictory direction from the committee 
from sub subsequent motion. Yeah, exactly. So if subsequent has an additional direction, so they will do both. If you, yeah, yeah. Okay. But so you have to give just, direction Just to proceed your question, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I don't see anyone else on the board uh, for questions. Councillor Paquette, are you okay to read, for the record, could you please read in the motion? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that the March 20th, 2023 Urban Planning and Economy Report, UPE 01518, be received for information. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to the motion? Councillor Tang, go ahead. Great, yeah, thank you to everyone who came out to speak to a lot of the community members who has been kind of working on uh, this issue for a long time, to the joint use, you know, to the staff member who are on the joint use. Um, you know, the more I listen to this conversation, the more I, I know that this is a bit of a, you know, jurisdictional hot mess of it, but I'm, I'm glad to see that there are different threads of uh, pieces of work advancing. Um, you know, I, I feel a lot of the frustration, uh, from our speakers and, and I know there's other parents, uh, like them. Um, I guess, you know, I, maybe I just want to take this opportunity to talk about a bit of the, the outcomes, uh, and I want to hammer home that, um, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these communities are facing aging infrastructure that no one is stepping forward to replace because of lack of funds, because of whatever reason. And it is left to community members themselves to raise money, uh, spending thousands of volunteer hours, sometimes at the expense of, you know, a job prospect um, so that their kids can have those amenities. And when I think about this conversation, I think it's extremely complicated. I'm still, for a lot of it, I was trying to wrap my head around the, the various framework and the agreements we have in place. Um, but I agree, some of these have a bit longer term and uh, involve, it's, it's way more, um, I think, labor intensive. For example, getting the province to be at the table, which I think is fairly critical um, and it can't just be left to school boards or the city. I don't think the city can take on full responsibility for all playgrounds, but I do agree that um, the current default position and um, the default position cannot continue. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder about the advocacy that that has come up a lot. How do we work more effectively with our school colleagues um, and community members for that joint advocacy? Um, I know there's various subsequent being prepared and whatnot, um, but I think that joint effort is key. Um, and then this notion of the competition, I, I, I appreciate that there's work to reduce that competition. I think I just kind of want to want to hone in and stress those points that the people have talked about um, so that we can maximize the very lim limited resource that everybody is facing, maximize the land use and uh, recognize that these amenities do contribute to, you know, more accessible 50 um, minute communities in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, I, I guess I just want to end on, you know, I hope we have these tables, we have these governance structures, but I want to highlight the urgency um, and the hope that we can be more proactive um, uh, in, in getting to these outcomes. And I, I want to be able to support as much as possible. You know, ironically, I don't actually have a lot of these situations, but I hear about it all the time. And I feel for the parents who are doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the ground. Um, Thank you very much for you know preparing the ample uh, informational reports and memos on this topic. Uh, I hope we continue to, uh, I you know I think this conversation will be alive and strong, and I look forward to the next uh, checkpoint uh, in, in in Q1. Councillor Paquette to close. Yeah, uh, thanks to. Administration's hard work, it gets my okay. Um, folks in the community already pay. So let's remove those barriers and let the children play. Thank you, Chair Principe. Well said, please vote.
We're just missing one vote. I am a yay. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Great day. And that has carried. Councillor Knack, I'll pass it to you. I believe you have a subsequent. I'm, yeah, I just won't rhyme. Uh, this is not the time to rhyme. Um, I know I did that one. That was that was a, a fun little jab. Uh, so yes, there's there's two subsequent. I think I can make them together, even though one is a recommendation to council. Or is it you're okay with listing them both together, or do you want me to just make them separate? No. Can I just get clarification on the first one? It has school council. Can you just clarify? Yes, the parent council, school council. Parent council. Yeah, it, the, uh, some some trustees are trying to try, tell me to use school council more than parent council, so I'm just using the, that language. But school slash parent council, if that works. Yeah. So we we can do two uh, two part motion or one and two, and the second will go to council. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll I'll, do, I'll move them together. Uh, so. Uh, part, part one is that as part of the Q1 2024 update that administration work with the school board administrations, Alberta Education and Infrastructure and school councils, school slash parent councils to provide feedback on the joint use agreement. And number two, that committee recommend to council that the mayor on behalf of council advocate to the provincial government to host a joint meeting between the school boards, school councils and council and city council to discuss the joint use agreement and any improvements that can be made. And uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, I was just working on this with Councillor Tang, who is the original mover of the motion that generated this report. Um, uh, to, to one of the cautions that came up a little bit earlier, this isn't meant to be a, a replacement direction. It's meant to be a, a further direction, additional direction, uh, that just makes sure we're, we're bringing together, trying to bring together all the right folks as we're working on that uh, body of work. So the first part of the motion would, would very much be uh, just included in that update that is already planned and uh, this would be one additional piece of information we could have on that as to how uh, those groups uh, feel about the uh, the work that's being done and any suggestions or uh, things that they'd want to add. The second piece uh, is a recommendation to council because the mayor can't advocate unless all of council says it so we have to send it to council and uh, hearing what I've heard today related to the province playing a pretty important role on this and yet maybe not being at the table in the way we would like, um, if the mayor were to ask for that uh, meeting to occur, the provincial government could still choose not to do that, but it's uh, maybe a little more meaningful coming from the mayor, uh, hearing that some of the parents have unfortunately requested meetings and, and not uh, been granted them. This might give a little more oomph to that uh, very technical term oomph and uh, just see if we can bring everyone together to chat about the work that's happening we can all share what we've been hearing from the communities we represent uh, I know the trustees have heard from from parents and community groups around joint use as well and just making sure we can provide all of that information uh, formally to administration if a, if the provincial government will choose to host a meeting we can't require them to but this would at least get the ball rolling uh, so that's it Thank you. Any questions uh, from committee members? Councillor Rutherford, we'll go to you. Yeah, just a question to the mover. Uh, for the point two, I know I, I had mentioned to you uh, about the possibility of doing a resolution for Alberta municipalities. Would that, do you see any conflict there? Again, you're more familiar with Alberta municipalities. Uh, no, no, I don't think there'd be any conflict in that. That could be a separate body of work. Uh, uh, so no, it, it would be very much in order to, to look at that as well. Okay, that was my question. And then to the, the first point, I guess, to administration, you know, recognizing the urgency of this work and how we're already, you know, over the, the time when we would renegotiate, what does this do to that timing? Does this affect that timing in any way? 
Uh, Councillor, thank you for that question. So <clears throat> for the, the first point, um, I'm not entirely sure it, but it, it does on first blush look like it may expand the scope of the work. And anytime we talk about scope expansion, probably time expansion and resource expansion follows. Um, because we are working with the school board administrations, but um, how we then incorporate feedback from Alberta Education and Infrastructure and the parent school councils would be um, something that we're not currently on our um, terms of reference. Yeah, I guess so to the mover, you know, hearing that, what are your thoughts? I think I would want that information when an agreement comes back to us next year. And so if I didn't have that, I would probably ask for it. And I'd rather um, ask for that early on versus waiting for it at the time, because I, I think there is still a bit of a, and again, I think the work that they're doing is, is great, but I'm, I'm feel we don't have everyone at the table that needs to be to help inform that yeah. work. Okay, so what would the, I guess, to your understanding as administration, let's say uh, one of these groups, the Alberta Education and Infrastructure, we invite them, they don't come, will that stall the work? Or would you just come back in Q1 and say, we, we didn't get them to the table? Um, Councillor, we would want to keep momentum because we think that regardless of having everyone at the table, there is still some strides and, and steps that can be made. So I think it would be the latter of how you stated that we would come back and say, we tried to engage this group and um, there was an interest or we didn't get quite what we were hoping for. And school councils is quite significant. That's, that's a significant body of work. Uh, yes, I, I'm not entirely sure at this point how we would accomplish that work. We would have to put some thought to it. What, I guess to the mover, what are you hoping to gain in terms of information from the school councils specific to the joint use agreement? Because I, I hear a lot, I heard a lot, and the reason I didn't have a lot of questions on this item was because I hear a lot about that, like park, the park infrastructure planning and that that piece but this is specific to like the the joint use so what are you looking what information would you hope to see from the school councils and is the the scope of this change justify that that information in your opinion sure good question uh so i think the the information i'd be interested in and again we've th there is some overlap between even from some of the speakers we heard today and the work that's underway and I don't think it has to be very extensive. So truly in my mind, it would be more of a, hey, we'd, if you have any feedback, it can be sent a, a mass message to every school council to say, if you're interested, if you have any feedback from what, uh, from what your personal experiences have been, please send that over. And if folks don't have any or they don't have to be part of it, I don't see that uh, requiring a, um, you know, a separate meeting or anything like that. But just to make sure we've heard from folks who are are doing that work and have had some firsthand experiences. Uh, yeah. 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 I just think about in my experience and work in public engagement, the more complex the issue, the more, if you want valuable feedback, the more you have to bring people along. And I feel like the joint use agreements are pretty nuanced and complex thoughts on that. To the mover. <laughs> uh, yes, they, they are uh, complex. And, and so, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's tough to get feedback, but at the same point, um, I know not just our speakers today, but I've been hearing from other folks over the years about this agreement and wanting to just make sure they can be a bit more involved in that. So uh, I think there's a way to do it constructively, but I appreciate that uh, you flagged a good caution on that too. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you. To the mover, um, could, could the feedback from the school councils um, not roll up to the school boards? Like, could, be, could the school boards be the ones responsible for obtaining that? Sure. So do we need to have them in there? As long as they're involved, yeah, I think, I think uh, the, the point is, is just, you know, there are a lot of parents who haven't felt like they, they've been sort of taken through this process and haven't been able to be engaged as well as they would like. And so whatever way that looks like, 
I'm, I'm open to it. Okay. And then the other thing that I was concerned with um, is the timing of the, um, the, the, the letter or the request by the mayor um, with it being so close to the election. Could we perhaps delay it? Um, maybe, maybe have this added into our Ask About Edmonton questions that uh, people could ask their candidates at the doorstep what they're going to do about playgrounds? Yeah, in terms of the second point, yeah, we, since, yeah, I don't specify time if for that very reason. I don't think you would send that letter until after the election and a new minister is chosen. So I, I'd, I'd leave that to the mayor's office to, to send that at the appropriate time. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I like this motion because uh, if we don't do this, the question will inevitably arise, why didn't you talk to us? And, uh, but I do have one question about the, um, Sarah. I would imagine there isn't a budget implication, but there probably is a cost implication to this. Is that question to the mover or to administration? Well, I'm pretty sure the mover wouldn't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> administration. Uh, Councillor Briquette, uh, we believe that if there is extensive engagement, there, there would be a budget implication to that, absolutely. Um, so aren't, we are not able to quantify that at this point, but would anticipate that, yes, there would be budget implications. Okay, and so I guess the, the follow-up question would be, um, is, since the joint use agreement is essentially a legal agreement, uh, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, what sort of meaningful feedback would we get on a legal agreement? And so what I would wonder is if there are some more, um, I guess, creative ways of uh, engaging in that uh, consultation with folks and conversations with folks um, that don't require as much of or don't have to be the same as the normal way in which we do engagement. And therefore, cut the costs just to get you know the feedback. If that makes sense, it makes sense to me. I may have delivered that just horribly. Uh, so I think just for for my clarity, our clarity, um, suggesting that when I use the term extensive engagement, that wasn't the intent. It was something a little bit lighter and a little bit more unique that allows for the opportunity for those folks that would have um, some input they'd like to share, gives them space to, but um, it's not a, a standardized full-scale engagement program. Is that correct? Yeah, that makes sense. I, I wouldn't imagine that this needs like a, a massive engagement process, more of a, here's the thinking. Do you have any uh, additional thoughts on that? Uh, we're just flagging it for you. And then we just go away with that. Um, my assumption is that most folks will say, yeah, it looks good. Um, and then uh, with the um, uh, intergov part, like that would be pretty simple just to have, a, you know, maybe one or two meetings, it seems to me. It's, and that's to the mover. Does that square with what you're sort of thinking? Yeah, not short answer, not looking for the extensive engagement example. The other one where the you know, school boards can be engaged and if they want to participate, great. If they want to share their thoughts, great. But we're not forcing them. We're not hosting a, you know, 20 meetings or anything like that. So it's, it's very much meant as the, the low barrier version of engagement on that. That doesn't have to add to cost or timeline. And mostly this is just an opportunity for people to give their feedback. If they have anything creative or interesting to add or a flag, that's when we can pick up on it. So that's sort of the idea. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So uh, the question to, to both mover and administration, um, I know uh, Councillor Nock, and then you probably even heard more uh, than, than me. So I heard the pre-grant, um, the concerns, issues, and how we do this better to meet community needs and since 2021. Um, so then my question is, our time and energy right now should we focus on for further public engagement with the issues is already up, so obvious. And it, based on the speakers we heard today and also 
outside today and we heard in the community, in the schools, and talk to the parents already. And then our focus, I just try to think a loud, little bit louder, is more about administration already doing those type of public engagement, get the feedback, and the more focus on use the feedback they already have, and from past to now, to focus on find the a few options bring back to us to debate, say which option is better, which option could be more effective to meet the community needs. So that is my first question. Why is this? Yeah, I think um, again, ultimately, this is not meant to um, to restart or or transform the existing body of work. It's very much meant just to involve, ensure everyone has a proper voice. Uh, I think some of the concerns that I heard, not just from the speakers today, but, but uh, over the course of a, a while, is that some of the parent councils and school yeah. councils don't feel like they've been able to meaningfully be involved uh, because they've been sort of pushed around. The school board's not able to help. The, you know, they haven't had meetings with the province. And it's not ultimately up to the city to solve all their problems either, but, but as long as we can maybe be a convening voice and give them that chance to, to share a little bit. So, so is that chance is already existed? and through the, this review process already started. So I, I think Councillor Rice, um, so you're asking, is there a chance yeah. of success with oh, this the, engagement? The chance is already existed, oh, right oh. now. And because I'm a little bit concerned about if we are keep doing public engagement with, with already the issue is obvious, the feedback is already there. And do we need that extra information? I heard my colleagues ask her earlier. Uh, do we need that extra data or extra information to prove, yes, this review needs to, to do this, this, instead use already feedback, already existed, and then to go back and to do analysis and bring a few options come back, how we can make this joint use agreement even like better and broader to meet every every part of the needs. So that is my question. Okay, um, I believe we do have a, a good understanding of the issues, and I think all the partners do. Um, and as well that, so that we do have a good understanding. And we have engaged okay. quite deliberately with the, the community and yeah. community leagues when we talked about the community park framework and that refresh. And yeah. so we do have a very good understanding. Okay. But there hasn't been, um, to, to the motion on the table, there hasn't been purposeful engagement around the joint use agreement. So if we want to isolate that in terms of finding out what Edmontonians mm -hmm. feel about that particular legal agreement and mechanism, that hasn't been done, but we do okay. have a good understanding okay. of the issues in front of us. Okay, so that's answering my question. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, no more questions to administration or the mover? Does anyone, is, would anyone like to speak to the subsequent motions? If so, I just ask you to keep your remarks brief. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I feel compelled to speak because I actually am very cautious or concerned about point one. I understand the intent of the mover here. And as always, you know, I think that getting voices is essential, but it's also about getting people to have their voices heard on things that they're most interested and affected by. And to me, what I heard from the public speakers and from folks is it's really more around that parks framework as opposed to the joint use agreement, which is a legal document. And I really worry about engagement on a legal document. I think the reason I worry is not so much for the value, but sometimes this idea of broad versus narrow engagement or you know, do do the engagement within the uh, the scope that you have, but at the end of the day, engagement is about what knowledge do community members have to help in the decision making process, and I do not feel like I got a direct answer on how any specific feedback, specifically from school councils, 
towards the joint use agreement would change that. So it, I also heard very loud and clear how tired they are, how much work they have to do in so many other fronts. And so I wanna make sure that when we do engage them, it's around things that will really make a difference. And that to me is that park framework. Um, so not against the idea of more engagement, I just think making sure it's the right engagement at the right time to respect everybody's time and expertise uh, in the best way possible. So I, I felt compelled to speak. I, I mean, obviously number two, have no issues with, I think it's great. I think that it's highlighted this conversation, the need for advocacy on, on multiple fronts and not just an Edmonton problem, but I think really there is a space within Alberta municipalities to do more of a provincial advocacy on this. But I, I do worry about, you know, even for example, the, the vagueness of school board administrations. Are you gonna go to the charter school administrations too then? Like at what point, you know, do, is this clear enough? So um, I'll leave it there. I, not on committee, but I wanted to voice some of my apprehensions around point one, uh, understanding the intent absolutely of the, the mover and appreciate that intention. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, yeah, thank you very much for 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 this uh, subsequent motions put forward by Councillor Knack, um, and I appreciate a lot of the concerns raised by my colleague Councillor Rutherford. Um, you know, I I guess for me, I think the takeaway here is some direct connection and engagement with uh, parents groups, um, whether it's you know on uh, on the parks framework or perhaps the gaps that people have consistently experienced through the joint use and perhaps not on the specific the legal aspect, but I think there are gaps and I think people do wanna weigh in on it. Not to mention from what I've seen uh, with this particular community, regardless of the school, there is a, some very strong cohesive, um, uh, you know, pos positions and, and voices that does not necessarily need to increase the scope creep um, as as we might fear it might. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to kind of add that piece in that I'm hearing also resoundingly from the community that the parents will like to be involved in, in, in the conversation specifically about playgrounds and you know which tool to get there is um, which tool to get there uh, you know is I think is part of the conversation whether it's the, the agreement or the framework. Uh, but I think people need to be directly connected in um, to this. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Knack to close. No, I, I thanks to Councillor Tang. I'll just echo hers. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item 7.3 now. Okay, wonderful. Councillor Knack, you had selected this item. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I don't have any questions, actually. I, I'm selecting this one on behalf of Councillor Jans, who I think was the original mover of the motion that generated this report. And uh, he had put together a draft motion that I, I would be happy to make on his behalf. And then we can discuss it here, and if we need to, if, if it's preferred, we can requisition it to council, but I figure we have time at committee. So um, you, you have that wording, Madam Clerk? That's, 
Do it, no, you don't have that wording? Let's, uh, then uh, I'll let, if others have questions, I'll let them click on while I find the wording and email it to you right now. As administration, we did have some opening remarks, if that's helpful. Please go ahead, yes. The report in front of you today is an information report and is in response to the motion to identify options and tools available to the City of Edmonton to support residential tenants and mobile homeowners beyond existing provincial requirements and standards and available tenant services. The legislation providing services and support for tenants and mobile home owners is overseen by the Government of Alberta as it has jurisdiction over landlord and tenancy rights through the Residential Tenancy Act and the Mobile Home Sites Tenancies Act with long-term rentals also under provincial jurisdiction. The Government of Alberta provides support to landlords and tenants when it comes to responsibilities of each party, security deposit information, rent increases and referrals for additional support. The landlord of a property is responsible for keeping the rental premise reasonably safe and in good repair through the duration of the rental experience. Standards for safety and comfort are set out in the Public Health Act and housing regulations and are enforced through the Residential Tenancy Dispute Resolution Service managed through Service Alberta with a GOA. Concerns around safety. Sorry, I scrolled. Concerns around safety and upkeep can be raised with Service Alberta through its Consumer Contact Center. The City of Edmonton manages complaints related, by, related to bylaw violations. My computer is rebelling against me. My apologies. Maybe this is a sign I should stop talking. Oh my Lord. Sorry. The City of Edmonton manages complaints related to bylaw violations, fire codes, and safety codes, and Alberta Health Services manages minor health concerns. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and my apologies. No, thank you very much. Now we'll head over, Councillor Knack, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. Uh, I'll have a question about the motion that I'll make on Councillor Jansen's behalf, but if you're okay, I'll just make the motion now, Please and then do so. folks yes. can ask about it. So uh, it looks to be a four part uh, related to each of the four options. Uh, so. Again, I think I can move them as all four parts, and if we need to split, we can. Sure. Okay. Um, so it's all f it's four options. Are you moving them all as one? Yes, because they're all tied to the same piece. So if that's fine, uh, I might as well. I think for simplicity, I'll yeah. move them all, and okay. we can, if anyone needs to divide one of the four options or multiple of the options, they could. Uh, so I'll read it out. Uh, so uh, let's see, option, so uh, here we go. Number one, that the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the Mayor on behalf of City Council write a letter to the Government of Alberta requesting an exploration of additional supports for mobile home tenants via amendments to the Residential Tenancies Act. Number two, that administration bring forward a service package for consideration as part of the 2023 fall supplementary, supplementary operating budget adjustment outlining the resources needed to enhance the existing business license review processes to cancel, suspend, or impose conditions on licenses issued to landlords where unsafe conditions are identified during investigations. Number three, that administration bring forward a service package for consideration as part of the 2023 fall supplementary operating budget adjustment outlining the resources needed to create and maintain a landlord registry that provides information to prospective tenants on issues with specific properties related to health and safety. And number four, that administration provide a report that uh, point one analyzes the, and outline, uh, outlines potential business license regulations and conditions that can be applied to short-term and long-term accommodation rental business licenses, outlining opportunities for tenants to access safety-related information before and during the rental time frame, and bring forward a service package for consideration as part of the 2024 spring supplemental bud operating budget adjustment, outlining the resources needed to implement parts one and two of that fourth point. Uh, so that's the motion. I do have questions, and I, if I, I can just use the remainder of my time. If Please go ahead. Sure. Yes. Um, so the only one I have questions on is actually option four. I'm comfortable with the first or the, the point related to option four, because in the report you did talk about a jurisdictional um, concern and how that might interact with the province, and so. What I'm not seeing as written in this point four is uh, is any type of analysis of how that 
might <laughs> make, a, make things complicated for you. So if, if you were to do that body of work, would that be part of your report back essentially on that specific point around here's, here's what we meant when we were talking about the jurisdictional issues? Because I, I have a lot of concerns on that, but I also would probably be comfortable with you digging into that and giving us more detail. Yes. And this is fraught, right? This is yeah. um, sticky business and it's tricky when everyone's trying to do the best thing with the best of intentions um, amidst a landscape of different roles and lanes that different orders of government find themselves in. Yeah, and, and, and so I guess the question, and you know, I, I, I wanna respect my colleagues wishes there and, and maybe a, a requisition if need be, but like if you did the work for option four, as identified in the motion is, do you see a scenario where it's not gonna be anything other than incredibly complicated? <laughs> I, I guess I'm just trying to, you know, I'd, I'd hate to send you to do that work if only that you're gonna come back and pretty much say, we really don't encourage you going down this path. It would be very complicated. Okay, okay. Um, that's helpful, uh, that's, that's good feedback. And um, perfect. So I think those are all my questions. What I might do uh, to our chair is that oddly, I might make the request for division of the, uh, and I'll probably only ask to have the point four divided and maybe in, in respect of my colleague who asked me to make this motion, I could requisition that particular part up to council. So if I could split the motion into one, two, and three, and then four, and then when we get to four, I could requisition that up to council to allow them to at least have the opportunity for that, that vote. So I have no further questions on the report. It was fantastic, by the way, thank you. It was a lot of good detail, uh, and I'm comfortable with uh, the points one, two, and three. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also thought it was an excellent report. Uh, just a note, we actually can't make motions on behalf of other councillors, but uh, since this is materially exactly the same as the motion that uh, was gonna be made anyway, that's fine uh, by committee. Um, so I also am concerned about point four. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the challenges there? Because, uh, you know, the reason I ask is because if this gets requis requisitioned up to council, I'd rather have the conversation now than reopen it back up at council. Um, thank you for the question. So we actually have reviewed this option a number of times and brought forward different reports on it. And in those reports, as well as within this report, we discuss how our business license bylaw is actually a permissive bylaw. And we um, really only look to impose conditions where we feel that it might fit within our municipal purpose and jurisdiction. And here, because of the intersection with the province and the problem statement of trying to support tenants largely in the realm of the provincial jurisdiction, we may find ourselves not having much opportunity to regulate within the bylaw. And so that's kind of some of the challenges that we're faced with, is really finding where we may have a role here, and then how we fit that regulation within a permissive bylaw. Does that help? Yeah, so essentially, we don't actually have any power there, is what I'm hearing. If we do, it will be limited, and we have to figure out where our power may rest. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so to echo you, we have very limited power there. We'd have to figure it out, and that limited power, in the context of the provincial power, uh, may not actually be effective in doing much at all, except maybe raising some issues or um, partially addressing something with very low expectation of uh, a functional outcome. Is that, do I have that right? We also have Christina from law available too, if that is helpful um, perspective to offer. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Is 
It's very oh, rare I'm that so you're not sorry. hearing what a lawyer has to say. <laughs> uh, my mic was off. I apologize for that. Um, no, you're exactly correct. Um, we have very limited ability in this area. Um, when we are adding conditions to the bylaw, we need to look at the bylaw powers we have for every single condition we might add. Um, and so I could possibly draft conditions, but as to whether or not they would actually create a difference um, based on the powers and authorities we have is really the question. And I, I don't really foresee many that will actually have an actionable difference in this area. Yeah, so that's my concern that we're going to spend a lot of time debating this when there's really not much that we can do uh, in that in that area. So I'm wondering uh, to the mover or to the chair, um, rather than just separating it out, do we want to just get rid of it? Um, because we'll debate whether or not to include it for a long time, but ultimately, even if it passes, it's not going to be an effective uh, direction. Yeah, and appreciate your point that technically I can't move motions on behalf of people, um, but uh, wanted to just give credit where credit is due. I did not write the motion. Um, I I think it would be wise for us to have the discussion here, but knowing that there is a desire amongst the original mover of the motion who generated this report to to discuss this, I think at a minimum it would only be fair to requisition the report to council to allow for a vote, even if... Uh, even if the decision of council is a no. I, I would prefer to do that, and which is why I would want to at least keep that instead of pulling the motion. Right. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, might as well take the time. All right. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciated the report. I thought it was excellent. And I just want to dig into uh, option two a little bit further because um, I, I was actually a bit confused about some of the, well, I, actually, I think I understand. I understood in the past that a challenge was that when we remove a business license uh, for a rental property, we have to go site by site. So even if it's a problematic landlord who owns many, many properties, we're stuck sort of getting rid of their business license site by site. Um, it's suggested here, though, that if you are a landlord that owns multiple sort of single unit properties across the city, you have one sort of meta business license. Am I understanding that correctly? There is one business license. It's kind of that way, but then there are sub licenses within it is how it goes forward. So are there, are there changes that we could make to our processes to, um, and, and sorry, and so those, those sub licenses, is that consistent for, so like, not because I think there are problems, but like if we took a, a really large uh, rental provider who let's say has thousands of units all on different sites, uh, let's say multiple towers, they would have a, a, an overall business license and then a specific sub license on each property. I think I have to get back to you on that one. I apologize. Okay. No, no, that's okay. I mean, I, I think I think all that to say, so maybe my line of questioning would just be in option two, are there ways that we could explore our ability to look at, um, again, having some powers with our business license? So again, not going into I, what I'm hearing is sort of the, the muddiness and, and the challenges of option four. But again, if we are looking at, at business license reviews, can that be for a global portfolio rather than site by site? Just to address, again, some of those problematic landlords who may own multiple properties and just avoid the, the challenges of going property by property by property. I think that's something we could bring back in the report. I think that's the kind of uh, creativity that we would want to exercise to Great. best meet the problem. Great, excellent, yeah. Um, and, and, the one, the one piece in option four, though, is I think speaking to the substantial fines that could be increased. So again, is looking at that fine amount something that could be incorporated into option two if we were not to proceed with option four, for example? Because um, again, I think, I, think, I think business licensing is a really strong tool and I think we could be using it more with, again, out getting into the jurisdictional issues. But just wondering uh, right now, 
you know, I think it's sort of mentioned under option four that, that uh, the fines are around 500. Um, so the landlord found without a valid business license, the, fi the fine is 500. Whereas could we look at increasing that as part of option two? Um, so again, if, if a landlord was to have their business license revoked and they were still renting out properties, can that fine be more significant as a deterrent? Not an answer now, but yeah, again, maybe something to consider with the work. Yeah, C Councillor. Right now, within the bylaws, we're able to do escalating fines. We also have mandatory court. So mm -hmm. when we do come across a pro problem property and, and it's repeated offenses and, and that, we have the ability to go to mandatory court. And then when we're at court, we ask for an uh, increase in the fines. So, so the structure is there already within our bylaws. I don't think we necessarily need to have increased the fines per se uh, for these types of offenses. Okay, okay, great. That's, that's excellent to hear. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I, yeah, I think the secondary suite registry is a good, good example to build off of. I, I take your point in option three, just in terms of some of the privacy issues. So that could potentially be, um, we would only be sort of putting problematic landlords on there, is that correct? Rather than sort of every rental unit in the city? I think that's something we'd have to investigate. There are not a lot out there in our, in our jurisdictional scan, but what we would do is bring forward best practices and make sure that whatever we build um, is on the right side of privacy and, uh, again, tries to solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to something like, um, I think Better Business Bureau or things like that, right? I think you can sort of, uh, it's not just like a, yeah, anyway, you can sort of proactively search who's, who's on that registry um, and maybe a similar approach there. Great. Yeah, no further questions. I think this is really exciting. It's wonderful to look at all the tools we have in our toolbox to help uh, create safer and, and healthier housing for people. So thank you. Sorry, I'm speaking to it a bit, but I'll pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright? Hi, thank you. Um, just so for my own education, I guess, the, um, the business by license bylaw wouldn't impact those under like currently that have that business license, it would be when it comes up for renewal then, right? Um, I think what we are suggesting is that if we identified that there was a problematic rental property, it could be put under a business license review, which is a formal process. And we would review and we could impose conditions on that business and or revoke the bylaw. We wouldn't necessarily be reviewing every rental operator at the time of renewal. Um, if we went with the review process. Okay, but if, if, if there was like a registry, would you, would you at least at, at renewal look at maybe ones that have had problems? Like would that be, that wouldn't be too work intensive, would it? I think we have to take that one and explore it if we advance the registry, because um, we do have to operate within privacy, but also we'll have to think about where we can be. I think there's some legal considerations that we'd have to look at it, but if we, I think w there would be an intent if we have a registry and we're looking at the review process that somehow we marry the two. Okay, because what's the sense of having some of that information, I guess, if we can't make use of it, right? Correct. I don't know if Christina has anything to add. Sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, there are privacy implications. Um, I do know that the report specifically names uh, potentially landlords who have come, um, who have actually contravened the bylaw and gone to court and have been found guilty. Um, in those cases, like those types of contraventions may be more public, uh, which means that it would provide us with a different opportunity to publish that kind of information. Whereas if they aren't found guilty in court, we may have less of an ability um, to kind of state what has happened because it hasn't been proven. Uh, so those are the kind of the privacy implications that we're talking about here is, has it been proven in court? Can we state it then publicly? If it hasn't been proven in court, we are gonna be, wanna be a lot more careful about what we say and how we say it, okay. um, just to ensure. Okay, thank you very much. And to complete all four um, of the motions here, do you have the financial resources within the department? No. No. <laughs> So that's something else that will need to be considered. And you don't have those cost figures available to you right now, do you? No, we brought this forward for information okay. and the motions then will, if they pass, we will then do some work and come back and, and advise. Generate that, okay. And I just, 
I do have to comment. I'm, I'm also looking, because I do have a mobile home park in my ward, I'm, I'm looking at it from the mobile homeowner's um, perspective here. Um, the, the free, or yeah, the free tenant education sessions, I'm so glad to see that coming out. Are, are they going to deal specifically with mobile home park owners or just um, tenancy in general? Well, I know this series is going to be launched this spring, and we want to provide what folks need. And so I think it will be a uh, continuous improvement. I don't have the, um, the, the curriculum in front of me, um, but we can certainly get that information to you through memo. Oh, okay, because I, I think a lot of um, the complaints in that that I've, that I've received do relate to that, that rental agreement with the landlord where you know, people are feeling that they, they pay the property taxes. Why aren't they getting the same services? But it's actually the landlord that's paying... Uh, the taxes and providing the services in most cases. Okay, so that'd be great to see. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Chair Principi. I do have com some concerns for the, for all op options, uh, but I I'm not sure my concerns is only based on my limited understanding, or or I missed some information here. I I, I want to get clarify um for you since. Uh, the first one, and then recently city council, we just voted to get rid of the residential subclass. That's an additional 15% tax on landlords of four more unions and puts into into other homeowners. So can you tell me is there any way could justify creating more expenses for homeowners at this time if we implement this type of sense? I think my response would be, that in this scenario, it's yeah. a business. It's not necessarily yeah. a homeowner. Uh, it's only related to the business property. It's not related to the homeowner to rent to their property to others. I, I, I think, so yeah, I, I see. We've set a, um, We've set a, a level of where we've identified that you've gone into becoming a business, where we identify where you need a business license. And so based off of that, even though you may be a homeowner and you may be renting out properties, yeah. um, at that point, we've identified that you are a business and you're gaining income from your assets. And so there may be additional taxes, and I'll pass it over to speak to that, but we already require the license, so this isn't in addition, we're just stating how we would treat it if you were operating a poor business um, and how you might be fined from there. Um, hello, Councillor. There, there is nothing that I'm seeing here that would cause a property to move from one property class to another, mm. notwithstanding the fact that we are now on a track to remove that other residential property class. Okay, so um, then, the follow-up question would be, um, could this additional business license by law actions be seen as an imposition on provincial jurisdiction? The intergovernmental jurisdiction landscape is always complex. The province does hold primary responsibility in this space. Okay. So that means we don't have any cons constitutional constitutional concerns regarding this matter. Not when it comes to the resident and landlord tenancy relationship. Okay. Uh, then under under option three, uh, op option it mentions that the last of proper landlords and could supplement information from the city of Idemon's open data initiative. So what information pertaining to landlords is current available opening? Yeah, Councillor, I don't believe that we have a list at all. 
okay. um, for, for those types of concerns. So uh, at least not within the city of Edmonton that I'm so aware currently, of. So currently, we don't. Currently, Okay, right. uh, thank you for that. And also the last question. Uh, to your knowledge right now at this point, uh, has anyone from the public created the seminar database and for the landlord? I, I would say there are informal and back channels for some tenants and landlords that have created that we've heard of, but an official um, process or list or things like that, we're not aware of. Uh, so does, is that fair to say if the landlord, landlord registry and this bylaw uh, passed or I just use that word and maybe it's not by law yet. So we just to try to figure out. And does that mean we breach some privacy bylaws or not? And if to create that list of landlords and the, based on registration. The work that we would do if yeah. this, if we were directed, would be to look carefully at what is already happening. So for example, Montreal, Halifax, Toronto, and Vancouver have just weighed into this space. And uh, we are watching carefully to see um, <laughs> what actions might be taken as a result. So we would look to, to those best practices uh, and would be you know, consulting with legal to ensure that we were staying on the right side of the law and anything that we would put publicly there. Okay, I have more questions. Come back, Mr. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, very, very interesting report. Um, maybe some, uh, just to follow up on that thread on the option three, I guess my reaction was just around, you know, what are, what might be some unintended consequence with pursuing a public online landlord registry. Uh, I mean, this brought me back to uh, some of the recent um, media reporting about the informal uh, renter registry that effectively allowed landlords to blacklist some renters and creating further inequity and discrimination. And I'm just like, would something like this on the landlord side actually make them double down and retaliate against renters? So I wonder if you can just maybe speak to a bit of those unintended consequences. Well, in looking what the other jurisdictions are doing, the landlord associations in those various jurisdictions have opposed and, and have provided their concerns. So I think it wouldn't be a stretch to imagine that there would be some, con some concerns from those associations uh, if we were to pursue a public registry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering just on the data end, uh, for example, with you know the business license breaches, for example, or the infractions, um, how frequently do we see this happening, say, in 2022? Do we have kind of data on that? Are, are you asking how many business license bylaw reviews we undertake each year? Yeah, yes. So currently we don't undertake business license bylaw reviews relating to these rental properties. It's not the area that we've delved into, um, but I would, I wanna say maybe about a dozen I'm thinking okay. are forwarded our way um, each year. Okay. Okay, good. That's, uh, and then, I mean, I'm assuming not all of them transpire into uh, actual penalty or, you know, after the re review. I, so I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, what's the, the material impact of, of this? So, Currently, um, the reviews are brought forward by our enforcement agencies when they're um, looking at a business, and typically it does result in some okay. changes and conditions being imposed, and we do find that it helps improve compliance and improve um, operational sides. Okay. Obviously, okay. there's a large number of residential properties, so if we were starting to do this, there would be an impact to our resourcing. Yeah. Um, and I was also very pleased to read about the tenant support program. You know, I, for some reason, I had this perception that everything related to tenant support falls in the provincial, you know, tenancy board. Um, so I was pleased to read about that. Um, and I, I'm curious about the uptake on this program, let's say, in the last year. Do, do we have similar kind of data on, on that? If not, I can happy to follow offline. Yeah, we'd be happy to provide that information to you. It is a small yeah. group. They are uh, available to receive um, 
requests from the public, you know, Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4. Uh, right. and, and most of the work is, to, is, is navigation and wayfinding to um, help those folks uh, navigate the provincial system in order to uh, right. resolve their disputes. Right. Yeah. That. I mean, I think that's super valuable regardless. Um, and this this piece actually triggered something else for me um, because it reminded me of some of the ethnographic research done during the affordable housing needs assessment that was presented back in September. Um, and there were several stories in there around just people's inability to, to effectively advocate for themselves um, during eviction hearings. Um, and you know, I you know I recognize the tenant support program is really in place as part of our goal to end homelessness, and um, yeah, I you know I think it, it sounded like in some of those instances they weren't able to access this program and they were dispersed and lost their support and community. I guess I'm just wondering because um, I know we have the affordable housing strategy coming back. There's also the checkpoint of our strategy to end homelessness. Um, sorry, this is a bit of a maybe not different thread of line of thinking, but I'm wondering how do you reconcile um, kind of the work here and some of those bigger strategy work? Because I think it's all really relevant. Uh, and uh, but I'm just you know how are you seeing these pieces coming together, if at all? Well, I think you've really brought the thread together that we know that approximately one in four renters in Edmonton uh, do pay more than they can afford on housing. And so an eviction can be a life-changing experience that can lead to the homelessness that you were referencing. And so our tenant support services try to help tenants build capacity, um, be better informed about their rights and obligations with the hope to maintain that stable housing. So I think that is the connection. Yeah. Okay. No, great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to number three, um, just double checking, we've got the authority to do this, to create a registry? We can do whatever we want. I'm teasing. Legal? Yeah, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> I'm happy to weigh in on this. Um, really, the answer is it depends what we decide to do. Um, there are potentially certain options that maybe are have very low privacy risks. There are options that may have some privacy risks, but we decide it's still in line with the legislation and we decide to proceed. And there may be options that are just absolutely unworkable because of the high privacy risk involved. Um, so we'd have to take that back and look at what all of those potential options are under this privacy piece. Okay, so I'm just wondering if we're jumping the gun by asking for a, a service package, unless what you would do is analyze all that and then along with the pros and cons, I guess, and the challenges also attach a budget figure? That's exactly what we would do. So this is totally exploratory. Um, if directed, we will yeah. do the analysis and tell you how much it would cost in terms of time and resources to deliver such thing. We would get your, your direction to proceed or not, and then go from there. Okay, and what what happens if landlords just simply don't participate in this in a registry? Well, I would say that I, I don't think it's up to the landlord to participate or not. What will happen is, depending on how the program would roll out, their name would potentially be put onto a registry by the city based on complaints, uh, issues, those types okay. of things. I see what you're saying. Okay. All right, yeah. Okay. Um, and back to number four. I'm still a little troubled by this. Um, do we have exam? I'm wondering, and maybe I should put this to the mover. Would this be more appropriate as a question? I think, I don't know who brought this up. Maybe it was, uh, I don't remember, sorry. Would this be more appropriate as a question to Alberta municipalities? Because what we're talking about is something kind of new and it would be Edmonton doing it on their own. And we're talking about provincial laws and legislation and jurisdictions. So I'm wondering if this is better put to Alberta municipalities first. It's possible, I, it, uh, so maybe it could be better and good idea and a good suggestion and 
and what I would say is because I think this will get requisition to council, the, uh, the original intended mover would be able to spend some time listening to our discussion and then make adjustments based off our conversation here. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, do we need to add a point five, a jurisdictional scan? Because obviously we can't just do this in isolation. We should know what other municipalities are doing uh, in Alberta where these laws apply, but also see what, you know, we heard reference to other, other cities and things that they're trying. I'm wondering if we should include that in maybe a report back. Thoughts to administration. Yeah, a jurisdictional scan would inform any and all of parts two, three, and four, that would be baked into um, the work that we would do. Yeah, can we add that then? Um, is, is there any, any objection or do we need to vote on adding a point five with the jurisdictional scan information and we'll get the wording more properly uh, uh, phrased? Uh, I, think Madam Chair? That, I think that might be a friendly amendment uh, because administration was considering doing that anyways. My colleagues, a jurisdictional scan included. So, sorry, just to confirm that administration was planning to do that anyways? Okay, okay, yep. Oh, you were planning on doing that anyway? Uh, administration was planning on doing it anyway, but since they're planning on doing it anyway, I, I consider it a friendly amendment. Okay, then my question to administration is how deep were you going to go on that jurisdictional scan? How deep we were going to go? Yeah, how, what's the breadth and depth of this scan? Deep and wide. Um, so we would look to specifically um, Montreal, and uh, Vancouver, Halifax, and Toronto, since on the, on the registry side, they're already doing that. In terms of what other jurisdictions are doing to leverage their current business licensing, we would, I don't have that information in front of me, so we would, we would look across the country, um, always starting with Alberta, because they would be subject to the same provincial uh, laws and statutes, but then looking across the country. So I think that would be the scope of our, our, of our jurisdictional scan. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll work on that. I'll work on the writing. I'm out of time. It's just, I, I, it's not directed, so I'd prefer, it'd be more comfortable if it's in. So I'll work on that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rice? Uh, I would follow up Councillor Percat, the points about, for say, jurisdictionary uh, scanning. So I, I just want how much benefit or value will contribute uh, to the decision, uh, give the factor and each municipality, each city, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto is so different from our housing marketing. And how our housing marketing, I, it's, it's just based on my understanding, we are trying to target and keep our affordability piece here compared to other big cities. And then if we, uh, affordability is our priority here, what are you going to do that comparison? And I don't know how that comparison could be useful information. I think the landlord registry is focusing on landlord behavior. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, and also, I, I do have the uh, follow-up question on the... Um, my notes is here uh, on the, all the, those four options. On those four options, uh, I heard, yeah, the earlier, uh, my colleague's question about the, regarding the cost, regarding the capacity and the resources in-house to do this work. And then, then two questions. The first question, is this uh, right now really aligned with our priority and our city to do it, and it's a t right timing to do it. That is my first question. Yeah, I guess that that would be my question I would put to the governors here. Um, that is for you to assess if this is on the list of many things yes. that you determine to be of a priority. Then it's for us to action based on your direction. 
either any factors and uh, then could provide it to us and to see and how we determine this priority and then we have so many other priorities going on. Do we need like really in the supplement budget discussion and to make the change for the budget and with the competing priorities exist to do this type of work? So I that's my first question. And then the next question, if in case we have something in place, like you mentioned earlier, is regarding landlord's behaviors for the registry, try to do that behavior, we try to discipline some behaviors. And then what's the legal risk our city facing? Yeah, that's an excellent question that we would have to explore. So when I look at what Montreal is doing, for example, uh, their focus of of responsible landlord certification is the focus of their registry. So we would have to explore and work closely with legal and the privacy concerns to make sure that we are on side and, and not getting ourselves as a city in trouble. And then to me, uh, certification and the behaviors is two separate things. So it seems to me try, right now we're over, over rich, try to do combine and behaviors and certification. For the certification itself, from business, uh, Nansen's perspective, I think that's his objective. But uh, however, if we're doing something for the behaviors, and that is more subjective. So I, I've, I've seen the big risks there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the goal uh, would be to combat neglect and abuse. So I, the, 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 the purpose would be for landlords who are already acting responsibly, obtaining that certification would be easy in the Montreal example. In contrast, if you're a negligent landlord, uh, you might be required to improve your dwellings and perform preventative maintenance, as an example. Again, this is just illustrative uh, from what Montreal is exploring. Okay, thank, thank you for the answer. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack? Seeing no other questions, I'm ready to say the word. Requisition. I do have an answer for an earlier question that can uh, provide around tenant support services. We're getting around a thousand calls a month uh, being served by four staff members. Thank you. Uh, before I say, the, well, I, I will say the first word, but I see the other, uh, another counselor on the board. So before maybe somebody says it a second time, I can let him jump in. <laughs> counselor Paquette, go ahead. You're muted, Councillor Paquette. Oh, that was the smartest thing I ever said, too. Oh, well. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just because I think that we really need to hash this out here instead of in council, I'm just going to ask a, a bit more about number four. And uh, it's just, it's a lot, there's something about it that's just snagging on, on my brain here. Um, it's really tricky when we get into areas where we don't have jurisdiction and we can't actually enforce or take action. And I'm just wondering if you could, I think we've heard it very clearly, but let's just reiterate this point. As far as being effective, um, that's one of the things that we really focus on a lot when we draft bylaws and, uh, And usually we wouldn't draft bylaws where we essentially would not be effective because it kind of defeats the purpose, it undermines the process. So I'm just wondering if you could tell me what I'd be looking at as far as effectiveness on number four were to proceed. Christina, if I can pass it over to you, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah no worries. go I'll straight to the floor. Um, I think you've brought up a wonderful point, Councillor. We just rewrote the entire business licensing bylaw to remove red tape. Um, so anytime I'm looking at what we're adding, um, I'm very cautious about whether or not it's actually effective. And not only that, but anytime we look at um, passing new bylaws or passing new provisions, one of the pieces of the legal review is actually whether or not the provision I'm drafting will actually have the intended outcome to create the, the outcome we're hoping for. Um, so that's how I really kind of approach this question is, what are we intending to do? And I think in this case, we're intending to ensure that tenants have safety 
inside of their homes that they are renting from landlords. Um, and as a municipality, we have very, very limited ability to regulate in that area. We don't have officers that go into residences. That's not a very typical thing for us to do. Um, so I look at that and I say, I don't have many options for regulations to add where we would actually be able to enforce them um, or ensure that they are being followed. So in that sense, I, I do really struggle with coming up with actionable options uh, for deemed conditions for landlords. Um, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't any that don't exist um, or couldn't be dreamed up, but I, I do struggle with with coming up with options. Yeah, and so my con yeah, I, I will see, refrain from editorializing at this point. Um, that review comes back to tomorrow, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah, so we will have a chance to to sort of discuss that now. One of the things that I'm wondering about is that so the the landlord and tenant advisory board is under the jurisdiction of the province. We operate that for them at the city of Edmonton. Is that what we do with our landlord and tenant advisory? Like, I'm not sure what the what the jurisdiction is there. I know it's provincial, but I'm not sure what our participation is specifically besides money. I'm not sure who can answer that for me. Councillor Paquette, I'm very sorry. I didn't catch what your question was. Oh, it was to administration. Is my audio not working? No, um, I think they're looking into it right now. Your, your so, audio is working. Sorry, the previous landlord and tenant advisory board has been transitioned to that tenant support services that I was talking about, which is, has four um, yeah. FTEs and a thousand calls per month on average. And the work yeah. that they do is mm -hmm. to provide vulnerable residents who are seeking information and referrals and support about their residential tenancy issues. Yeah, I just recall one year we, we, we put up the money and wanted the promise to take it back and they wouldn't take it back. And this is one of my concerns that we keep encroaching on what is not our jurisdiction where we actually can't be effective. And then the question is, does that actually serve the public? When we start taking on what is provincial jurisdiction, but we can't actually deliver on provincial jurisdiction results. So, I guess that's an open-ended question that's pretty hard to answer. If you were seeking my best advice and bang for your buck and impact, I think that the conversations around um, advocacy to the province, um, if we as a municipality or as Alberta municipalities, as was suggested, um, an advocacy piece happen in tandem with the mayor and council sending a letter with some very specific wording around what we would like to see added to the act, um, having the, the combined voices of Alberta municipalities could also be effective. Um, and options two and three, I think, are worth exploring, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm out of time, but I, I, I will speak to this, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Knack, did you want to? So now I'll officially say requisition. <laughs> I oppose that, just for <laughs> So we just need two councillors to requisition. So I just need another councillor to say that on the record. All right, I do not see another requisition. So unfortunately the requisition has failed. Which means uh, now would we put the uh, inform to receive for information on the floor? There's a motion on the floor right now, so with four parts. So we right. have to deal okay. with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, could we separate each individual? Thank you.
we're just going to need a few minutes to split it. We're just splitting it for voting purposes, so the first part is on the board now. We're just going to open the vote. Thank you. Would, uh, for the record, should we read it in? That would be great, yes. Okay, Councillor Knack? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. Councillor Paquette wanted to speak to it. Would he do it at this point, or should we read it in first? We can read it in, and then he can speak to this first part, and then we can vote, and then we can go on with the rest. Okay, I think what I would uh, suggest is that when we're speaking to it, maybe if we could try to speak to all of yeah, them yeah, yeah. and then uh, vote individually. Thank you. So just reading in the first part, uh, number one, that Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the Mayor on behalf of City Council write a letter to the Government of Alberta requesting an exploration of additional supports for mobile home tenants via amendments to the Residential Tenancies Act. And to speak to it, uh, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and as an omnibus, um, I really like uh, this motion um, and the, the part two and part three that we're going to be seeing uh, because we get a jurisdictional scan, which uh, um, I will make a specific uh, motion for as a subsequent, I guess, in council if, I, if it's not ready now, uh, which is fine. Um, and uh, I just, I, 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 again, hearing from legal, knowing the history of the other uh, areas where we've tried to move into what is provincial jurisdiction and how tricky that is and how it actually doesn't get us to the results that we're seeking um, means that we expend money, we expend resources, we expend effort, and we tacitly give promises to the public on what this could mean on things that we literally cannot deliver on. So that's why I cannot support uh, option four or number four. Um, the other two are great because it allows us to delve deep and take a look at things. And I think on option four, the best thing is to get that jurisdiction scan back um, uh, that would inform what that looks like as far as the ideas that are contained in option four. Um, but I think this is a, that's a question better left to Alberta municipalities because it will become a provincial legislation issue. And that's the time for municipalities to gather together because we're not the only city that is impacted by these issues. And we need to have, a, I think, a better conversation and uh, we cannot put the cart before the horse here if we actually want to be successful. Um, and so, yeah, for the other three, I am very happy to support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Knack? Uh, yeah, to close. All right, to close. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, I'll, I'll support one, two, and three, and then actually uh, reading the room, I don't even know if we need to vote on four. We might not make number four because I don't know if it has any support right now, and that would leave the opportunity open for the original uh, mover to uh, to revisit that at a separate time. So um, if if there's a way, I'll just not move that part when it comes and I'll just move uh, one, two, and three as part of the vote. So to speak to the specifics um, of the uh, two and three, I'm supportive. It's just creating a service package that we will debate amongst other priorities and uh, determine whether or not it's something that we want to prioritize. So I'm very comfortable with getting those. Uh, so I'll focus my time and effort here on point one and, and just spend a bit of time on some of the history. Uh, this is something that has been worked on for years and years. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I think mobile home tenants have not been, because of the way the, acts, the act is currently designed, have not really had the same uh, type of controls or supports available to them. And... Uh, 
I, I wanna give former Minister of Service Alberta, Nate Glubish credit because uh, when he came on, uh, he was one of the, it was one of the first times that there were ever any changes made to the Mobile Home Tenancy Act, which uh, we're still nowhere near where we need to be, but was a very good step in the right direction, the fact that some changes started occurring. Uh, but often mobile home tenants do not have the same type of controls as any other uh, person who is renting. And, uh, and that is really frustrating. It's not fair to them that they don't have the same type of um, well, support available to them when there's disputes or and there's any type of issues related to that. So um, this is something I've supported for years and years and I think we need to continue su to support because uh, I don't, I cannot justify why uh, somebody who is a mobile home tenant who lease, who essentially rents the land that they are on is treated any differently than somebody who rents an entire property um, on a set of land that they don't own. Uh, to me, it makes no sense and I don't think it's fair and I think we need to continue to advocate for those folks who have been pushing hard for, well, frankly, decades. And, and right now the challenge is, is that Depending on the mobile home you commu community you live in, uh, your experience can vary greatly. So the one that I represent, I will say the residents actually are generally quite positive uh, of, the, of the property owner there. They seem to be relatively responsive to concerns and issues, uh, but I have heard from folks who live in the other ones, and, uh, and I think one of them is represented by Councillor Wright, and, and Councillor Perquet represents uh, an area as well. And, uh, I have seen some of the horror stories about how long it takes um, when there's basic repairs to be made, when there, you know pipes have burst or something has gone wrong and not being able to have the same type of uh, recourse that somebody who is renting an apartment building or a home has. So I feel very strongly about uh, continuing to ask the provincial government to do more in this. Uh, I, it's not that I don't think they're willing, I just don't know if it had always been a priority. So a letter helps keep this in their, in their uh, just on their list of things that I think they need to work on over this. So uh, I would ask everyone to support, yeah, one, two, and three. I think two and three are, again, we'll make bigger decisions at a uh, budget, but number one is really important for those residents who have not had the same um, guarantees and, and controls and supports uh, over the years. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried, Councillor Knack. Yes, and get up the next one, which is, I think, I'll pull it up somewhere here too. I think the next one is it's coming up was the uh, administration bringing forward a service package for consideration as part of the 2023 fall supplementary operating budget adjustment outlining the resources needing to enhance the existing business license review process to cancel, 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 suspend, or impose conditions on licenses issued to landlords where safe conditions are identified during investigations and include a jurisdictional scan of other municipalities. Thank you, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That has carried. Councillor Knack. Yes, and number three, that administration bring forward a service package for consideration as part of the 2023 fall supplementary operating budget adjustment outlining the resources needed to create and maintain a landlord registry that provides information to prospective tenants on issues with specific properties related to health and safety and include a jurisdictional scan of other municipalities. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. And Councillor Nack, you're withdrawing the fourth I have one? no need to bring forward the fourth at the moment. I think I'll leave that for another time. 
Okay, thank you. So we are completed item 7.3. We're at 3.29, so we will take a break until 3.45. Thank you.
I will call this meeting back to order. And I'll start with a roll call. I'm not sure if Mayor Sohi has joined us online. No, Councillor Rice. Here. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Hello, uh, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Tang. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hello, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Cartmel. I see Councillor Salvador. I see you there now. Yes, hello. Hello, Councillor Cartmel. And Councillor Jans. All right, now we're moving to item 7.4. Does administration have a presentation? No presentation, uh, but some opening remarks. Wow, lovely. We'd like to hear them, please. Thank you, Councillor, uh, and good afternoon, and thank you very much for having us with you today. Um, during the 2023 to 26 budget deliberations, City Council approved funding for a derelict residential subclass using the broad definition. So the report in front of you today is an update on administration's development of the mature area derelict residential subclass based on the physical state of disrepair of the property. Due to resourcing considerations and a concentration of applicable properties, administration is proposing to apply the new subclass to the mature established neighborhoods as defined in the map you'll see in attachment one. Bylaw amendments will be brought forward in fall 2023 to formally establish the subclass, which would allow the subclass to go into effect for January 2024 and taxation in 2024. The proposed tax rate uh, would be the non-residential tax rate, which is approximately three times greater than our current residential tax rate. And with that, thank you. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Councillor Knack, I'll start with you. I actually don't have any questions. I selected it for some others. I think others had questions, but I am good. It was excellent, thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, should be. My name's not coming up, but I have questions. Councillor Salvador. Councillor Salvador, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is really exciting. Uh, so excellent, excellent report. Um, and just have a few few questions. Uh, wondering if we have a rough estimate of what we believe the, the derelict subclass will generate on an annual basis? We need to do the data collection council before we can reasonably answer or adequately answer that question. Um, we did do a pilot project in the area of Alberta Avenue and we are quite confident that this uh, subtax will, sorry, subclass will more than pay for itself when it gets to taxation. We discovered, I think, where's my list? Th seven additional properties um, that we had not previously identified and that was a total of 20, 21, 27, 24. Um, in the just in the Alberta Avenue uh, community, I think the 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 reason that we're suggesting that we do this in a mature established neighborhood area is that we would expect to see something similar, a similar pattern in those communities. Um, and then once we have established uh, a process and protocol for that in the mature neighborhoods, we could look at expanding that in future years. Councillor Salvador, while not in this report, uh, we did include within the service package an estimate at the time, given some data analysis, uh, that was in the range of one to 1.5 million. Again, just an estimate at this time. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And I, I did, uh, I didn't remember the exact number, but I thought it was referenced during budget. So thank you for, for refreshing my memory. Um, and really good to hear that um, it will, yeah, more, more than uh, make up for the cost of administering this, this program. So, Maybe uh, moving on to to another question, um, and I'll I'll preface this by saying you know, I think you've done a fantastic job of creating really clear uh, and reasonable a clear and reasonable definition. Um, and it's clear to me that we're focusing on homes that are uninhabitable, uh, deserted, abandoned, uh, where 
habitation would be dangerous, unsafe. Um, I just wanted to to be really clear, like we're not talking about properties that have simply maybe look a little shabby, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. I think there there were some questions around where that line is. Uh, so I just want everyone to to be clear on that, and I want that clarity too. An excellent clarification to make, Councillor, you're right. Like the, the definition such as it's written makes it very clear that we are looking at the, the real blight uh, properties and that there, there needs to be more than just one or two characteristics of, of as you say, shabbiness. Uh, we are not looking to penalize homeowners who perhaps have not the resources to uh, maintain their homes to the most pristine standard. What we are looking at is derelict properties, properties that are abandoned, um, that uh, have have no care or attention being paid to them in any way. Um, moreover, it might be worth mentioning that these that this uh, assignment would also be subject to review by the assessment review board. So any property owner who felt that they were being um, Mis, uh, unfairly categorized as a derelict property has all of the the ability uh, to appeal that through the assessment review process. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. And um, I'm also wondering, you know, we're doing some work uh, with with problem properties in particular, and, and some of the work with the community property safety team um, has been quite successful. I'm just, are these the types of properties where we would see higher um, higher risk for for things like fires um, and potential arsons in neighborhoods i'm afraid i'm probably not the best qualified person to speak to that but um, i i could say that one recent example is appearing in the news today uh, of a property that we would have considered a derelict property where there was a fatal fire so it's reasonable i think to to draw that line properties that are not well maintained are usually more of a risk in all, in sort of uh, the broad spectrum of cases, including fire. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there and just uh, my gratitude for this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have too many questions. I have just for you and then I would like to put the um, report received as information on the floor, if that's proper. Huh? Sure. Yeah. Please okay. do. Yeah, so I will put the motion on the floor and then just a simple questions here. Uh, so is there any the reasonable amount of certainty that the city will receive property tax from those owners? Yes, interestingly enough, we, well, we have an excellent collection rate in general and um, properties that are sometimes identified as problem properties are not often those ones that are in severe arrears. So we do not have an expectation at this time of not being able to um, collect the taxes that we levy on these properties. Oh, that, that's good. Uh, so how many of those type of uh, um, properties don't have an owner? Do we have data? Um, well, all properties have an owner. Um, that's sort of the, the nature of property ownership within Alberta. There is a registered owner at land title for all properties. Where we sometimes run into difficulties is locating the owner. Okay. Um, and, and we have a tax collection team that, that has a number of tools at their, uh, at their disposal in order to locate property owners. So do, do you have uh, information like do, uh, do any other like jurisdictions have this similar taxation uh, policy? Just going to look to clarification, my colleague on the right, but I believe we will be the first, if uh, if not one of the first, to implement a derelict subclass. Is that right? Yeah, the first we know of in Alberta, certainly. Some other jurisdictions under different legislation have similar types of things, but uh, I'm not aware of any others in Alberta. So we're we're doing great way to address this problem. <laughs> okay, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. I just had a question about flexibility and adaptability because I, I kind of understand the need for creating some boundaries, even though there are properties that would fall out of that. I guess 
is it problematic though to have a map rather than neighborhoods that are classified as mature because doesn't that classification change regularly as opposed to the schedule a would kind of be frozen in time and space thoughts um i don't believe that there is a classification of mature there may be sort of a perception um, of what a mature established neighborhood is uh, but there's no definition which is why we are proposing to do uh, to do this according to a map. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I had understood that that urban planning had had uh, all neighborhoods classified as either mature, developing, or established. Um, so I believe that this map was based on um, what yeah. we used to describe as mature neighborhoods, but it those mature neighborhoods are no longer described as such. So we're we're sort of supplementing that yeah. with the map. I think my bigger question, oh, go so ahead. I was, was gonna say that I think what we're also talking about here is using this map as our starting point. We're trying to define an area to ensure that the work gets done in an equitable way, ensuring that we're all assessing these properties properly. So this is the area that we think we can handle for now. And it made sense that we did it within yeah. kind of more of those mature neighborhoods where we expect to see more of those problem properties or the problem properties that are derelict. I believe that this, the, the sense from we got from council was there is a desire as we move forward to, to encompass the entire city. So see this more as a starting point of what makes sense given where we see the distribution and that we would intend to, to expand that as we had the resources to do so. Yeah, yeah, okay, that that helps. Cause yeah, I, I, when we think about equity, I, I could imagine some of the residents in the area I'm in saying that it's inequitable that, that you know, because of where they live they're getting a tax, even though the property is in the same quality condition as one outside of that. So I just wanted to make sure that at some point, you know, without council direction, there'll be check back me mechanisms or ability to adjust and adapt, even if it's an omnibus on bylaws, you know, that comes that annual, uh, yeah. That's all I was trying to understand because it feels very locked in time. Can you, can you confirm that, you know, once this path, like if and when this comes to council, you, you go away, you do this work, there will be opportunities to look at expanding that once the capacity allows. I, that's what I understand, but I just want to confirm that. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, that is certainly our intention. We, we need to get the data to begin um, the establishment mm -hmm. of this subclass, which is why we're proposing a smaller than the entire city area. But um, on, on principle, we do not uh, we do not like to use areas because it creates fence line comparisons, which is the concern that you're raising here. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we are able to, um, and we're optimistic that that would be, you know, in in the three or so year timeline, we will be able to expand this to the whole city, and then the the designation sort of it, it lasts for the taxation year. So property owners who um, fix their properties or bring their properties out of a derelict um, state would be looking at having their properties returned to the usual residential subclass um, for the future tax year. Okay, no, I really appreciate that. And that helps me um, understand more the, the path forward. Thank you so much. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. So there's about just under 20 outside of properties outside of the the mapped area that you're going to be focusing on, right? Um, so those are 20 properties that were identified according to sort of a list that Alberta Health Services. Though that those are not our identified properties. When when we expand to the full city, we would be doing essentially a field check of all residential properties within the neighborhood. That's why it's quite resource intensive. Okay, okay, I was wondering, because I thought if it was just 20 properties, why aren't we including the whole thing? Okay, so, um, so, so these were the ones on the map identified by Alberta Health Services. Um, is there something that Alberta Health Services is doing to try to bring them back to life? Um, Mr. Hutchinson is wanting to say something. Sorry, Councillor, just to clarify, the, the dots on the map represent the properties we identified as candidates for derelict properties from a variety of lists. Okay. So L Services was one of the inputs, Fire Rescue was one of the inputs, 
Um, the ones that the Problem Properties Initiative identified as derelict, those were all combined into that one list. But again, we haven't done an independent check to see if each of those meet the definition that we've proposed. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, and then the other thing that I was wondering about, this sort of made me think back to my time in financial services where we did a, um, um, you know, straw mortgage buyers and everything like that. So I'm just wondering, what happens to properties that are deemed, I guess, proceeds of crime? Is like, who would pay the tax on that if they were some of these derelict properties? Um, th so the derelict property is, is purely a reference to its physical state, not, it does not speak to the ownership. Um, I might but, need- But if they were deemed derelict because they've just been now sort of abandoned almost, Yes, it, it, so, so the, the property tax would still be levied against the owner. Right. If the owner was someone other than the occupier for whatever reason, it, it, the property taxes are still levied against that owner. Um, Mr. Ashmore, if you are online and available to speak to the proceeds of crime, I must admit that's out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, it, it kind of depends, Councillor, on um, what you mean by proceeds of crime in this context. But ultimately, the, the way the tax system is intended to work is that it becomes a tax to the owner of the property. If somebody else has an interest in that property, i.e. through proceeds of crime or something like that, um, they can deal with the taxes if they want to, but they have no obligation to do so. The proceeds of crime in many cases is a recovery mechanism for um, victims um, in, in some circumstances. So I don't know if, whether that answers your question, but it really depends on the individual situation. So if a property was, was deemed proceed of crime, does, is, is it not seized then by the province, I'm assuming? And then so the province would then be responsible to, to pay not only yeah, the property I, tax, but this, but this new subclass as well? So the, there are times certainly where um, a property can be seized through the proceeds of crime situation. That would end up being a provincially owned property at that point in time, unless they decide to do something with it, i.e. auction it off to somebody else. Okay. Um, and that at that point, it's an exempt property because it's a provincially owned property. So we would get taxes, if at all, through the grant in lieu program. Okay, so, so this, they would this be would exempted not. from this derelict subclass. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson? Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo my extreme excitement for this report. Uh, I think it was incredibly well laid out. I'm so happy for the work that's going to be uh, undertaken. Um, really appreciate that it will evolve over time, that it will... Um, expand uh, as capacity allows. Just a few few small nuances. So, just wanted to really drill into the the de refined definition, just to confirm that it will still include um, incomplete construction. So, it speaks specifically to um, containing an improvement with a residential living area. So, how would we interpret that if it was um, maybe like a partially demolished building um, that that didn't really have any units in it one way or another, but maybe it was previously a residential unit or a zoned residential. Um, or again, maybe a home that was sort of half completed and then, and then left. Uh, um, I will probably throw this to Cam Ashmore from Law as, as the author of the definition. But the way I would interpret that as an assessor or that specific circumstance is that we would assign this derelict subclass in that situation, but we would do so knowing that there may be a gray area here. The reason that we reference residential subclasses in the, de sorry, residential units in the definition is to avoid catching garages because just anecdotally, we do see that there are a lot of dilapidated garages that absolutely would meet a definition of a derelict improvement, but they are, um, you know, the, on the same property as a perfectly reasonable looking single family or single uh, detached residence. And we didn't want to include garages. Um, not believing that was not what council's intention was. So that's the thinking there. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know if Mr. Ashmore wants to weigh in or um, 
I wonder if there's another way, like if we change that like to the principal building on site or something again, but, but maybe, yeah, I'd look to legal for thoughts around um, incomplete construction that, uh, how we would interpret that or how could we strengthen the wording to prevent the, sort of the gray area that, that might, ca might cause problems. So, Councillor, there's, uh, I think you've captured something that probably we didn't consider in the drafting, particularly incomplete construction where the construction has been abandoned and there was a portion of the property that wasn't a residential living area or theoretically could have been, I think probably is arguably captured. Um, but if they have only partially constructed and actually haven't built anything, it's probably not captured in this definition. If that was the will of council, um, I could go back and come up with something that would slightly complicate it. Um, the one caution I'll put out though is it's almost impossible to create perfect drafting. There's always going to be these scenarios where there might be a little bit of a loophole. And the idea is you find those loopholes over time and then fill the loopholes in when you do an amendment to capture the loopholes that you found. Now you might have found a loophole before we we actually pass the bylaw though. So it's something that we may want to consider. Great. Well, I um and I mean having drafted zoning bylaw regulations in the past, I completely appreciate the need for for ongoing um refinement of that. But that is that is a condition that I think is fairly frequent. Um or again, something that's a, a concern in the communities that I represent. So I think proactively um closing that loophole could be really helpful. Um I, I, I am not on this committee, so I would look at if you need a, a motion or if, again, that's just work that comes forward. I think um, whatever is the, the most streamlined and effective way to, to do that, um, I'm happy to, to take direction on that. Thank you, Councillor. I, I would suggest that the, <laughs> given that you have given us something to think about, we can go away on our own. We don't need direction to do so. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, just in terms of communications about this, are we... Are we planning to do some proactive uh, communications with property owners who are assessed as being derelict? We are um, intending to put a notification in their assessment notice, which is where they would first learn that they have been designated as a derelict property, um, giving them some idea of what that means and what their options are uh, in terms of um, appealing that assessment or at least calling an assessor and discussing that assessment. Uh, we are also going to be working with our communications colleagues about doing some advance notice sort of leading up to the assessment mail out, just informing Edmonton at large that this is um, this bylaw is now in effect and will have such and such repercussions. Great. And um, and so sorry, when they get the assessment notice, that's different from their tax bill, right? Okay, perfect. And then very quickly, so I can just do one round. Um, we had discussed a grant program potentially for cases of hardship. That work is also continuing in parallel to this, or do we decide to not pursue that? At the moment, we don't have direction to pursue okay. that. Um, and my understanding was that the grant back program was less in cases of hardship, uh, but was more in cases where the property owner fixed their property, and so perhaps would be would it be able to qualify for a, a tax reimbursement. Um, or, or a refund of taxes for the period of time that their property was not derelict. If it is the will of council to pursue a hardship-based grant, I that will take a lot. That will take a different amount of work. No, maybe I'll, you know I'll circle around just to, to follow up on that. But but yeah, I don't think any additional work is needed. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, that piece about, yes, I, I agree. This is a great, a very clearly laid out report. So thank you so much for all this work. I also really appreciate that on the topic of derelict, you know, housing and properties, you know, I think throughout the year we've spent, we talked about various tools and this is one of the tools uh, for consideration. Just on that last uh, line of questioning from Councillor Stevenson around, say, unfinished construction site, abandoned construction site, uh, made me think about some abandoned, uh, like vacant lots that, you know, um, that no longer have maybe the same plans for development that they did, you know, at a different time. Um, 
and I think we've talked about this pretty extensively, but this piece subclassing would not apply to those scenarios, would it? No, no, it would not. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the the challenges and, and why that's a different that that warrants different consideration? In our um, discussions around what what is a derelict property, we were thinking almost exclusively of derelict improvements. So property itself, the land itself, is hard to define as a, a property in a state of, of disrepair because essentially raw land is simply raw land. So vacant property in essence doesn't have anything to be derelict. Um, which is where we were going with that. In, in Councillor Stevenson's example of abandoned half-built properties or, or abandoned construction sites, we now have an improvement that we can use to basically describe something as derelict. So it's a slightly okay. different case. Right, right. You know, I'm thinking of some of the properties in 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 in, in Warigata here where you got the the below ground dug and then kind of left it at that for months and years and uh, it's creating you know, urban blight and having a lot of similar impact. Um, I guess I'm just curious, uh, you know, subclassing aside, has there been any other kind of investigation done on what to do with those kinds of land or property? Um, uh, you know, how do we hold these folks accountable? Um, I imagine it's not taxation could be one tool, but you know, there's a lot of challenges around that. Have we looked at other tools? Unfortunately, I'm branch manager of assessment and taxation. I really can only speak to yeah. assessment and taxation. What I can say yeah. though, is in your example where you have, um, essentially a foundation that is an mm -hmm. improvement in, in our world. So we would be describing that mm -hmm. as a derelict property, but we, we would be in that gray area that council Stevenson has identified. So right, we would. Yeah. We would be looking oh, okay. in the in the next couple of um, months to sort of look at our definition and refine and see if we can actually thread that needle. So we're not picking up house like derelict garages, but we are picking up abandoned construction right. sites with with foundations. Okay. Um, but well, to speak, I'll have to, sorry, to speak yeah, to your I'll other have to follow up on with sorry you on that. <clears throat> no, sorry. I well, I'm just wondering if there's anybody else there who can maybe speak to any ongoing work currently. Uh, about about that conversation, I understand there is a surface parking lot report, and I'm I'm not even clear when that's coming back. And I'm just wondering if um, uh, if any follow up motion is is needed, kind of to on that separate piece of work around abandoned land, um, and if not, if if administration, I I understand taxation is not the right area, but if there is someone from administration who can speak to that. Councillor, I don't think there's someone here presently oh, okay. that are aware of that report that's being speaking about uh, parking lots, and we'll be adding some sections within that report uh, on the assessment and taxation context about how we can deal with vacant land or vacant lots. So that might okay. be an opportunity for you to have that conversation further. Excellent. Yeah. And then when is that coming back? If you can remind me. I'd I'd have to confirm. I think we're it's getting to that window now. So I'd say probably the next two months here. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I very much look forward to that conversation. Um, and then if I can just clarify, um, so these data points, you know, source through various um, various uh, sources, uh, and then the uh, then the next step is assessors going out proactively, right, and not just in response to a complaint. Okay, I see head nodding. Um, and then on the piece of like a lot where one part of say, what about like, actually, I'm out of time. It's okay. Thank Not you, important. Councillor I support Tang. this report. Great work. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson? Uh, yeah, sorry, just to, to follow up on that. So my memory, yeah, was uh, what you were speaking to, uh, Ms. Wan, in terms of there being, if someone invested in their property to make it underelect, sort of retroactively uh, recoup, recoup that difference. Um, so that, that is not moving forward at this time. We, we would appreciate some direction if that is what committee and or council would like us to pursue. We, we do think we could do it reasonably easily through an amendment to council policy C607 um, rather than requiring a whole second bylaw, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 
I think the way you've described the, the the refined definition, so that again, it's not shabby properties, it's not properties that just need a lick of paint and a bit of improvement, like these are fairly significantly structurally compromised homes. I think that the risk, I feel that the risk is different uh, um, in terms of creating undue hardship on homeowners who are maybe just having those maintenance challenges. So I'm comfortable moving forward without that at the moment, but perhaps that's something else that could be reported back on in terms of if we are seeing a trend of that being being an issue that, that we could revisit at that time. Um, yes, Councillor Stevenson, may I just I'll flag one thing just for count, uh, committee's awareness as mm -hmm. we're discussing this, this particular subclass. So we discussed that grant in, in different kinds of contexts. So the one idea was potentially adding in uh, incentives or carrot to go with the stick that if you were to redevelop the site, we could actually go back and give you a grant. Now that I don't think was of much interest to committee or council at the time, but be aware also that the way the subclassing works is we have to base it off the condition of the property as of the previous year. So if the property is derelict in December of last year, it's gonna be considered derelict from January through December of this year, even if they do repairs in the middle of the summer. And we, don't have an, we, would, we would not have an ability to say, we're switching the classification midway through the year unless there was a special grant program in place. So that's the one example where you might want some kind of a program in place to be able to split the difference. And, and at the middle of the year, if they, they renovate to be able to say, okay, we taxed you at that higher subclass, but we'll grant you back the difference for the time that you're no longer in that. Because under the subclass, they're taxable that way for the entire year, regardless if they do any work. So that's just a flat for them yeah. to work. Well, that's a very interesting one. and. Um, and just from my understanding as well, are we speaking strictly renovation? So if they, let's say there was an existing structure, they demolished it and they rebuilt it, would the, the derelict subclass would still? Uh, tax subclass would last for the entire year. In, the, in that circumstance, basically we would be looking for the future tax year at the condition of the property on December and it would clearly be, um, you know, our, our regular assessment processes mm. would take hold and we'd be reviewing permits and so, so we would know that that property is no longer the derelict property that it was the previous December. Right, but they would still be on the hook for that full year of derelict uh, tax assessment. Yes, they mm. would be. Okay. Well, we, <laughs> we, do, we do have a supplementary bylaw at the City of Edmonton and that may come into a play in the case of a complete demolition and rebuild. What I would say though is that um, although our construction cycle is pretty quick, it's still a lot to get done within one calendar year. Right, but we don't wanna create an incentive for people to keep their properties derelict because they're gonna be paying the tax anyways, right? Um, like there'd be no reason to start in February. Well, anyway. Yeah, I, I would ag agree and yet I think that we are, we are kind of breaking new ground here with this, um, this subclass. I, th I would appreciate having the time for maybe a year or two just to see how it works and what happens and what kind of unintended consequences may fall out because then we can refine going forward rather than trying to think of everything In ahead of time. Ahead of time. <laughs> okay, no, I think that's great advice. I think that makes a lot of sense for us to be able to reassess and, and if there was, um, you know, a unique situation that popped up, it could always come forward as like an individual, uh, a counselor could make a motion around that individual property. So that's sort of the safety as we're testing things out. And then if we need something systemic, we can put that into place. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you again so much for this work. It's so exciting. Um, uh, and that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Yep, I know I'm on there. Time. Everyone's looking shocked. I know I'm on there, but I tried to take myself off. My questions were answered. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so just one one additional point of clarification. So uh, appreciate some of the questions that were being asked around incomplete, const incomplete construction. Um, where, where would, I'll call them incomplete demolitions, fall into this pile? Like, piles of rubble if someone doesn't actually do a good job of of clearing the property post post demolition um i know that's been been an issue uh in some of the areas that that i represented in, in, in a core generally uh just looking for that clarity so our field assessors would will be looking at this um those sorts of situations on a case-by-case -case basis but 
in, in the situation you're describing, I'm fairly confident in being able to say that would be a derelict property because there was a, uh, there was a residential unit there. That residential unit is now in a derelict state of any kind. It would be uh, flagged as a derelict property. Excellent. Um, okay, that's good. Good to know. Uh, and then um, I'm going to bring this up uh, just because we've talked about it in the past. I just uh, just want to loop to to the commercial side of things, which I know is a very difficult and and different conversation. Um, and I'm just trying to recall where where we even left that side of things. I I don't think there's any sort of ongoing work related to non-residential at this point, is there? Not not for derelict non-residential, no. Right, and can you just remind me, what was the primary um, primary barrier there again? A big stumbling block, block exists within the provincial legislation right. that says it needs to be 365, like a full calendar year in a derelict state. And being able to prove that um, a property is vacant and derelict for 365 days is challenging. Having said that, it's still very much in our mind in assessment and taxation, although we're not pursuing it sort of as an active program today. I think if we did see success from our introduction of a residential derelict subclass, we could revisit the, the idea of a non-residential derelict subclass and look to see how we might be able to implement that successfully as well. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, yeah, and that's that that's uh my recollection as well so sort of the challenges associated with proving um that a a property is vacant for those full 365 days is is very challenging um but really appreciate that there might be an opportunity to tackle that in the future um once we've had our our opportunity to see how the residential side rolls out um because i know that's an ongoing issue again in in some of the areas i represent um so that's it i'll speak to it when the time is right thank you thank you council Councillor Salvador, any more questions? No, I'll pass it along to Councillor Rice to uh, read in the motion and then, yeah, if you could just read in the motion and then uh, I'll have people sign up to speak to it, please. So, is a wording, just is a wording, uh, okay. Is wording the image on the screen? If you want, read me. I want to make sure I read the proper uh, report number. <laughs> uh, so I move that the March 20, 20, 23 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01565, be received for information. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Anyone to speak? Councillor Knack, go ahead. Sorry, the computer's been real slow since the, there it is. Um, not a lot to, to uh, say, I just wanted to again say thank you for all of this work. This is a long time coming, this one. <laughs> this has been talked about for uh, at least um, five or six years, but I think it's come up at different times even before that. Uh, can't wait to see it put into action and uh, I think this is just one more tool that will help us deal with some some challenges that we've had over the years and so thank you to to the work that you've done and to help put this together it's uh, I am really excited to see this in action and um, yeah I'm excited to hopefully see this help um, just address some of those challenges we heard a few examples even just from what Councillor Salvador is mentioning I mean I can think about examples that I go by here in the core every single day um, uh, you know, and, and that have that have existed in a state that I think is unacceptable, and and have actually done a real disservice to uh, our goals as a city in in terms of vibrancy, particularly in our downtown core, um, for those properties that have that have not contributed there, but even to the um, to the properties that have been in the mature neighborhoods, uh, they can often be a real point of contention and uh, and trouble and. Uh, this is something that we've shared over the years with neighbors this is an idea we've been looking for. And uh, time and time again, people have been very excited about this, this, uh, 
this tool um, to be used in addition to all of the other great work that's been happening across the city. So uh, thanks to Councillor Salvador as well, who I think uh, initiated it here uh, this, this time around and, and great to see we're moving forward on it. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much and um, really appreciate the discussion today and just wanna thank the team who is leading this work. It is incredibly exciting. Um, taking decisive action on derelict and problem properties really is an essential part of the work we're doing to enhance and revitalize our city's core neighborhoods. And what is being proposed in this report is a sophisticated and defensible subclass. And I'm really proud of the work we're doing on this. Um, I think the multifaceted approach that we're applying to this issue is also bold, but it's very pragmatic as well. Uh, taken together with the work that we're doing through the community property safety team in collaboration with Edmonton Fire, uh, I think we're clearly demonstrating to Edmontonians that we're taking this issue seriously. Um, and it's also clear to me that we're talking about properties that are uninhabitable, deserted, abandoned, these are not simply properties that are shabby or in need of a coat of paint. We're talking about properties that present a real risk to communities and adjacent property owners, uh, which we've seen through some of the ongoing issues related to fires and arsons in several of, um, of the communities I represent, but across the city as well. Uh, so this is an opportunity to use all of the tools that are available to us in our toolbox to address that issue. I also think that using a geographic approach makes a lot of sense as a starting point, uh, as these are areas that typically see a higher concentration of problem properties and derelict properties. Um, and as was mentioned during the discussion, there are opportunities to further scale this across the entire city as it rolls out. Um, financially, it's also great to know that this work is going to be more than self-sustaining and hearing the preliminary results in the Alberta Ave area uh, give me confidence that this is a really important step. So. Uh, pleased that we're leading the way in this. Um, seems like we are, are the first to implement a derelict subclass in Alberta, which is excellent, and that there's flexibility to make some adjustments along the way as we move forward. Uh, so again, uh, thank you so much for this ongoing work and looking forward to seeing the results. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, and thank you for initiating it as well. Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, not not too much to add to my colleagues' great points, but yeah, a huge thank you, Councillor Salvador, and to all of our members of the administration for working on this. I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I really do think it, it will be transformative for our community. We've talked about the ways that, um, you know, these properties detract from, from the look and feel and sense of safety in our communities, uh, but they also have a very real cost to our, our city uh, in terms of fire calls, uh, in terms of other nuisance um, issues, 311 reports. Uh, so the idea of actually aligning our taxation with the costs that these properties are incurring uh, to our services, I also think is, is a great philosophy and, and something I look forward to carrying uh, to other areas as well. So um, again, it was noted we are breaking ground. This is new and exciting work. I think we, I expect that there will be uh, hiccups and, and challenges. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that things aren't great or that it's not the, the right thing to be doing, uh, just that we can uh, refine that further. But it's very exciting to be breaking this new ground. Really, really appreciate all the work. And excited to see it roll out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice to close. We'll be very quick. Uh, <laughs> so um, looking forward and for the full uh, 2023, and administration will bring forward recommendation amendments to bylaw and the 19519 and residential assessment and also the supplement uh, mentor assessment subclass bylaw. Um, I think this bylaw is, is a creative way and to help deter owners from leaving their properties unoccupied and in disrepair. So those type of pr uh, pr properties actually and also the surrounding neighborhoods um, around these properties and facing many risks and also hardships and for example crime, reduce the feeling of safety and then devaluation of property and just to name a few. Uh, I think it's a time and to show an innocent property owners that uh, the owners of this type of properties are going to pick up this lag. 
and I hope this will reduce the number of derelict properties across our entire city. So looking forward in the fall for the bylaw amendment come back. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you so much. Okay, we're on to item 7.5 now. I just wanted to check online. Mayor Sohi, were you able to join us? Oh, okay. Hi, welcome. Do you have a presentation or any opening remarks for us, or are you just here for I questions? I don't have a presentation, but I'll just say a few things, Councilor Principe. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I uh, just wanted to say what you have before you are recommendations for three of EAC's um, ongoing programs. Uh, it's our multi-year uh, multi operating annual programming and annual operating grants. Um, this year, we are happy to report that despite all the challenges our arts organizations have faced because of COVID, what we are seeing in our community is a return. It's still not a full return, but we are seeing a return of the arts in our city. And uh, what I'd like to highlight uh, today is that we, we, are, uh, we have before you today 164 organizations that are being recommended for approval. Um, the exciting part of this is that we have festivals, we have community organizations, we have professional arts organizations, we have organizations with diverse mandates, um, and d despite COVID and its challenges, um, I'm happy to report that we have 11 new organizations, which is quite exciting. Uh, so there is a revival happening. The work that the EAC has done um, over the last three years, I can't believe it's three years now, we've been in this COVID thing, um, has, is, is now beginning to pay off a bit. I think we can take some heart um, in the fact that our organizations are resilient, they are adaptable, and uh, they continue to work with Edmonton artists uh, to make our life better. So I don't want to say much more than that. I'm happy to answer questions. Before I um, hand it over to you, I just wanted to introduce Sally Kim who is my associate executive director, and she heads the, heads the Division of Program Services and Access, and Sally is here also to answer questions. So over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Clerk Youssef, I just wanted to clarify, this will be going up to council as well, right? Yes, the recommendation is for it to go to council for approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stevenson? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I'm sorry it's been such a long day for you, um, but really appreciate you both being here today. Um, you know, it's, it's great to, to hear that arts organizations as a whole are sort of bouncing back and, and that you're seeing that positive return. I was, I was a bit concerned reading through the list of recipients, um, just as it didn't appear that there were any Indigenous-led organizations that I could see that were receiving funding this year. I think that's something that we discussed uh, last year when we were reviewing the grants, and I, I, I just don't see any change here. So I was wondering if you could speak to that, please. Uh, so your, I think the the approach that we've taken is that uh, what we've what we have uh, committed to is to work with indigenous um, artists and indigenous organizations, and because the principle in connections and exchanges is about cultural autonomy. Um, we want to make sure that the conditions that uh, are, are, are important for the development of indigenous organizations are created. So some of the work that we're doing is to ensure that individual practitioners have the resilience to actually do their work. And if, if there is an opportunity to support a collective, because not 
all uh, indigenous uh, groups want to register as, as not-for-profits. They want to work in a framework that works for them based on their um, teachings and their philosophies. And so if you, what, if you don't see things here in this report, um, there are other project-based programs where you will see some collectives and you will see some individual artists supporting. So, um, so could you share a bit more about those uh, in terms of which, which organizations are, are receiving funding from the Arts Council? So we, we have some organizations that we, are, we have an ongoing relationship with, and I'll just turn it over to Sally. Who to um, I can bring information. Uh, Osetsiwan, the Collective of Contemporary Indigenous Art and Dream Speakers Festival are not in this report because they have entered multi-year funding agreements with the Edmonton Arts Council. Um, and while it may not be uh, obvious by their name, Punctuate Theatre is Indigenous-led. Okay, thank you. And that's one of the uh, groups here. On this list, sorry, Punctuate Theatre. There we go. Okay. Yeah, because my memory was with the uh, OCC1 and Dream Speakers, I think that collectively they were receiving about $80,000. So again, a, a very small proportion of the overall funding that um, that Arts Council is giving out. So I know, you know, I know, for example, um, Heritage Council, they've been able to get a lot, uh, a lot more funding out to the community. So again, just wondering what, what is different uh, in their ability to do that uh, and what barriers uh, are being faced in terms of, you were mentioning sort of not being registered uh, nonprofits, if you could just talk me through that. I think that there are uh, different program focus areas for the Heritage Council, while I don't work there. Um, they do do a very specific project program for um, culture and heritage and indigenous um, projects and indigenous led projects. We have not had a specific indigenous uh, only grant program uh, based on work that we did with indigenous communities several years ago where it was not expressed as the direction for the Edmonton Arts Council from those communities. Yeah, and I think Heritage Council does have that specified stream, but they, they've also given out grants to Indigenous-led organizations, and in, in my memory is most of their, their granting streams. Um, so it, it's not only through the specific program. Maybe just in my last minute, if you could speak to the overall strategy, do you have a dedicated resource in terms of Indigenous, uh, the Indigenous insurgents? How are you supporting that work? So we do have, um, uh, you know, uh, a member on staff who is an advisor, and uh, a lot of the work she does is she works with uh, various teams at the EAC, but she's also very involved in work um, in, in the community. She does not run a granting program, if that's what you're asking, but she does, she does bring back um, um, intelligence to our organization, and she's also in touch. <clears throat> we have done some work uh, qu for quite a while now. Sally mentioned Otsitsiwan and mentioned Dream Speakers. But in addition to that, we've been working with the I Am Collective for quite a while. And I think Sally can fill in a bit more because she has more first-hand experience. Sure, and I'm so sorry. I'm over my time, but I can come around for a second round to, to follow up on that. Thank, thank you. you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice? Uh, thank you. So... First of all, I would like to say thank you so much and for your patience to be here for all day <laughs> for the last item <laughs> and because we have some questions. I really appreciate that. And um, so my first question is actually is related to the funding allocation model. Um, so because this is my understanding, you received the funding from city and then you allocate it to the different organizations with different program and all operating. Uh, is this allocated, is 100% allocated the funding you received to the organization or you still have some funding as a contingency or spend it on the administration as well? So uh, we, have, we have a granting budget and I, I would say uh, 77 or 78% of it goes to organizations, roughly 22, 23% goes to individuals and collectives. 
Um, so the entire budget that we get for granting goes directly to organizations. Okay, it's one hundred percent allocated. That, for that's the granting budget, yes. For granting budget, so you have separate operating budget from city. Yes. So we are so, right now in front of us only about the granting budget. Yes. Okay. So what you yeah what yeah. we are asking you to approve yes is what our board has approved. These are multi-year operating grants, annual um, operating grants, yeah, and annual yeah. programming grants. Um. So, so my next question and the. Do you have the data to demonstrate how many organization, like arts related organization or and uh, are artists indivi as individuals and across the entire city? So we are doing the work. Uh, when I came to budget. Do, do we have that data? I just want that data. Do you have that? How many organizations cross the entire city? And how many individual artists cross the city? Do you have that data? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, um, for clarification, do you mean that we fund or that no, just live that, and work? That's my next question. Oh. I, I just want to get the sense how many and organizations and related to the arts or eligible and to the apply to apply this grant. Um, so, um, if you don't have like, because I, I need mine for my time, and we're also close to the end of day, and then yeah, we, can, so the, we can touch this offline. But I yeah, need, I want to go so, to my next question. My next question is, what a percentage of those organization and receive those grants? What percentage of our individual artists receive those grants? So if you don't have an answer, that's fine. I know we can touch base offline, yeah. but I do want uh, to I'm say this information. I'm trying to understand the question. So we fund, um, if you take the multi-year uh, operating organizations that you approved last year, we have 185 organizations that we fund. This includes arts organizations, festivals, um, community-based organizations. In terms of individual artists, um, we get, on, on any given year, we get, I would say, about 1,000 applications or maybe 1,200, I'm not sure, it depends on each year. Um, and of that, we're not able to fund all of them. We're able to fund maybe 30% of them. Is uh, that the question? I'm just I, trying. I would like to have that data, and I, uh, make him, we can follow up offline for okay. that, for the percentage. Okay. So for me to, uh, ask this question is related to this. And because last year, in 2022, the report specifically provided EXT01075, April 25th. And we are actually is not the number, as you mentioned, 181 uh, is 170. And then funded through city uh, grants. And then the total funding is $9.5 million. So that's last year, 2022. And then right now, for 2023, we have 164 organizations recommended to receive this grant is $3.9 um, million. And then my question is, because last year when council approved this funding, and then is the three we have 21 organization for the operating for 5.7 million dollars for three years and starting 2022 and 2024 and then my question is is those money for the multi-year operating or right gave them at once or they just disparate it and to the sub subsequent budget years and so where is that we'll have money to come from? back on a second okay. round, so you okay. can think of that and come back on a second round. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it sounds to me that uh, maybe what would be helpful is a breakdown of uh, equity-seeking groups and amounts they got 
uh, in these reports. Is that possible to do? Not for this report, but going forward? Um, or maybe even circling back on this one? We could do that. Um, the, the idea of equity in the arts means that there's, for us, there's equity from both the cultural and demographic lens, but there's also the equity in the arts disciplines. So depending on yeah, sure. how and what information you would like us to present to you, we can certainly get back to you on that. All of it would be great, but I think that there is a um, clear mandate on the city council uh, um, in regards to anti-racism and to ensure that all groups are being represented uh, in an equitable fashion. Um, and I understand, you know, if someone uh, plays the, the thumb symbols, we want to make sure that they're represented as well. Uh, but I think that it's the human factor as far as the um, societal pressures that we are experiencing currently that uh, are probably would take precedence over this. Does that make sense? Sure, and we are certainly happy to provide that information based on the information as submitted by our applicants. Okay, can you expand on that? We do have a demographic survey that we ask applicants to uh, submit along with their application, but it is optional. Uh, it is not mandatory to fill that in when you apply for a grant from the Edmonton Arts Council. Okay, so this bumps up against uh, what a lot of organizations are facing, including the city of Edmonton and Edmonton Public and presumably the province as well. And that is without that data, without knowing the makeup of the folks who are accessing programs or are in our employee or any number of things, we actually can't respond in an effective way to ensure that people are adequately represented. Um, so I understand that you've got that challenge. Is it, do you have any sort of, maybe you want to go away with this one, ideas on how to uh, satisfy that need for data as well, at the same time respecting people's desire uh, to provide that data or not, because they might not feel safe providing that data. Is that something you'd like to go away with? Certainly, and we can look at other data points that we collect. We do do a, um, an annual survey and uh, the public also uh, participates in a biannual survey. Okay, and recently I actually, I got a letter from CoLab, uh, you know, works closely with Boyle Street. Um, I'm just wondering, have they been in touch with you about funding or about uh, uh, challenges? And uh, are you having those conversations with CoLab? We certainly are, and we are actually working with them um, outside of this grant program to assist and support those challenges. Okay, they apparently are in quite dire straits. Um, is there a commitment to ensure that they will be able to survive? Um, that is uh, probably work that we have to do with uh, the organization and the board, but we have already over the last several months uh, worked with them to um, to get their not-for-profit registration back into good standing. Um, and then from there, there is further work that we uh, we have committed to doing with CoLab. Okay, so that's a commitment then to ensure their survival as long as we're all working together on the same page. Uh, definitely, yeah. and, and because of the um, arrangements they had with uh, the new space, um, certainly the city administration will um, have to partner with yeah, us. Yeah, and that'll be a city conversation as well, yes. which we'll have to take to administration. Absolutely. Okay. And um, so it's nice to hear about some of the things that uh, you're engaged in long term outside of this report. So I just want to thank you very much for all of your efforts and all your work. I know the arts when it comes to government sometimes gets a bit of a rough ride uh, and is constantly underfunded. So I, I absolutely appreciate uh, everything that you do. And um, especially um, outside of this report, the approach you're taking to what community uh, based art will look like going forward so that when people walk out their front door, they see something that they have chosen, that they love, that they appreciate and provides value uh, to them. So thank you for all of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Words from a wonderful artist himself. 
And I just wanted to let everyone know we only have 10 minutes left, so either we would have to extend orders or this will be going to council, and I'm not sure if uh, you would be able to join us then. Maybe we'll try to be succinct with our questions and get this uh, accomplished today. Uh, Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you. You were mentioning about um, equity, and I think also, well, part of what I've noticed too is equity, a, a delivery of, of the performances and whatnot throughout the city as well, so that it's not just focused on just one area of city. I mean, this summer you brought it out. I know I'm not going to just say downtown. No, <laughs> no, there's arts on the Ave and everything like that too. Um, but so, I, and I do appreciate you know you bringing it out to the the parks and playgrounds as well, and and. At one of the um, ones that I attended, there was an Indigenous artist that was playing there. So I'm just wondering, even though we might not be directly funding Indigenous uh, groups, are we ensuring that we're highlighting, um, I guess, those Indigenous artists and, and performers within the different events that we're doing? So, I mean, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the Edmonton Arts Council over the last 10 years has put in quite a bit of effort. And um, as I was saying to Councillor Stevenson, uh, the opportunities that we are trying to find, uh, we are trying to be very careful and thoughtful and uh, individual artists uh, in our community uh, from the indigenous um, various sort of diverse communities um, are, are, I'm not saying all of them are finding success with us, but I think there is a fair amount of representation in our project programs, in our public art. We're trying to do more and more work with indigenous artists. We're trying to uh, create calls for indigenous artists to do that. In fact, the indigenous art park, uh, you know, was featured in, in Thames and Hudson's publication. It was the only, only uh, sort of public art from, from all over Canada that was featured. So we are trying. We are trying to see how best to respectfully uh, engage with indigenous artists. Um, indigenous arts organizations with indigenous arts mandates or cultural mandates. Uh, that's a different story. I think um, it's going to take some time uh, for that a critical mass to form, because as I was explaining to Councillor Stevenson, the 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 structures that indigenous artists feel comfortable working in are still structures that they, that, uh, that they feel belong uh, within an indigenous um, worldview. And Sally mentioned Otsitsiwan, and Sally, just, uh, you can correct me, but I think we've worked with Otsitsiwan for 10 years, 10 years now, and it was only after they felt comfortable uh, to be called an organization. They were a collective for many years. And uh, when they decided to incorporate, uh, they came to us and we've worked with them and now they're, they're receiving operating funding. Um, so, you know, there's, there are different ways to work with different groups is all I'm trying to say. Okay. And are you restricted at all by like anything in the, the service agreement with the city that it has to be a, a registered nonprofit group? Our operating grants, yes. Yes, okay. Yes. We, so maybe there's we something we need to look forward to to, to change that then, so that that does give you more uh, leeway and discretion, I guess. And we have been trying to find ways to find uh, alternative and creative ways to support those non-registered groups. Okay. Um, and we have been supporting collectives or... Mm -hmm. um, or informal groups, um, but they're they're not through uh, established program streams. So, yeah. in the okay. work that we do outside of the kind of reports that you see, we are working with them. Okay, okay, that's that's good to know. And if you could provide a list um, to Councillor Rice of all the artists and performers within the city, um, <laughs> I would commend you because I'm sure that's an ex an exhaustive list. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Clerk Youssef, uh, is it okay for us to extend orders today, or should we? Oh yeah, it's up to the committee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll ask my um, colleagues to vote on extending orders to finish the agenda.
We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Next in line, uh, Councillor Tang, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, report. I'm glad to see the funds go into the community. Um, I had a very similar line of thinking as my other colleagues. Uh, I was very curious about the come, uh, sort of the proportion of BIPOC led uh, organizations uh, on a sort of a year to year comparison. I understand this data might not be available, but certainly something uh, I'll be looking for um, year after year. Uh, and I will say that, you know, throughout, you know, conversations with the Arts Council and the annual report, I, I do recognize that there's a lot of efforts in terms of engaging diverse communities. That effort doesn't go unnoticed and uh, appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity to always have that conversation uh, when, uh, when we have the opportunity. Uh, noticing that uh, I think in the report says 20 organizations a part of have been given the grant and they've never been supported before. I was curious about what kind of proactive strategies are you doing to go out to the community um, and making sure more groups know about these opportunities. Much of that work is led by our uh, arts development investment team. Um, and and I think that our relationship with our stakeholders, they as we tell our stakeholders who work outside the arts, um, whose membership or whose programming includes the arts, um, they're letting their networks know about the kinds of funding opportunities available through the Edmonton Arts Council. So while we do our own outreach, I think our partners have been very key to letting them know about um, eligible applicants know about our work. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, you no, know, appreciate knowing that there there is a, a proactive uh, work going on. Uh, you know that that you're, you're you're patient with relationship building, and you also respect kind of some of those autonomy of some of the communities and when they're ready to engage. Um, I was also curious. You know, the, over the last many years, uh, there's been a shift in sort of philanthropy and kind of in in uh, where. Um, people are actively identifying some of those systemic barriers. And I know there's much work with the community foundation in terms of reaching perhaps by popular organizations that don't have charitable status. Um, you know, I think the fire was a good example mentioned earlier at the heritage council. I was curious in your, in the jury process, um, I imagine those conversations are happening among the jurors and I'm, I'm curious, what are some of those things identified and, um, you know, within the organization, are you acting on any of those suggestions or recommendations that come forward through the process? Okay, so um, what one of the things, Councillor Tang, thank you for the question. One of the things that we have been doing over time is to make sure that the the peer assessment process, the juries, are not only representative. Um, in terms of equity seeking groups and indigenous representation. But we're also looking at uh, getting artists from all over the city. And uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities that exist for bringing uh, new groups to the table is something that, as Sally said, the uh, arts development team is doing on a continual basis. In addition to that, we, we do have, um, at the Edmonton Arts Council, um, we, we do have very clearly in our, all our guidelines and in also in our own operational framework, um, there, is, there has been a focus for the last 10 years on, on inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And so uh, ensuring that new groups who come to us who may not have a long track record or may not have the history, uh, we, we want to make sure that their incoming grant is proportional to their, the size of their budget and that they are given supports outside of the grant to succeed. So we, we do work with them. We have other mechanisms that will support their capacity and that will support their reach and audience uh, expansion. Um, and in this, in this list, there are a few organizations like that that we've worked for a number of years and finally... Uh, they are now in our operating program. I don't know whether I answered the question, but I'm going to give it to no, Sally. 
Not really, actually. I think I was. I think I was very curious about you know, like, and I'll just add to the list of examples of you know, city is also exploring participatory budgeting methods as a way to decolonize and shift the power dynamics between funders and community groups. And I guess those things come from conversations. And and I and I I have no doubt you have very excellent jurors. And I'm I, I guess I'm just trying to kind of glean what are some of those systemic. Uh, barriers that have been identified in that process, and you know, are there recommendations to actively to overcome them? But anyways, I'm I'm out of time. Uh, I appreciate uh, certainly the conversation and the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Uh, quick question to City Clerk. And when is the Lakes City Council meeting? April April fourth. April fourth. So today is the twentieth. So two weeks later. Okay. There is a recess week, and then. Uh, I I really want to be quick to get this piece question done and to to consider my colleagues' time, and then for some question I will save to touch base with you uh, um, offline, and then specifically and then I I do want to respond to the comments my colleague uh, Councilor Wright mentioned that lots of work actually there is a there is a limitation there. And because I said who is eligible for the grant. And then we do have lots of individual artists and also lots of organizations. However, I do believe you have a criteria who, who are eligible to apply. So that is what I mean. Yeah, I, I want to be clear. I, I want to be, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't want to get that uh, uh, be clear and then uh, specifically, my question uh, go back to the funding uh, allocation model again, and there are a few questions here. Um, because each year you come to council to request this uh, approval for the organization recommendation who receive the grants for the operating and also for the uh, programming. Uh, so each year it's different organization, right? So. Most of the organizations you will see year to year will not change. There are new organizations that come into the program, but this the whole point of operating funding is that it's ongoing funding to sustain operations. So this is a confusing uh, piece I am struggling to understand. And because in 2022, the, the approval, council approve every year for the multi-year op operating fund 5.7 million dollars and across 2022 2024 and then this year you come back to request additional so i want to make sure i use the proper uh additional words to, based on my understanding correct i want to test with you uh, examine that is a uh, another 3.9 million dollar for the same organization uh, that means overlap 2023 and 2024 year, two years. That means they received actually uh, 5.7 plus 3.9. And then is that understanding correct? Overlap in 2023 and 2024. So the multi-year operating program, yeah. what you approved last year, yeah. there were 21 organizations. And what you approved was for three years. So 22, 23, 24. Yes. What you're seeing today yeah. are different organizations. They're not okay. those. They are not those 21 that you approved. So they're not add up, and for same organizations. They're different. Yeah. Uh, because you've already approved their three-year funding. Then so that three-year funding is received at once, or is received uh, so we make, a different year. We make the commitment, and then we pay out annually. Annually, but it is already in the past budget. It's not in the 2003 budget, right? Last no. year we proved. No, we we make the commitment on a multi-year basis, but we mm -hmm. only give them the annual. Yeah, amount. yes, I understand that. I just say the but the money you get then from last cycle okay. budget is not from this cycle budget. Right. So, so it's yeah. from our annual. Um, budget. Grant budget. So Correct. it comes from our 2023 grant budget from City Council. From City Council, but but it is approved in 2022 from Correct. 2019 to 2020. 
22 budget yes, cycle. Yes, because we have a base uh, grant budget from city council. Okay, uh, so in terms of measurement and for the grants you allocated to the different organizations, how to measure that success? How to measure it? Yeah, the success. Um, so every organization that we fund, um, in addition to the participation in all the surveys and all the other measurement we're doing now, they have to provide an uh, they have to provide us with a report yeah. to tell us how their activities and programs went. Okay. Uh, if that is the case, for the next year, for the annual operating uh, grant you gave out, do yeah. you, based on the reports, based on the results, to provide? the grant? So the report comes in and then the application for the current year that they've applied for goes to a peer assessment process and the peers will assess it and then they recommend to the board what the grant should be. Okay. That's how it works. Okay, I know my time is out. And Sorry. It's out now and I don't know if Mayor Solhi here or not. I, I don't mind to move the recommendation to council. Okay, thank you for moving that, Councillor Rice. Yeah, Councillor you. Stevenson? You Great, thank you. Um, so really appreciate the conversation. I appreciated my colleague's suggestion around having the breakdown of equity deserving groups um, in, in the reporting. Is that something that, uh, I believe you have an annual report coming up, is that something that could be included? Yeah, we have, we have an annual report coming up at the end of May. So I will talk to my research team and see what kind of, it may not be 100% accurate, mm -hmm. but, but yeah. I think we can, we'll try and figure it out. Uh, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's great, you know, recognizing even if it's preliminary um, data, that, that helps give us a picture. You know, I also appreciate the point that you're right, we're not, we're not seeing everything just in these granting programs. So would, would there also be an opportunity through the annual report to highlight some of the support that's happening outside of these, these specific streams? So the project-based stuff, yeah. Certainly we can, um, respecting that sometimes the, the work that we're doing with uh, certain organizations um, might be difficult and um, uh, of, a, of a nature that might they might not want really in the public forum. We're happy to speak with the organizations where we're doing the, this um, deeper work and to see if um, you know, we can we can bring it forward as a as a case study or a an example of the of the level of work that you that we do that isn't seen through this kind of reporting. Great. Yeah, I think I think that would be really helpful uh, in terms of understanding what what that is. Just um, you know, on on behalf of Mayor Sohi, actually, he was also just wondering in terms of what what work um, Edmonton Arts Council does with the City of Edmonton's communication teams in terms of uh, you know, promoting this investment that's being made in into the arts community, just in, just to ensure that Edmontonians know how how their money is being invested in the great projects that it's going towards. Are there any sort of media availabilities that happen with this, or any again sort of really public announcements about about uh, these investments that gets gets done? Certainly, we do try to coordinate whenever possible. Um, most of our coordination happens around public art projects as they are completed and installed and, and uh, ready for, for the public to see. Um, we find that the city communications department, uh, they're very, very busy, um, but we do l like to share, uh, certainly with a lot of the community programming, um, it is very visible and so through social media, as people share their experiences in some of this um, uh, community-based, neighborhood-based programming, um, it gets tagged to the city and as well as to us, and so that collaboration does happen. Okay, but not, not, no sort of proactive communications um, on, on that? Like there wouldn't be necessarily, your organization wouldn't necessarily issue a press release about, about this? No, it, I mean, we do, we are transparent. It does come out in our annual reports. Oh, for and, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of having a dedicated uh, 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 media relations campaign around annual programming grants, uh, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, no, that's great. I think something to follow up on, and I'll, I'll take that back to the mayor as well. Great, thank you again. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Councillor Rice, could you read in the motion, please? Okay. Thank you, Chair Principi. Um, I move that 
Community and Public Services Committee recommend to City Council that the funding recommendations as listed in attachment one of the March 2023 Item on Arts Council report EXT 01780 be approved. Thank you. Anyone to speak to it very briefly? No, Councillor Rice, would you like to close or all good? Well, all good. Okay, thank you. Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Okay, thank you very much for thank being you. here. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to shout out to my sister who's here visiting, Marianne from Winnipeg. Thanks for visiting us today. And uh, responses to councillor inquiries, none. Private reports, none. Motions pending, none. Notices of motion and motions without customary notice. I move that Marianne have a great time in Edmonton. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. Second. <laughs> well, we don't even need a seconder and we got one. That's awesome. Okay, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.